Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 2 Continued Cassette 13, Side 1 He had shocked his university confrères by writing for the stage. Now he mollified them with historical works presenting to Danish readers the results of West European scholarship. A description of Denmark and Norway, 1729, a history of Denmark, 1732-35, to a universal church history, 1727-47, to and a history of the Jews, were compilations, but they were well done. From these labors Holberg sought relief in his masterpiece, Nicolai Climii Iter Subterraneum, 1741. He wrote it in Latin prose to reach a European audience. It did, but through translations. Jens Bagesen turned it into Danish, in which it ran through three editions. In German it had ten, in Swedish, Dutch, and English three, in French and Russian two, in Hungarian one. It was this subterranean journey of Niels Klim that made Holberg the Swift as well as the Voltaire of Denmark. The noises from a cave rouse Niels's curiosity. He resolves to investigate. His friends lower him by a rope, which breaks. With amazing velocity I was hurried down into the abyss. Within the crust of the earth he finds an open space or firmament containing a sun, its planets, and many stars. Falling toward one of these planets, he becomes its satellite and revolves around it helplessly, but he catches hold of an eagle and is carried with it to make a soft landing on the planet Potu. Utopia reversed. Here the trees are the ruling species, rich in sapient sap. Unfortunately, that very tree which I climbed upon was the wife of the sheriff. Potu has some excellent laws. People who dispute publicly about the qualities and essence of the Supreme Being are looked upon as slightly insane. They are treated by bloodletting to reduce their fever and then are kept in confinement until they emerge from this delirium. Mothers in Potu nurse their infants, twenty-one years before Rousseau's appeal to maternal breasts. In the province of Kakulkyu, Kakuldi, the women govern the state, the men keep house or become prostitutes, the queen has a harem of three hundred handsome youths. The philosophers in Kakulkyu spend their time trying to get to the sun and pay little attention to earthly affairs. In the province of Mikolak, all the people are atheists and do whatever evil they can conceal from the police. Niels comes upon a book entitled Tanian's Journey to the Superterranean World, which describes Europe and its strange customs. Heads covered with enormous wigs, hats worn under the arm, as among the nobles of France, little cakes or wafers that are carried about the streets and which the priests say are gods. The very men who baked them will take their oaths that these wafers created the world. The Iter Subterraneum contained some satires of Christian dogma and called for freedom of worship for all sects, but it recommended belief in God, heaven, and hell as necessary supports for a moral code continually battered by the demands of the ego and the flesh. King Frederick V made the reformed reformer a baron in 1747. Holberg had the pleasure of rebellion in his youth and of acceptance in old age, which ended in 1754. He remains to this day the dominating figure in the literature of Denmark. Some would give that place rather to Johannes Ewald, whose career matched those of Byron, Keats, and Shelley in adventure, suffering, and brevity. Born in Copenhagen in 1743, son of a Lutheran minister, he rebelled against his Puritanic elders, fell in love at sixteen with Arensa Hulagar, abandoned a theological career as too tardy in its rewards, enlisted in the Prussian and then the Austrian army, resolved to win the wealth and glory that would make Arensa his bride. But privations and disease destroyed his health. He returned to Copenhagen in theology. Arensa married a prompter fortune, and Ewald poured out his heart in poetry and prose. He wrote the first original Danish tragedy, Rolf Kraga, in 1770, and reached the zenith of Danish poetry in the 18th century with Baldur's Death in 1773, an heroic drama in verse. His work brought him hardly enough bread to live on. He retired to rural solitude, nursed a succession of ailments, 
and was at last revived by a pension from the government. He rewarded it with a play, The Fishers, in 1779, containing the patriotic ballad King Christian Stood by the Lofty Mast, which became the favorite national song of the Danes. It was Ewald's call to glory and his farewell to life. He died after a long and painful illness in 1781, aged 38. Scandinavians rank him as one of the greatest lyric poets of the North, perhaps the very greatest. As the 18th century progressed, the political history of Denmark became part of the unending modern drama between tradition and experiment. Christian VI, who reigned from 1730 to 1746, mingled the opposed forces. He and his ministers advanced economic development by importing weavers and spinners to establish a textile industry, by forming national companies to trade with Asia and America, and by opening the Bank of Copenhagen in 1736. They brought Greenland under the Danish crown in 1744. They spread primary and secondary schools and founded academies for the promotion of letters and learning. However, they renewed an old ordinance requiring Sunday attendance at Lutheran services. They closed all theaters and dance halls, banished actors, for bad masquerades. Christian's son Frederick V, who reigned from 1746 to 1766, allowed these laws to stand, but softened them by his genial spirit and sensual life. In 1751 he secured from Hanover Johann Hartwig Ernst von Bernstorff, who, as chief minister, raised the honesty and competence of administration, restored the army and navy, kept them out of the Seven Years' War, and stirred the still waters of Danish culture by importing professors, poets, artists, and scientists. We have seen Klopstock accepting such an invitation. In 1767, Count von Bernstorff crowned his Pacific foreign policy by persuading Catherine the Great to sign an agreement, releasing Holstein Gottorp to Denmark. Frederick V, worn out with pleasure, died at 43 in 1766. His son, Christian VII, who reigned from 1766 to 1808, was hurried into marriage at the age of 17 with Caroline Matilda, sister of England's George III. She brightened the social life of the capital, but her half-insane husband neglected her for a life of profligacy, and Caroline slipped into a tragic amour with the court physician, Johann Friedrich Streunze. Son of a theology professor at Halle, Streunze studied medicine there, and like most physicians lost his religious faith. He owed his influence with the king to his skill in treating the clinical results of royal amours, and with the queen to his success in bringing Christian the Seventh sufficiently to her bed to beget an heir. As the king's mind sank into apathetic gloom, the queen's power in the government grew, and as she allowed her physician to direct her policies as well as to enjoy her favors, he became in 1770 the real ruler of the state. Orders went out from the royal palace signed by Streunze in the name of the non compos mentis king. Bernstorff was dismissed and retired peacefully to his estates in Germany. Streunze had read the Philosoph, and on their principles he proposed to remodel Danish life. He abolished the abuses of noble privilege, ended censorship of the press, established schools, cleansed the civil service of corruption and jobbery, emancipated the serfs, forbade judicial torture, proclaimed toleration for all religions, encouraged literature and art, reformed the law and the courts, the police, the university, the finances, municipal sanitation. To reduce the public debt, he cancelled many pensions and appropriated the revenues of pious foundations to public ends. The nobles plotted his fall and used the freedom of the press to sap his popularity. Pious Danes resented religious toleration as atheism and spoke of Streunze as a foreigner whose sole source of authority was the bed of the queen. On January 17, 1772, a group of army officers persuaded the king that Streunze and the queen were planning to kill him. He signed an order for their arrest. Caroline was deported to Hamlet's castle of Kronborg. Streunze was cast into a dungeon and, after five weeks of suffering, confessed adultery with the queen. On April 28, 1772, he was hacked to pieces on a scaffold in the presence of an approving multitude. Caroline, on the insistence of George III, was allowed to retire to Sella in Hanover, where she died on May 10, 1773.
1775, aged 24. The successful conspirators raised to power over Guldberg, tutor of Prince Frederick. During twelve years of rule, Guldberg led a patriotic reaction against foreign influence in government language and education, opened office to commoners, restored serfdom, judicial torture, the supremacy of the Lutheran Church, and the religious orientation of the university. Count von Bernstorff's nephew and protege, Andreas Peter von Bernstorff, was put in charge of foreign affairs. When Prince Frederick made himself regent in 1784, Guldberg was dismissed. Andreas von Bernstorff became chief minister and remained so till his death. Under his prudent guidance, serfdom was again abolished in 1787. The slave trade was ended in Danish dominions. Economic enterprise was freed. When Bernstorff died in 1797, Denmark had been set firmly on the road to that peaceful prosperity which made her the envy of the world. 4. The Swedes 1. Politics, 1718-1771 The dramatic career of Charles XII had been a tragedy for Sweden. His aims had consulted his thirst for glory rather than the resources of his country. The Swedish people had borne with him valiantly while he exhausted their manpower and their wealth, but they had known long before he died that he was doomed to fail. By the treaties of Stockholm, 1719-1720, Sweden yielded the duchies of Bremen and Verden to Hanover, and the larger part of Pomerania to Prussia. By the Peace of Nystad in 1721, she surrendered Livonia, Estonia, Ingermanland, and East Karelia to Russia. Sweden's power on the mainland was ended, and she was compelled to withdraw into a peninsula rich in minerals and national character, but demanding arduous labor and persistent skill as the price of life. The defeat of Charles weakened the monarchy and allowed the nobles to regain control of the government. The Constitution of 1720 gave dominant power to a Riksdag, or Diet, made up of four estates— a Ritterhus, or House of Nobles, composed of the heads of all noble families, a House of Priests, the bishops plus some fifty delegates selected by and from the parish clergy, a House of Burgesses, some ninety delegates representing the administrative officials and business leaders of the towns, and a House of Peasants, approximately a hundred delegates chosen by and from the free landowning farmers. Each estate sat separately, and no measure could become law unless three estates approved. In effect, the peasant estate had no legislative power except by consent of two other estates. During the meetings of the Riksdag, a secret committee of fifty nobles, twenty-five priests, and twenty-five burgesses prepared all bills, chose the ministers, and controlled foreign policy. The nobles were free from taxation and had exclusive right to the higher offices in the state. When the Riksdag was not in session, the government was led by a rod, or council, of sixteen or twenty-four men chosen by the Riksdag and responsible to it. The king presided over this council and could cast two votes, otherwise he had no law-making power. Russia, Prussia, and Denmark collaborated to support this constitution on the ground that it favored a policy of peace and checked the martial propensities of strong kings. The monarchy ceased to be hereditary, became elective. At the death of Charles XII, on November 30, 1718, the throne would have passed by heredity to Karl Friedrich, Duke of holstein gottorp a son of Charles's eldest sister. But the Riksdag, 1719, for the first time in twenty years, gave the crown to Ulrike Eleonora, another sister of Charles, on her agreement to renounce the royal absolutism that her brother had exercised. Even so, she proved hard to manage, and in 1720 she was persuaded to abdicate in favor of her husband, Landgrave Frederick I of hesse kassel who now became King Frederick I of Sweden. Under the prudent guidance of Count Arvid Bernhard Horn as Chancellor, Sweden was allowed eighteen years of peace in which to recover from the wounds of war. Proud Swedes ridiculed his pacifism and called his partisans nightcaps, caps for short, implying that they were dotards sleeping while Sweden fell behind in the parade of the powers. Against these, a party of hats was formed by Count Karl Gillenbor, Karl Tessen, and others. This captured the Riksdag in 1738, and Gillenbor replaced Horn. 
Resolved to restore Sweden to her former place among the powers, he renewed the lapsed alliance with France, which sent her subsidies in return for opposition to the aims of Russia. And in 1741 the government declared war against Russia, hoping to regain those Baltic provinces which had been lost to Peter the Great. But neither the army nor the navy had been sufficiently prepared. The navy was incapacitated by disease, and the army yielded all Finland to the Russian advance. Tsarina Elizabeth, anxious to win Sweden's support, agreed to restore most of Finland if her cousin, Adolphus Frederick of holstein gottorp was named heir to the Swedish throne. On these terms, the Peace of Abo ended the war in 1743. When Frederick I died in 1751, Adolphus Frederick became king. The estates soon taught him that he was king in name only. They disputed his right to name new peers or to choose the members of his household. They threatened to dispense with his signature if he objected to signing certain measures or documents. The king was docile, but he had a proud and commanding consort, Louisa Ulrica, sister of Frederick the Great. King and queen attempted a revolt against the power of the estates. It failed. Its agents were tortured and beheaded. The king was spared because the people loved him. Louisa Ulrica consoled and distinguished herself by becoming queen of letters. She befriended Linnaeus and gathered about her a circle of poets and artists through whom she spread the ideas of the French Enlightenment. The Riksdag appointed a new tutor for her ten-year-old son, with instructions to inform the future Gustavus III that in free states kings exist only on sufferance, that they are invested with splendor and dignity more for the honor of the realm than for the sake of the person who may happen to occupy the chief place in the pageant, and that, as the glare and glitter of a court might mislead them into delusions of grandeur, they would do well to visit the huts of the peasantry now and then and see the poverty that pays for the royal pomp. On February 12, 1771, Adolphus Frederick died, and the council summoned Gustavus III to come from Paris and accept the forms of royalty. 2. Gustavus III He was the most attractive king since Henry IV of France. Handsome and gay, loving women, the arts and power, he flashed through Swedish history like an electric charge, bringing to action all the vital elements in the nation's life. He had been well educated by Karl Tessen and had been spoiled by his fond mother. He was intellectually precocious and keen, well endowed with imagination and aesthetic sense, restless with ambition and pride. It is not easy to be a humble prince. His mother transmitted to him her love of French literature. He read Voltaire avidly, sent him homage, learned the Henriade by heart. The Swedish ambassador at Paris forwarded to him each volume of the Encyclopédie as it appeared. He studied history with attention and fascination. He was thrilled by the careers of Gustavus Vasa, Gustavus Adolphus, Charles XII. After reading of these men, he could not bear to be a do-nothing king. In 1766, without consulting him and without the consent of his parents, the council married him to Princess Sophia Magdalena, daughter of Denmark's Frederick V. She was shy, gentle, pious, and thought the theater a place of sin. He was skeptical, loved the drama, and never forgave the council for projecting him into this uncongenial marriage. The council appeased him for a time by a handsome grant for a trip to France from 1770 to 71. He stopped at Copenhagen, Hamburg, and Brunswick, but Paris was his goal. He braved the anger of Louis XV by calling upon the banished Choiseul, and he violated the conventions by visiting Madame du Barry in her chateau at Louvain. He met Rousseau, d'Alembert, Marmontel, and Grimm, but was disillusioned. I have made the acquaintances of all the philosophers, he wrote to his mother, and find their books much more agreeable than their persons. He shone as a northern star at the salons of Madame's Geoffrin, du Deffon, de l'Espinasse, d'Epinay, and Necker. Amid his triumphs he received word that he had become king of Sweden. He did not hurry back. He stayed in Paris long enough to secure large subsidies for Sweden from the almost bankrupt government of France, and 300,000 livres for his own use in managing the Riksdag. On his way home he stopped to see Frederick the Great, who warned him that Prussia would defend, if necessary by arms, that Swedish constitution which so strictly limited the powers of the king. Gustavus reached Stockholm on June 6th. On the 14th he opened his first Riksdag with amiable words strangely like those with which another hampered king, George III, had opened his first parliament in 1760. 
Born and bred among you, I have learned from my tenderest youth to love my country, and I hold it the highest privilege to have been born a Swede, and the greatest honor to be the first citizen of a free people. His eloquence and patriotism won a warm response from the nation, but it left the politicians unmoved. The Caps, friends of the Constitution and Russia, and financed by forty thousand pounds from Catherine the Second, won a majority in three of the four estates. Gustavus countered by borrowing two hundred thousand pounds from Dutch bankers to buy the election of his nominee as Marshal of the Riksdag. But he had still to be crowned, and the Cap-controlled estates revised the coronation oath to pledge the king to abide by the decision of a majority of the estates, and to base all preferments on merit alone. Gustavus resisted for half a year this move toward democracy. Then, in March 1772, he signed it. Secretly, he resolved to overthrow this ungracious constitution as soon as opportunity came. He prepared his ground by establishing popularity. He made himself accessible to all. He bestowed favors as if receiving them. He sent no one away discontent. Several army leaders agreed with him that only a strong central government, untrammeled by a venal Riksdag, could save Sweden from domination by Russia and Prussia, which at this very time, on August 5, 1772, were partitioning Poland. Vergen, the French ambassador, contributed 500,000 ducats to the expenses of the coup. On August 18th, Gustavus arranged that army officers should meet him at the arsenal the next morning. Two hundred came. He asked them to join him in overthrowing a regime of corruption and instability fostered by Sweden's enemies. All but one agreed to follow him. The exception, Governor-General Rudbeck, rode through the streets of Stockholm calling upon the people to protect their freedom. They remained apathetic, for they admired Gustavus and had no love for a Riksdag that, in their view, covered an oligarchy of nobles and businessmen with democratic forms. The young king, now twenty-six, led the officers to the barracks of the Stockholm guards. To these he spoke so persuasively that they pledged him their support. He seemed to be repeating, step by step, the procedure by which Catherine II had reached power in Russia ten years before. When the Riksdag met on August 21st, it found its Riksdag surrounded by grenadiers and the hall itself held by troops. Gustavus, in a speech that made history, reproved the estates for having debased themselves with party quarrels and foreign bribery, and he ordered read to them the new constitution that his aides had prepared. It retained a limited monarchy, but widened the powers of the king. It gave him control of the army, navy, and foreign relations. He alone could appoint and depose ministers. The Riksdag was to assemble only at his call, and he could dismiss it at will. It could discuss only such measures as he laid before it, but no measure could become law without the Riksdag's consent, and it would retain control of the purse through the Bank of Sweden and the right to tax. The king was not to engage in a war of offense without the Riksdag's concurrence. Judges were to be named by the king and be then irremovable, and the right of habeas corpus would protect all arrested persons from the delays of the law. Gustavus asked the delegates to accept this constitution. The bayonets convinced them. They accepted and swore loyalty. The king thanked the Riksdag and dismissed it, promising to recall it within six years. The hats and caps parties disappeared. The coup d'etat was effected with bloodless expedition and apparently to the satisfaction of the people. They hailed Gustavus as their liberator and loaded him with blessings. Men embraced one another with tears of joy. France rejoiced. Russia and Prussia threatened war to restore the old constitution. Gustavus stood his ground. Catherine and Frederick retreated, lest war should endanger their Polish spoils. In the ensuing decade, Gustavus behaved as a constitutional monarch, that is, subject to constituted law. He carried out beneficent reforms and earned a place among the enlightened despots of the century. Voltaire hailed him as the worthy heir of the great name of Gustavus. Turgot, frustrated in France, had the satisfaction of seeing his economic policies succeed in Sweden, where free trade was legalized in grains and industry was released from the cramping regulations of the guilds. Commerce was stimulated by the organization of free ports on the Baltic and free market towns in the interior. Mirabeau Père was asked for advice on improving agriculture. Le Mercier de la Riviere was commissioned to draw up a plan for public education. 
Gustavus sent to Voltaire a copy of the ordinance guaranteeing freedom of the press in 1774, and wrote, It is you that humanity has to thank for the destruction of those obstacles which ignorance and fanaticism have opposed to its progress. He reformed the law and the judiciary, abolished torture, reduced penalties, and stabilized the currency. He lowered the taxes of the peasantry. He reorganized the army and the fleet. Ending the Lutheran monopoly on Swedish piety, he granted toleration to all Christian sects and in three major cities to Jews. When he summoned the Riksdag in 1778, his first six years of rule were approved by it without a single dissenting voice. Gustavus wrote to a friend, I have reached the happiest stage of my career. My people are convinced that I desire nothing but to promote their welfare and establish their freedom. 3. The Swedish Enlightenment Amid this activity of legislation and administration, the king contributed with all his heart to the magnificent outburst of literature and science that put Sweden fully abreast of European intellectual developments in the 18th century. This was the age of Linnaeus in botany, of Scheele and Bergman in chemistry. We have elsewhere paid them honor. But perhaps we should have included under science one of the most remarkable Swedes of the age, Emanuel Swedenborg, for it was as a scientist that he first earned fame. He did original work in physics, astronomy, geology, paleontology, mineralogy, physiology, and psychology. He improved the air pump by using mercury. He gave good accounts of magnetism and phosphorescence. He proposed a nebular hypothesis long before Kant and Laplace. He anticipated modern research on the ductless glands. He showed, 150 years before any other scientist, that the motion of the brain is synchronous with the respiration rather than with the pulse. He localized in the cortex of the brain the higher operations of the mind and assigned to specific parts of the brain the control of specific parts of the body. He addressed the House of Nobles on the decimal system, the reform of the currency, the balance of trade. All his genius seemed directed to science. But when he concluded that his studies were leading him to a mechanistic theory of mind and life and that this theory led to atheism, he reacted strongly away from science toward religion. In 1745 he began to have visions of heaven and hell. He came to trust these visions literally, and he described them in his treatise Heaven and Its Wonders and Hell. He informed his thousands of readers that in heaven they would not be disembodied spirits, but real flesh and blood men and women, enjoying the physical as well as the spiritual delights of love. He did not preach, nor did he found a sect but his influence spread throughout Europe, affecting Wesley, William Blake, Coleridge, Carlyle, Emerson, and Browning. And finally, in 1788, his followers formed the New Jerusalem Church. Despite his opposition, Sweden gave its mind more and more to the Enlightenment. The import or translation of French and English works rapidly produced a secularization of culture and a refinement of literary taste and forms. Under Gustavus III and his mother, the new liberalism found wide acceptance in the middle and upper classes, even among the higher clergy, who began to preach toleration and a simple deistic creed. Everywhere the watchwords were reason, progress, science, liberty, and the good life here on earth. Linnaeus and others organized the Swedish Royal Academy of Sciences in 1739. Carl Tessen founded the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in 1733. A Royal Academy of Belles Lettres had had a brief existence under Queen Louisa Ulrica. Gustavus revived it in 1784 with a rich endowment and directed it to award yearly a medal worth twenty ducats for the best Swedish work in history, poetry, or philosophy. He himself won the first award with his panegyric of Leonard Torstensen, the most brilliant of Gustavus Adolphus's generals. In 1786 the king established, to use his own words, a new academy for the cultivation of our own language on the model of the Académie Française. It is to be called the Swedish Academy and will consist of 18 members. This and the Academy of Belles Lettres were provided with funds for pensions to Swedish scholars and authors. Gustavus personally helped men of letters, of science, or of music. He made them feel that his bounty was their due. He gave them new social status by inviting them to his court, and he stimulated them by his competition. There had been drama in Sweden before him, especially under encouragement by his mother, but it had been provided by French actors presenting French plays. 
This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 2 Concluded There had been drama in Sweden before him, especially under encouragement by his mother, but it had been provided by French actors presenting French plays. Gustavus dismissed the alien troupe and called upon native talent to produce plays for a really Swedish theatre. He himself collaborated with Johann Willander in writing an opera, Thetis Oak Pele. This had its premiere on January 18, 1773, and ran for twenty-eight nights. Then, for eight years, the king gave himself to politics. In 1781, he took up the pen again and composed a series of plays which still rank high in Swedish literature. The first of them, Gustavus Adolphus's Magnanimity, from 1782, marked the beginning of the Swedish drama. The king took his subjects from historical records and taught his people the history of their country as Shakespeare had taught the English. In 1782, at state expense, a superb theatre was built for both drama and music. Gustavus wrote his plays in prose, had them versified by Johann Kellgren, and had native or foreign composers put them to music. So his plays became operas. The best results of this collaboration were Gustav Adolf Uck Eberbrahe, celebrating the great commander's love story, and Gustav Vasa, which told how the first Gustavus had freed Sweden from Danish domination. With such royal leadership and three universities, Uppsala, Abo, and Lund, Sweden moved into its own enlightenment. Olaf von Dahlen provided an Addisonian prelude by writing anonymously and periodically publishing between 1733 and 34, then Svenska Argus, discussing everything except politics in the genial style of the spectator. Nearly every reader was pleased. The Riksdag voted a reward to the author who forthwith came out of hiding. Queen Louisa Ulrika made him court poet and tutor to the future Gustavus III. This fettered and dulled his muse, but it allowed him time and money to write his chef dœuvre Svea Rikus Historia, the first critical history of the Swedish realm. The most interesting figure in the new Pleiad was a woman, Hedvig Nordenflikt, the Sappho, Aspasia, and Charlotte Bronte of Sweden. She alarmed her Puritan parents by reading plays and poetry. They punished her, 
She persisted and wrote verses so charming that they resigned themselves to the scandal. But they compelled her to marry the overseer of their estate, who was wise and ugly. I loved to listen to him as a philosopher, but the sight of him as a lover was unendurable. She learned to love him, only to have him die in her arms after three years of marriage. A handsome young clergyman ended her mourning by courting her. She became his wife and enjoyed the most blissful life that any mortal can have in this imperfect world. But he died within a year, and Hedvig went almost insane with grief. She isolated herself in a cottage on a small island and voiced her sorrow in poems that were so well received that she moved to Stockholm and issued annually, between 1744 and 1750, aphorisms for women by a shepherdess of the north. Her home became a salon for the social and intellectual elite. Young poets like Frederick Gillenborg and Gustav Kreutz followed her in adopting the classic French style and in espousing the Enlightenment. In 1758, aged 40, she fell in love with Johann Fischerström, 23. He confessed that he loved another, but when he saw Hedvig desolate, he proposed marriage to her. She refused the sacrifice, and to simplify matters, she tried to drown herself. She was rescued, but she died three days later. Shepherdess of the North is still a classic in the literature of Sweden. Kreutz followed her romantic flight with an exquisite cycle of songs, Atis o Camilla, in 1762, which remained for many years the most admired poem in the language. Camilla, as a priestess of Diana, is vowed to chastity. Atis, a hunter, sees her, longs for her, wanders through the woods in despair. Camilla, too, is stirred, and asks Diana, Is not nature's law as holy as your decree? She comes upon a wounded heart. She tends and comforts it. It licks her hand. Attis begs similar privileges. She rebukes him. He jumps from a high cliff, seeking death. Cupid breaks his fall. Camilla tends him and accepts his embrace. A serpent buries its fang in her alabaster breast. She dies in Attis's arms. Attis sucks the poison from her wound and nears death. Diana relents, revives them both, and releases Camilla from her virgin vows. All is well. This idol was acclaimed by literate Sweden and by Voltaire, but Kreutz turned to politics and became Chancellor of Sweden. If Hedvig Nordenflikt was the Sappho of Sweden, Karl Bellmann was its Robert Burns. Brought up in comfort and piety, he learned to prefer the jolly songs of the taverns to the somber hymns of his home. In the taverns, the realities of life and feeling were revealed with little concern for convention and propriety. There, each soul was bared by liquor and let truth come out between fancy and wrath. The most tragic figure in this human wreckage was Jan Fredman, once clockmaker to the court, now trying to forget in drink the failure of his marriage. And the gayest was Maria Kielström, queen of the lower depths. Belmont sang their songs with them, composed songs about them, sang these before them to music composed by himself. Some of his songs were a bit loose, and Kelgren, the uncrowned poet laureate of the age, reproved him. But when Belmont prepared Fredmont's epistolar for the press in 1790, Kelgren chaperoned these verse letters with an enthusiastic preface, and the volume received an award from the Swedish Royal Academy. Gustavus III heard Belmont gladly, called him the Anacreon of the North, and gave him a sinecure in the government. The assassination of the king in 1792 left the poet without income. He sank into poverty, was imprisoned for debt, was released by friends. Dying of consumption at the age of fifty-five, he insisted on a last visit to his favorite tavern. There he sang till his voice failed him. He died soon afterward, on February 11th, 1795. Some rank him as the most original of all Swedish poets, and by all odds the greatest in the circle of poets that honored this reign. But the man whom his contemporaries recognized as second only to the king in the intellectual life of the time was Johann Henrik Kelgren. Son of a clergyman, he discarded the Christian creed, marched with the French Enlightenment, and welcomed all the pleasures of life with a minimum of remorse. His earliest book, My Laughter, was an extended ode to joy, erotic joys included. Kelgren hailed laughter as the one divine distinguishing mark of humanity— and invited it to accompany him to the end of his days. In 1778, aged 27, he joined with Carl Peter Lengren, 
in founding the Stockholmsposten. For 17 years, his lively pen made this journal the dominant voice in Swedish intellectual life. In its pages, the French Enlightenment held full sway, the classic style was honored as the supreme norm of excellence, German Romanticism was laughed out of court, and Kellgren's mistresses were exalted in poems that scandalized the conservatives of the hinterland. The assassination of his beloved king took the heart out of the poet's hedonistic philosophy. In 1795, one of his amours ran out of control and deepened into love. Kellgren began to acknowledge the rights of romance, idealism, and religion. He retracted his condemnation of Shakespeare and Goethe, and he thought that, after all, the fear of God might be the beginning of wisdom. However, when he died in 1795, aged only forty-four, he asked that no bells be tolled for him. He was at the end again a son of Voltaire. A charming aspect of his character was his willingness to open the columns of the Posten to opponents of his views. The most vigorous of them was Thomas Torild, who declared war on the Enlightenment as the immature idolatry of superficial reason. At the age of twenty-two, Torild startled Stockholm with the passions, which, he said, contains the full force of my philosophy and all the splendor of my imagination, unrhymed, ecstatic, marvelous. He declared that his whole life was consecrated to revealing nature and reforming the world. Around him gathered a group of literary rebels who fed their fires with Sturm und Drang, ranked Klopstock above Goethe, Shakespeare above Racine, Rousseau above Voltaire. Failing to win Gustavus III to these views, Torild migrated to England in 1788, nourished his soul with James Thompson, Edward Young, and Samuel Richardson, and joined the radicals who favored the French Revolution. In 1790 he returned to Sweden and published political propaganda that stirred the government to banish him. After two years in Germany he was readmitted into Sweden and subsided into a professorial chair. There were several other stars in this literary firmament. Carl Gustav of Leopold pleased the king with the classic form and courtly tone of his verse. Bengt Lidner, like Torild, preferred romance. He was expelled from the University of Lund because of his escapades in 1776, continued his studies and irregularities at Rostock, was put on a ship bound for the East Indies, escaped from it, returned to Sweden, and attracted the attention of Gustavus with a volume of poetic fables. He was appointed secretary to Count Kreutz in the embassy at Paris. There he studied women more than politics and was sent home, where he died in poverty at the age of thirty-five in 1793. He redeemed his life by three volumes hot with Byronic fire. And there was modest Anna Maria Lengren, wife of Kellgren's collaborator on the Stockholm's Posten. To that periodical she contributed verse that won her a special commendation by the Swedish Royal Academy but she did not let her muse interfere with her household chores, and in a poem addressed to an imaginary daughter she counseled her to avoid politics and society and content herself with the tasks and joys of the home. Was there in Swedish art any movement answering to the literature and the drama? Hardly. Carl Gustav of Tessin decorated in Rococo, circa 1750, the royal palace that his father, Nicodemus Tessin, had built in 1693-97, to and he gathered a rich collection of paintings and statuary, which is now part of the Stockholm National Museum. Johann Tobias Sergo carved a Venus and a drunken fawn in classic style, and commemorated in marble the robust features of Johann Pasch. Pasch family included four painters, Lorenz the Elder, his brother Johann, his sister Ulrika, and Lorenz the Younger. Each of these painted royalty and nobility. They were a modest part in the brilliant enlightenment that graced this reign. 4. Assassination It was the king himself who brought the bright flowering to a tragic end. The American Revolution, so powerfully aided by France, seemed to him a threat to all monarchies. He called the colonists rebellious subjects, and vowed that he would never recognize them as a nation until the King of England had absolved them from their oath of allegiance. More and more in his final decade he strengthened the royal power, surrounded it with ceremony and etiquette, and replaced able aides of independent mind with servitors who obeyed his wishes without hesitation or dissent. He began to restrict the freedom that he had given to the press. 
Finding his wife dull, he indulged in flirtations that shocked public opinion, which expected the kings of Sweden to give the nation a model of marital affection and fidelity. He alienated the people by establishing a governmental monopoly in the distillation of liquor. The peasants, accustomed to distill their own, evaded the monopoly by a hundred expedients. He spent increasingly on the army and navy and was visibly preparing for war with Russia. When he assembled his second Riksdag on May 6, 1786, he found no longer in the estates the approval that the Riksdag of 1778 had given to his measures. Almost all of his proposals were rejected or were amended to futility, and he was compelled to surrender the government's liquor monopoly. On July 5th he dismissed the Riksdag and resolved to rule without its consent. That consent by the Constitution of 1772 was necessary for any war but one of defense, and Gustavus was meditating an attack upon Russia. Why? He knew that Russia and Denmark had signed on August 12, 1774, a secret treaty for united action against Sweden. He visited Catherine II at St. Petersburg in 1777, but their mutual either the hostess nor her guest. As Russian victories against Turkey mounted, Gustavus feared that if nothing were done to end them, the Empress would soon direct her immense armies westward in the hope of subjecting Sweden to her will as she had done with Poland. Was there any way of frustrating that design? Only, the king felt, by aiding Turkey with a flank attack upon St. Petersburg. The sultan helped him decide by offering Sweden a subsidy of a million piastres annually for the next ten years if she would join in the effort to check Catherine. Perhaps now Sweden could recover what she had surrendered to Peter the Great in 1721. In 1785 Gustavus began to prepare his army and navy for war. In 1788 he sent to Russia an ultimatum demanding the restoration of Karelia and Livonia to Sweden and of the Crimea to Turkey. On June 24th he embarked for Finland. On July 2nd at Helsingfors he took charge of his assembled forces and began to drive toward St. Petersburg. Everything went wrong. The fleet was stopped by a Russian flotilla in an indecisive battle off the island of Hogland on July 17th. In the army, a hundred and thirteen officers mutinied, charging that the king had violated his pledge to make no offensive war without the Riksdag's consent. They sent an emissary to Catherine, offering to place themselves under her protection and to cooperate with her in making both Swedish and Russian Finland an independent state. Meanwhile, Denmark dispatched an army to attack Göteborg, the richest city in Sweden. Gustavus accepted this invasion as a challenge that would arouse the spirit of his people. He appealed to the nation, and especially to the rugged peasants of the mining districts called the Dales, to give him a new and more loyal army. He went in person, dressed in the Dalesman's characteristic garb, to address them from that same churchyard in the village of Mora, where Gustavus Vasa had asked for their aid in 1521. The people responded. Volunteer regiments were formed in a hundred towns. In September, the king, fighting for his political life, rode two hundred and fifty miles in forty-eight hours, made his way into Göteborg, and inspired the garrison to continue its defense against twelve thousand besieging Danes. Fortune turned in his favor. Prussia, unwilling to let Sweden fall subject to Russia, threatened war upon Denmark. The Danes withdrew from Swedish soil. Gustavus returned in triumph to his capital. Now, emboldened by a new army dedicated to him, he summoned the Riksdag to assemble on January 26, 1789. Of 950 men in the House of Nobles, 700 supported the mutinous officers, but the other houses, clergy, burgesses, and peasants, were overwhelmingly for the king. Gustavus declared political war against the nobles by submitting to the Riksdag an act of unity and security, which ended many privileges of the aristocracy, opened nearly all offices to commoners, and gave the king full monarchical powers over legislation, administration, war, and peace. The three lower estates accepted the act. The Ritterhus rejected it as unconstitutional. Gustavus arrested twenty-one nobles, including Count Frederick Axel von Fersen and Baron Karl Frederick von Pecklin, one honorable and ineffective, the other clever and treacherous. But the power of the purse still remained with the Riksdag, and appropriations required the consent of all four chambers. The three lower orders voted the king, for as long as he might consider necessary, the funds he asked for continuing the war against Russia. The House of Nobles refused to vote supplies beyond two years. 
On April 17th, Gustavus entered the Ritterhus, took the chair, and put to the nobles the question of accepting the decision of the three other houses. The nose preponderated, but the king announced that his proposal had won. He thanked the nobles for their gracious support and withdrew, having risked assassination by the infuriated magnates. He now felt free to prosecute the war. During the remainder of 1789, he rebuilt the army and the fleet. On July 9, 1790, his navy met the Russian in the Svenksund, part of the Gulf of Finland, and won the most decisive victory in Sweden's naval history. The Russians lost 53 ships and 9,500 men. Catherine II, still busy with the Turks, was ready for peace. By the Treaty of Varala, on August 15, 1790, she agreed to end her efforts to control the politics of Sweden, and pre-war boundaries were restored. On October 19, 1791, Gustavus persuaded her to sign with him a defensive alliance which pledged her to send Sweden 300,000 rubles per year. Doubtless their common fear of the French Revolution turned the old foes to this new partnership. Gustavus remembered gratefully that France had been Sweden's faithful friend through 250 years, and that Louis XV and Louis XVI had supported him with 38,300,000 livres between 1772 and 1789. He proposed a League of Princes to invade France and restore the monarchy to power. He sent Hans Axel von Fersen, son of his enemy, Count von Fersen, to arrange the flight of Louis XVI from Paris. He himself went to Aix-la-Chapelle to lead the Allied army, and he offered asylum in his camp to the French émigrés. Catherine gave money, but no men. Leopold II refused to cooperate, and Gustavus returned to Stockholm to protect his throne. The nobles whose political supremacy he had ended were not reconciled to defeat. They looked upon Gustavus's absolute rule as a plain violation of the constitution that he had sworn to support. Jakob Ankerström brooded over the fall of his class. I bethought me much if perchance there was any fair means of getting the king to rule his land and people according to law and benevolence, but every argument was against me. It were better to venture one's life for the commonweal. In 1790 he was tried for sedition. This misfortune knit my resolve rather to die than live a wretched life, so that my otherwise sensitive and affectionate heart became altogether callous as regards this horrible deed. Becklin, Count Karl Horn, and others joined in the conspiracy to kill the king. On March 16, 1792, a date ominously recalling Caesar, Gustavus received a letter warning him not to attend a masquerade ball scheduled for that night in the French theater. He went half-masked, but the decorations on his breast revealed his rank. Ankerström recognized him, shot him, and fled. Gustavus was carried to a coach and led through an excited crowd to the royal palace. He was bleeding dangerously, but he jokingly remarked that he resembled a pope born in procession through Rome. Within three hours of the attack, Ankerström was arrested, within a few days all the ringleaders. Horn confessed that the plot had had a hundred accomplices. The populace cried out for their execution. Gustavus recommended clemency. Ankerström was scourged, beheaded, and quartered. Gustavus lingered for ten days then told that he had only a few hours of life left to him, he dictated documents for a regency to govern the country and the capital. He died on March 26, 1792, aged 45. Nearly all the nation mourned him, for it had learned to love him despite his faults, and it realized that under his lead Sweden had lived through one of the most glorious ages in her history. This concludes the reading of Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant, Part 2. This book was read by Alexander Adams. Rousseau and Revolution, Part 3, continues the story and is available through Books on Tape service. If you have enjoyed these tapes, you may want to consider buying this audiobook and donating it to your local library so that others in your community can enjoy it too. The donation will be deductible to the extent allowable under the law. Books on Tape produces many new unabridged audiobook titles each month. To find out more about them, or to arrange a library donation, or to speed your next title to you without delay, call our customer service department. We hope you enjoyed this reading. Please continue listening to sample another Books on Tape bestseller. Noah Webster, The Life and Times of an American Patriot, by Harlow Giles Unger. 
Copyright 1998 by Harlow Giles Unger. This recording of the full-length reading of Noah Webster, The Life and Times of an American Patriot, was published by arrangement with New England Publishing Associates Incorporated and was produced in 1999 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. This book is read by John Edwardson. Noah Webster, The Life and Times of an American Patriot by Harlow Giles Unger. This book consists of ten chapters and is 386 pages long. Prologue Of the thousands of students and tourists who visit Noah Webster's birthplace in Connecticut each year, some unfortunately confuse Noah with his distant younger cousin, Daniel Webster, often knowing as little about Daniel as they do about Noah. The Noah Webster house, where Noah Webster was born in 1758 and lived until his graduation from college, is a National Historic Landmark that was restored in 1965. Now a public museum, it is furnished with period pieces and maintained by the Noah Webster Foundation, which offers guided tours lasting about one hour every day except Wednesdays and major holidays from 1 to 4 p.m. Most, however, realize that Noah's the one who wrote the dictionary, and assume that's all he did in the course of his 85 years. Webster's name, after all, has always been an American household word. Say dictionary, and Americans almost automatically respond, Webster's. Indeed, Webster's dictionary has become so much a part of American daily life that it has obscured its author's other achievements, many of which were of far greater import than his dictionary. Noah Webster was one of the towering intellects of his generation. Long before he even thought about writing a dictionary, Webster had assumed a place among the nation's founding fathers as the father of cultural independence, whose words reached American minds in every home and classroom and transformed the nation from a babel of conflicting tongues, English, Dutch, French, German, and innumerable others, into the first nation on earth where generations of diverse people would speak and think in one language as one people. There has never been a great nation with a universal language without dialects, proclaimed a newspaper editorial in 1857, more than a decade after his death. The Yorkshireman cannot talk with a man from Cornwall. The peasant of the Lugurian Apennines drives his goats home at evening, over hills that look down on six provinces, none of whose dialects he can speak. Here in the United States, five thousand miles change not the sound of a word. Around every fireside and from every tribune and every field of labor and every factory of toil is heard the same tongue. We owe it to Webster. Webster really led two different lives in the span of a single lifetime, with the end of the eighteenth century serving as a division between the two. Each was dramatically different from the other, and illustrious enough to have provided any ordinary man with a lifetime of brilliance. But Webster was no ordinary man. A descendant of New England's first Puritan settlers, he devoted the first half of his life to a relentless war against political and social disunion and the forces of anarchy. His powerful essays helped ensure ratification of the Constitution that united the thirteen feuding states of the Confederation. Then, by word and deed, he faced down raging street mobs and anarchists and helped expose foreign plotters conspiring to overthrow the American government and dismember the new nation. He fought for universal public education and created a national system of instruction he hoped would eradicate illiteracy and educate all ranks of society. Lecturing in town after town, north and south, he harangued listeners with the notion that the survival of liberty in a self-governing nation depended on a universally educated, literate electorate, and that national unity depended on linguistic unity, with all Americans speaking a single common language. Webster was the nation's first great social reformer. He was one of the first American leaders to campaign for universal public education, women's education, unemployment and workmen's compensation insurance, social welfare for the poor and homeless, child care, 
city planning, public sanitation, public health, advanced methods of agriculture, free commerce and trade, dredging of rivers and canal construction, copyright protection for authors, and historical preservation. He was one of the early champions of emancipation and fought for everyone whose rights were unprotected. And all of this before he turned forty. Webster spent the second half of his life weaving the fabric of American cultural and linguistic unity. Calling language a band of national union, he invented the concept of America in his textbooks for children. Designed to teach Americans to speak alike, Webster's books did more than teach children to read, write, and speak American. They taught children to live, breathe, and think American. For more than a century, Webster's textbooks gave millions of illiterate, native, and foreign-born children a new common heritage, as well as a new common language. Webster's books not only served his own generation, but every generation of Americans that followed, including our own. Until Webster, no great nation on earth could boast of the linguistic unity that Webster created in the United States. More than a lexicographer, Webster was a teacher, philosopher, author, essayist, orator, political leader, public official, and crusading editor. Webster's life thrust him into every major event of the early history of our nation, from the Revolutionary War to the War of 1812. Noah Webster, The Life and Times of an American Patriot, by Harlow Giles Unger. This concludes our program on this cassette. Please call Books on Tape Incorporated for information about it or any title we have recorded. Please wind the cassette forward to its end so it will be in order for the next listener. Thank you. Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 Copyright 1967 by Will and Ariel Durant This recording of the full-length reading of Rousseau and Revolution Part 3 was published by arrangement with Monica Ariel Mile, trustee Ethel B. Durant Trust, Monica Ariel Mile, and William James Durant Easton and was produced in 1999 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Neither this recording nor any part thereof may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Books on Tape Incorporated. This book is read by Alexander Adams. Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 This part consists of chapters 27 through 38. Book Six, Johnson's England, 1756 to 1789. Chapter 27, The Industrial Revolution. One, Causes. Why did the Industrial Revolution come to England first? Because England had won great wars on the continent while keeping its own soil free from war's devastation, because it had secured command of the seas and had thereby acquired colonies that provided raw materials and needed manufactured goods, because its armies, fleets, and growing population offered an expanding market for industrial products, because the guilds could not meet these widening demands, because the profits of far-flung commerce accumulated capital seeking new avenues of investment, because England allowed its nobles and their fortunes to engage in commerce and industry, because the progressive displacement of tillage by pasturage drove peasants from the fields to the towns, where they added to the labor force available for factories, because science in England was directed by men of a practical bent, while on the continent it was predominantly devoted to abstract research, and because England had a constitutional government sensitive to business interests, and vaguely aware that priority in the Industrial Revolution would make England for over a century the political leader of the Western world. British command of the seas had begun with the defeat of the Spanish Armada, 
It had been extended by victories over Holland in the Anglo-Dutch Wars and over France in the War of the Spanish Succession, and the Seven Years' War had made oceanic commerce almost a British monopoly. An invincible navy made the English Channel a protective moat for this fortress built by nature against infection and the hand of war. The English economy was not only spared the ravages of soldiery, it was nourished and stimulated by the needs of British and Allied armies on the continent, hence the special expansion of the textile and metallurgical industries, and the call for machines to accelerate and for factories to multiply production. Command of the seas facilitated the conquest of colonies. Canada and the richest parts of India fell to England as fruit of the Seven Years' War. Voyages like those of Captain Cook, 1768-76, to 76, secured for the British Empire islands strategically useful in war and trade. Rodney's victory over de Grasse in 1782 confirmed British dominion over Jamaica, Barbados, and the Bahamas. New Zealand was acquired in 1787, Australia in 1788. Colonial and other overseas trade gave British industry a foreign market unrivaled in the 18th century. Commerce with the English settlements in North America employed 1,078 vessels and 29,000 seamen. London, Bristol, Liverpool, and Glasgow flourished as chief ports for this Atlantic trade. The colonies took manufactured articles and sent back food, tobacco, spices, tea, silk, cotton, raw materials, gold, silver, and precious stones. Parliament restricted with high tariffs the import of foreign manufactures and discouraged the development of colonial or Irish industries competitive with those of Britain. No internal tolls, such as those that hampered domestic trade in France, impeded the movement of goods through England, Scotland, and Wales. These lands constituted the largest free trade area in Western Europe. The upper and middle classes enjoyed the highest prosperity and a purchasing power that was an added stimulus to industrial production. The guilds were not competent to meet the demands of expanding markets at home and abroad. They had been instituted chiefly to supply the needs of a municipality and its environs. They were shackled by old regulations that discouraged invention, competition, and enterprise. They were not equipped to procure raw materials from distant sources or to acquire capital for enlarged production or to calculate, obtain, or fill orders from abroad. Gradually, the guildmaster was replaced by projectors, entrepreneurs, who knew how to raise money, to anticipate or create demand, to secure raw materials, and to organize machines and men to produce for markets in every quarter of the globe. The money was provided by the profits of commerce or finance, by the spoils of war and privateers, by the mining or import of gold or silver, by the great fortunes made in the slave trade or the colonies. Englishmen went out poor, some came back rich. As early as 1744, there were fifteen men who, returning from the West Indies, had money enough to buy election to Parliament. And by 1780 the nabobs, who had acquired riches in India, were a power in the House of Commons. Much of this exotic pelt was available for investment. And whereas in France the nobles were forbidden, in England they were permitted to engage in commerce or industry, and wealth rooted in land grew through investment in business enterprise. So the Duke of Bridgewater risked his patrimony in mining coal. Thousands of Britons were depositing their savings in banks, which lent at low rates of interest. Money lenders were everywhere. Bankers had discovered that the easiest way to make money is to handle other people's money. There were twenty banks in London in 1750, fifty in 1770, seventy in 1800. Burke reckoned twelve banks outside of London in 1750. In 1793 there were four hundred. Paper money added to the fertilizing pollen. In 1750 it was two percent of the currency. In 1800 it was ten percent. Hoarded money ventured into investment as commerce and industry announced their rising dividends. The multiplying shops and factories needed men. The natural supply of labor was augmented by the rising number of rural families that could no longer make a living on the farm. The flourishing wool industry demanded wool. More and more land was withdrawn from tillage and given to pasturage. Sheep replaced men. Goldsmith's Auburn was not the only deserted village in Britain. Between 1702 and 1760 there had been 246 Acts of Parliament 
authorizing the removal of 400 acres from planting. Between 1760 and 1810, there were 2,438 such acts, affecting nearly 5 million acres. As agricultural machinery improved, small holdings became undesirable because they could not use or pay for the new machines. Thousands of farmers sold their land and became hired hands on large-scale farms or in rural mills or in the towns. The large farms, with better methods, organization, and machines, produced more per acre than the farms of the past, but they almost wiped out the yeomen, or peasant proprietors, who had been the economic, military, and moral backbone of England. Meanwhile, immigration from Ireland and the continent added to the men, women, and children who competed for jobs in the factories. Science played only a modest part in the economic transformation of 18th century England. The researches of Stephen Hales on gases, of Joseph Black on heat and steam, helped Watt to improve the steam engine. The Royal Society of London was composed mostly of practical men who favored studies that promised industrial application. The British Parliament, too, had a mind for material considerations. Though it was dominated by landowners, several of these took a hand in commerce or industry, and most of the members were amenable to the pleas and gifts of businessmen for relaxing the restrictions that earlier governments had laid upon the economy. The advocates of free enterprise and free trade, and of wages and prices left free to rise or fall with the laws of supply and demand, won the support of several parliamentary leaders, and the legal barriers to the spread of commerce and manufactures were slowly broken down. All the conditions prerequisite to English priority in the Industrial Revolution were fulfilled. 2. Components The material elements of the Industrial Revolution were iron, coal, transportation, machinery, power, and factories. Nature played its part by providing England with iron, coal, and liquid roads. But iron, as it came from the mines, was permeated with impurities, from which it had to be freed by smelting, melting or fusing with fire. Coal, too, was alloyed with impurities. These were removed by heating or cooking coal till it became coke. Iron ore heated and purified to diverse degrees by burning coke became wrought iron, cast iron, or steel. To increase the heat, Abraham Darby built from 1754 on, blast furnaces in which extra air was supplied to the fire from a pair of bellows worked by a water wheel. In 1760, John Smeaton replaced the bellows with a compressed air pump driven partly by water, partly by steam. The constant high-pressure blast raised the production of industrial iron from 12 tons to 40 tons per furnace per day. Iron became cheap enough to be used in hundreds of new ways. So, in 1763, Richard Reynolds built the first known railway, iron tracks that enabled cars to replace pack horses in transporting coal and ore. Now began an age of famous iron masters who dominated the industrial scene and made great fortunes by using iron for purposes that seemed quite alien to that metal. So John Wilkinson and Abraham Darby II spanned the River Severn with the first iron bridge in 1779. Wilkinson amused England by proposing an iron ship. Some said he had lost his mind. But relying upon principles established by Archimedes, he put together with metal sheets the first iron vessel known to history in 1787. Businessmen came from abroad to see and study the great works set up by Wilkinson, Richard Crawshay, or Anthony Bacon. Birmingham, close to extensive deposits of coal and iron, became the leading center of England's iron industry. From such shops, new tools and machines, stronger, more durable, and reliable, were poured into Britain's shops and factories. Coal and iron were heavy, costly to convey, except by water. A richly indented coastline allowed maritime transport to reach many major cities of Britain. To bring materials and products to towns distant from the coast and navigable streams, a revolution in transportation had to be effected. The movement of goods overland was still difficult, despite the network of turnpikes built between 1751 and 1771. They took their name from the pike-studded turnstiles that obstructed passage until toll was paid. These toll roads doubled the speed of transit and quickened internal trade. 
pack horses were superseded by horse-drawn carts, and travel by horseback gave way to stagecoaches. The turnpikes, however, were left to private enterprise for their maintenance, and rapidly deteriorated. So commercial traffic still preferred the waterways. Streams were dredged to bear heavy vessels, and rivers and towns were bound with one another by canals. James Brindley, without formal or technical education, grew from a letterless millwright into the most remarkable canal engineer of the time, solving by his mechanical bent the problems of carrying canals through locks and tunnels and over aqueducts. In 1759 to 61, he built a canal that brought to Manchester the coal from the mines of the Duke of Bridgewater at Worsley. This cut in half the cost of coal at Manchester, and played a principal part in making that city an industrial metropolis. One of the most picturesque sights in eighteenth-century England was a ship moving along the Brindley Bridgewater Canal, carried by an aqueduct ninety-nine feet high over the river Irwell at Barton. In 1766, Brindley began the Grand Trunk Canal, which, by connecting the rivers Trent and Mersey, opened a water route across mid-England from the Irish to the North Sea. Other canals bound the Trent with the Thames and Manchester with Liverpool. In a period of thirty years, hundreds of new canals greatly reduced the cost of commercial traffic in Britain. Given materials, fuels, and transportation, the Industrial Revolution had next to multiply goods. The demand for machines to accelerate production was greatest in textiles. People wanted to be clothed, and soldiers and lasses had to be hypnotized with uniforms. Cotton was entering England in rapidly rising amounts. Three million pounds in 1753, thirty-two million in 1789. Hand labor could not process this into finished goods in time to meet demand. The division of labor that had developed in the clothing trades suggested and promoted the invention of machines. John Kay had begun the mechanization of weaving by his flying shuttle in 1733, and Lewis Paul had mechanized spinning by a system of rollers in 1738. In 1765, James Hargreaves of Blackburn, Lancashire, changed the position of the spinning wheel from vertical to horizontal, placed one wheel on top of another, turned eight of them by one pulley and belt, and wove eight threads at once. He added more power to more spindles, until his spinning Jenny, Jenny was his wife, wove eighty threads at a time. And spinners feared that this contraption would throw them out of work and food. They broke up Hargreaves's machines. He fled for his life to Nottingham, where a shortage of labor allowed his jennies to be installed. By 1788 there were twenty thousand of them in Britain, and the spinning wheel was on its way to becoming a romantic ornament. In 1769 Richard Arkwright, using the suggestions of various mechanics, developed a water frame by which water power moved cotton fibers between a succession of rollers that pulled and stretched the fibers into tighter, harder yarn. About 1774, Samuel Crompton combined Hargreaves's Jenny and Arkwright's rollers into a hybrid machine which English wit called Crompton's Mule. An alternate backward and forward motion of the rotating spindles stretched, twisted, and wound the thread, giving it greater fineness and strength. This procedure remained, till our time, the principle of the most complex textile machinery. The jenny and the water frame had been made of wood. The mule, after 1783, used metal rollers and wheels, and became sturdy enough to bear the speed and strain of power operation. Power looms worked by cranks and weights had been used in Germany and France, but in 1787 Edmund Cartwright built at Doncaster a small factory in which twenty looms were operated by animal motion. In 1786 he replaced this power plant by a steam engine. Two years later he joined with some Manchester friends to set up a large factory in which four hundred looms were run by steam. Here, too, the workers rebelled. They burned the factory to the ground and threatened to kill the promoters. In the ensuing decade many power looms were built. Rioters smashed some of them. Some survived and multiplied. The machines won. England had been helped to industry through water power from numerous streams fed by abundant rain. So, in the eighteenth century, mills were erected not so much in the towns as in the countryside, along streams that could be dammed to create waterfalls of sufficient force to turn great wheels. 
At this point, a poet might wonder, had it not been better if steam had never replaced water as a motive force, and industry, instead of being congregated in cities, had been mingled with agriculture in the rural scene. But the more effective and profitable method of production displaces the less, and the steam engine, which also till lately had a romantic glow, promised to produce or transport more goods and gold than the world had ever seen before. The steam engine was the culmination, not quite a product, of the Industrial Revolution. Not to go back to Hero of Alexandria, about A.D. 200, Denis Papin described all the components and principles of a practical steam engine in 1690. Thomas Savory built a steam-driven pump in 1698. Thomas Newcomen developed this, from 1708 to 1712, into a machine in which steam generated by heated water was condensed by a jet of cold water, and the alternation of atmospheric pressure drove a piston up and down. This atmospheric engine remained the standard until James Watt transformed it into a true steam engine in 1765. Unlike most inventors of that time, Watt was a student as well as a practical man. His grandfather was a teacher of mathematics. His father was an architect, shipbuilder, and magistrate in the borough of Greenock, in southwest Scotland. James had no college education, but he had creative curiosity and a mechanical bent. Half the world knows the story that an aunt reproved him. I never saw such an idle boy as you are. For the last hour you have not spoken one word, but you have taken off the lid of that kettle and put it on again and holding now a cap and now a silver spoon over the steam, watching how it rises from the spout and catching and counting the drops. This has the odor of legend. However, an extant manuscript in James Watt's hand describes an experiment in which the straight end of a pipe was fixed on the spout of a tea kettle. And another manuscript reads, I took a bent glass tube and inverted it into the nose of a tea kettle, the other end being immersed in cold water. At the age of twenty, in 1756, Watt tried to set up in Glasgow as a maker of scientific instruments. The city guilds refused him a license on the ground that he had not completed the full term of apprenticeship, but the University of Glasgow gave him a workshop within its grounds. He attended the chemistry lectures of Joseph Black, won his friendship and aid, and was especially interested in Black's theory of latent heat. He learned German, French, and Italian to read foreign books, including metaphysics and poetry. Sir James Robison, who knew him at that time, in 1758, was struck by Watt's varied knowledge, and said, I saw a workman and expected no more. I found a philosopher. In 1763 the university asked him to repair a model of Newcomen's engine used in a physics course. He was surprised to find that three-fourths of the heat supplied to the machine were wasted. After each stroke of the piston, the cylinder lost heat through the use of cold water to condense the new supply of steam entering the cylinder. So much energy was lost that most manufacturers had judged the machine unprofitable. Watt proposed to condense the steam in a separate container, whose low temperature would not affect the cylinder in which the piston moved. This condenser increased by some 300 percent the efficiency of the machine in the proportion of fuel used to work done. Moreover, in Watt's reconstruction, the piston was moved by the expansion of steam, not of air. He had made a true steam engine. The passage from plans and models to practical application consumed twelve years of Watt's life. To make successive samples and improvements of his engine, he borrowed over a thousand pounds, chiefly from Joseph Black, who never lost faith in him. John Smeaton, himself an inventor and engineer, predicted that Watt's engine could never be brought into general use because of the difficulty of getting its parts manufactured with sufficient precision. In 1765, Watt married and had to earn more money. He put aside his invention and took to surveying and engineering, drawing up plans for harbors, bridges, and canals. Meanwhile, Black introduced him to John Roebuck, who was looking for a more effective engine than Newcomen's for pumping water from the coal mines that supplied fuel for his ironworks at Carron. In 1767 he agreed to pay Watt's debts and provide capital for building engines to Watt's specifications in return for two-thirds of the profits from installations or sales. 
To protect their investment, Watt, in 1769, asked Parliament for a patent that would give him sole right to produce his engine. It was granted him till 1783. He and Roebuck set up an engine near Edinburgh, but poor workmanship by the Smiths made it a failure. In some cases, the cylinders made for Watt were an eighth of an inch greater in diameter at one end than at the other. Pressed by reverses, Roebuck sold his share of the partnership to Matthew Bolton in 1773. Now began an alliance notable in the history of friendship as well as of industry. Bolton was no mere money-maker. He was so interested in improving his modes and mechanisms of production that in achieving this he lost a fortune. In 1760, aged thirty-two, he married a rich woman and might have retired on her income. Instead, he built at Soho, near Birmingham, one of England's most extensive industrial plants, manufacturing a great variety of metal articles from shoe buckles to chandeliers. To operate the machines in the five buildings of his factory, he had relied on water power. He proposed now to try steam power. He knew that Watt had shown the inefficiency of the Newcomen engine, and that Watt's engine had failed because of inaccurately bored cylinders. He took a calculated risk that this defect could be overcome. In 1774 he moved Watt's engine to Soho. In 1775 Watt followed it. Parliament extended the patent from 1783 to 1800. In 1775, Iron Master Wilkinson invented a hollow cylindrical boring bar that enabled Bolton and Watt to produce engines of unprecedented power and competence. Soon the new firm was selling engines to manufacturers and mine owners throughout Britain. Boswell visited Soho in 1776 and reported, Mr. Hector was so good as to accompany me to see the great works of Mr. Bolton. I wished Johnson had been with us, for it was a scene which I should have been glad to contemplate by his light. The vastness and the contrivances of some of the machinery would have matched his mighty mind. I shall never forget Mr. Bolton's expression to me. I sell here, sir, what all the world desires to have, power. He had about seven hundred people at work. I contemplated him as an iron chieftain, and he seemed to be a father to his tribe. Watt's engines were still unsatisfactory, and he constantly labored to improve them. In 1781 he invented a device by which the reciprocal motion of the piston was converted into rotating motion, thereby adapting the engine for driving ordinary machinery. In 1782 he patented a double-acting engine, in which both ends of the cylinder received impulses from the boiler and the condenser. In 1788 he patented a fly-ball governor that adjusted the flow of steam to promote uniform speed in the engine. During these experimental years other inventors were making competitive engines, and it was not till 1783 that Watt's sales paid off his debts and began to bring in gains. When his patent expired, he retired from active work, and the firm of Bolton and Watt was carried on by their sons. Watt amused himself with minor inventions, and lived into a cheerful old age, dying in 1819 at the age of 83. There were many other inventions in this exuberant age, when, as Dean Tucker said, almost every master manufacturer hath a new invention of his own, and is daily improving on those of others. Watt himself developed a duplicating process by using a glutinous ink and pressing the written or printed page against a moistened sheet of thin paper, this in 1780. One of his employees, William Murdoch, applied Watt's engine to traction and built a model locomotive that traveled eight miles an hour, in 1784. Murdoch shared with Philippe Le Bon of France the distinction of using coal gas for illumination. He so lighted the exterior of the Soho factory in 1798. The central view of the English economy at the end of the 18th century is one of the steam engine leading and quickening the pace, harnessing itself to machines in a hundred industries, luring textile works from water to steam power, from 1785 onward, changing the countryside, invading the towns, darkening the sky with coal dust and fumes, and hiding in the bowels of ships to give new force to England's mastery of the seas. Two other elements were needed to make the revolution complete, factories and capital. The components, fuel, power, materials, machines, and men, could cooperate best when brought together in one building or plant, 
in one organization and discipline under one head. There had been factories before. Now, as the widened market called for regular and large-scale production, they multiplied in number and size, and the factory system became one name for the new order in industry. And as industrial machinery and plants became more costly, the men and institutions that could collect or furnish capital rose to power, the banks surmounted the factories, and the entire complex took the name of capitalism, an economy dominated by the providers of capital. Now, with every stimulus to invention and competition, with enterprise increasingly freed from guild restrictions and legislative barriers, the Industrial Revolution was ready to remake the face and sky and soul of Britain. 3. Conditions Both employer and employee had to change their habits, skills, and relations. The employer, dealing with ever more men, and in a faster turnover, lost intimacy with them and had to think of them not as acquaintances engaged in a common task, but as particles in a process that would be judged by profits alone. More artisans before 1760 worked in guild shops or at home, where the hours of labor were not inflexible and intervals of rest might be allowed, and in an earlier age there had been holy days in which all gainful labor was forbidden by the church. We must not idealize the condition of the common man before the Industrial Revolution. Nevertheless, we may say that the hardships to which he was subjected were such as had tradition, habituation, and in many cases the open air, to soften them. As industrialization advanced, the hardships of the employee were mitigated by shorter hours, higher wages, and wider access to the increasing flow of goods from the machines. But the half-century of transition from craft and home to factory, after 1760, was for the laborers of England one of inhuman subjection, sometimes worse than slavery. Most factories in that period required twelve to fourteen hours of work per day, six days a week. Employers argued that the laborer had to be kept for long hours because he could not be relied upon to report regularly. Many workers drank too heavily on Sunday to come in on Monday. Some others, after working for four days, stayed home the next three. Adam Smith explained that excessive application during four days of the week is frequently the real cause of the idleness of the other three. He warned that prolongation or high speed of work might lead to physical or mental breakdown, and he added that the man who works so moderately as to be able to work constantly not only preserves his health the longest, but in the course of the year executes the greatest quantity of work. Real wages, of course, can be estimated only in connection with prices. In 1770, a four-pound loaf of bread in Nottingham cost about sixpence, a pound of cheese or pork fourpence, a pound of butter sevenpence. Adam Smith, toward 1773, calculated the average wage of London workers at ten shillings, in smaller centres seven shillings, in Edinburgh five shillings. Arthur Young, about 1770, reported the weekly wages of English industrial workers as varying geographically from six shillings sixpence to eleven shillings. Wages were evidently much lower in relation to prices than now, but some employers added fuel or rent to the wages, and some employees gave part of their time to agricultural work. After 1793, when England began her long war with revolutionary France, Prices rose much faster than wages, and poverty became desperate. Many eighteenth-century economists recommended low wages as a stimulus to steady work. Even Arthur Young, who was disturbed by the poverty that he saw in some districts of France, declared, Everyone but an idiot knows that the lower classes must be kept poor, or they will never be industrious. Or, as one J. Smith put it, it is a fact well known to those who are conversant in this matter that scarcity to a certain degree promotes industry, and that the manufacturer, that is, manual worker, who can subsist on three days' work will be idle and drunk the remainder of the week. Upon the whole we can fairly aver that a reduction of wages in the woolen manufacture would be a national blessing, and no real injury to the poor. By this means we might keep our trade, uphold our rents, revenues, and reform the people into the bargain. Women and children were employed in the factories, usually for unskilled operations. Some skilled women weavers made as much as their men, but the usual earnings of factory women 
averaged three shillings sixpence, rarely more than half the wage of men. Textile mills alone in 1788 employed 59,000 women and 48,000 children. Sir Robert Peel had over a thousand children in his Lancashire factories. Child labor was no new practice in Europe. It had been taken for granted on the farms and in domestic industry. Since universal education was frowned upon by conservatives as leading to a surplus of scholars and a dearth of manual laborers, very few Englishmen in the eighteenth century saw any evil in children going to work instead of to school. When machines were simple enough to be tended by children, factory owners welcomed boys and girls five years old or more. Parish authorities, resenting the cost of supporting orphans or pauper children, gladly farmed them out to industrialists, sometimes in lots of fifty, eighty, or a hundred. In several cases they stipulated that the employer should take one idiot to every twenty children. The usual working day for child laborers was from ten to fourteen hours. They were often housed in groups, and in some factories they worked in twelve-hour shifts, so that the machines rarely stopped and the beds were seldom unoccupied. Discipline was maintained by blows or kicks. Disease found defenseless victims in these factory apprentices. Many were deformed by their labor or were maimed by accidents. Some killed themselves. A few men were delicate enough to condemn such child labor. However, it diminished not because men became more humane, but because machines became more complex. Children, women, and men were subjected in the factories to conditions and disciplines not known to them before. The buildings were often of hasty or flimsy construction, assuring many accidents and much disease. Rules were severe, and violations of them were punished by fines that might forfeit the wages of a day. Employers argued that the proper care of the machinery, the necessity of coordinating different operations, and the lax habits of a population not accustomed to regularity or speed, required a rigorous discipline if confusion and waste were not to cancel profits and to price the product out of the market at home or abroad. The discipline was endured because an unemployed artisan faced hunger and cold for himself and his family, and the employee knew that the unemployed were eager for his job. Hence it was to the advantage of the employer to have a pool of unemployment from which to take replacements for workers disabled, dissatisfied, or dismissed. Even the well-behaved and competent employee faced dismissal when overproduction saturated the available market beyond its buying power, or when peace put an end to the blessed willingness of armies to order more and more goods and to destroy them as rapidly as possible. Under the guild system, the workers were protected by guild or municipal ordinances, but in the new industrialism they had little protection by the law, or none at all. The propaganda of the physiocrats for leaving the economy free from regulation had made headway in England as in France. The employers convinced Parliament that they could not continue their operations or meet foreign competition unless wages were governed by the laws of supply and demand. In village mills, the justices of the peace retained some control over wages. In the factories, after 1757, they had none. The upper and middle classes saw no reason for interfering with the captains of industry. The swelling flood of exports was conquering new markets for British trade, and Englishmen who could pay were pleased with the abundance of manufactured goods. But the workers did not share in this prosperity. Despite the multiplication of goods by the machines they tended, they themselves remained as poor in 1800 as they had been a century before. They no longer owned the tools of their trade, they had little part in designing the product, they took no profit from the widening of the market they fed. They added to their poverty by continuing the high fertility that had paid living dividends on the farm. They found in drink and sex their chief consolation, and their women were still rated by the number of children they bore. Pauperism spread. The expenditure for poor relief rose from £600,000 in 1742 to £2 million in 1784. The growth of housing could not keep up with the immigration or multiplication of industrial workers. These had often to live in tumble-down dwellings that crowded one another in dismal and narrow streets. Some laborers lived in cellars whose dampness added to the causes of disease. By 1800 all the larger towns had developed slums in which living conditions were worse than anything known in the previous history of England. 
The workers tried to better their lot by riots, strikes, and organization. They attacked the inventions that threatened them with unemployment or drudgery. Parliament in 1769 made the destruction of machinery a capital crime. Nevertheless, in 1779, the workers in Lancashire factories formed themselves into a mob that grew from 500 to 8,000 men. They collected firearms and ammunition, melted their pewter dishes to make bullets, and swore to demolish every machine in England. At Bolton, they completely wrecked a factory and its equipment. At Alton, they took by storm the textile factory of Robert Peel, father of Sir Robert the minister, and smashed its costly equipment. They were on their way to attack the plant of Arkwright at Cromford when troops sent from Liverpool came up with them, whereupon they fled in a rout. Some of them were caught and were sentenced to be hanged. The justices of the peace explained that destroying machines in this country would only be the means of transferring them to other countries, to the detriment of the trade of Britain. An anonymous friends of the poor bade the workers be more patient. All improvements by machines do at first produce some difficulties to some particular persons. Was not the first effect of the printing press to deprive many copyists of their occupation? The law forbade the formation of labor unions for collective bargaining. However, journeymen's associations existed, some dating from the 17th century. In the 18th, they were numerous, especially among textile workers. They were primarily social clubs or mutual benefit societies, but as the century advanced, they became more aggressive. And sometimes, when Parliament rejected their petitions, they organized strikes. In 1767 to 68, for example, there were strikes of sailors, weavers, hatters, tailors, glass grinders, and several of these walkouts were accompanied by armed violence on both sides. Adam Smith summarized the results to 1776. It is not difficult to foresee which of the two parties must, upon all ordinary occasions, have the advantage in the dispute, and force the other into compliance with their terms. The masters, being fewer in number, can combine much more easily, and the law does not prohibit their combinations, while it prohibits those of the workmen. We have no acts of Parliament against combining to lower the price wages, of work, but many against combining to raise it. In all such disputes the masters can hold out much longer. Many workmen could not subsist a week, few could subsist a month, and scarce any a year without employment. The employers had their way, both in the factories and in Parliament. In 1799 the Commons declared illegal any associations aiming to secure higher wages, to alter the hours of work, or to decrease the quantity of work required of the workers. Employees entering into such combinations were punishable by imprisonment, and informers against such men were to be indemnified. The triumph of the employers was complete. 4. Consequences The results of the Industrial Revolution were almost everything that followed in England, barring literature and art. They could not be adequately described without writing a history of the last two centuries. We must note merely the peaks of the continuing and unfinished process of change. 1. The transformation of industry itself by the proliferation of inventions and machines, a process so manifold that our present ways of producing and distributing goods differ more from those of 1800 than these did from the methods prevalent 2,000 years before. 2. The passage of the economy from regulated guilds and home industry to a regime of capital investment and free enterprise. Adam Smith was the British voice of the new system. Pitt II gave it governmental sanction in 1796. 3. The industrialization of agriculture. The replacement of small farms by large tracts of land capitalistically managed, using machinery, chemistry, and mechanical power on a large scale to grow food and fibers or a national or an international market, goes on today. The family-tilled farm joins the guild among the casualties of the Industrial Revolution. 4. The stimulation, application, and diffusion of science. The primary encouragement was to practical research, but studies in pure science led to immense practical results. So abstract research, too, was financed, and science became the distinctive feature of modern as religion had been of medieval life. 5. 
The Industrial Revolution, and not Napoleon, as Pitt II expected, remade the map of the world by assuring for a hundred and fifty years the British control of the seas and the most profitable colonies. It furthered imperialism by leading England, and later other industrial states, to conquer foreign areas which could provide raw materials, markets, or facilities for commerce or war. It compelled agricultural nations to industrialize and militarize themselves in order to obtain or maintain their freedom, and it created economic, political, or military interrelations that made independence imaginary and interdependence real. 6. It changed England in character and culture by multiplying its population, industrializing half of it, shifting it northward and westward to towns near deposits of coal or iron, or near waterways or the sea. So grew Leeds, Sheffield, Newcastle, Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Bristol. The Industrial Revolution transformed large expanses of England and of other industrialized countries into blotches of land fuming with factories, choking with gases and dust, and it deposited its human slag into reeking and hopeless slums. 7. It mechanized, extended, and depersonalized war and vastly improved man's ability to destroy or kill. 8. It compelled better and faster communication and transportation, thereby it made possible greater industrial combinations and the government of larger areas from one capital. 9. It generated democracy by raising the business class to predominant wealth and, in gradual consequence, to political supremacy. To effect and protect this epical shift of power, the new class enlisted the support of an increasing segment of the masses, confident that these could be kept in line by control of the means of information and indoctrination. Despite this control, the people of industrial states became the best informed publics in modern history. 10. Since the developing industrial revolution required ever more education in workers and managers, the new class financed schools, libraries, and universities on a scale hardly dreamed of before. The aim was to train technical intelligence. The byproduct was an unprecedented extension of secular intelligence. 11. The new economy spread goods and the new economy spread goods and comforts among a far greater proportion of the population than any previous system, for it could sustain its ever-rising productivity only by ever-widening purchasing power in the people. 12. It sharpened the urban mind but dulled the aesthetic sense. Many cities became depressingly ugly, and at last art itself renounced the pursuit of beauty. The dethronement of the aristocracy removed a repository and court of standards and tastes and lowered the level of literature and art. 13. The Industrial Revolution raised the importance and status of economics and led to the economic interpretation of history. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. When Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 Continued Cassette 1, Side 2 13. The Industrial Revolution raised the importance and status of economics and led to the economic interpretation of history. It habituated men to think in terms of physical cause and effect and led to mechanistic theories in biology, the attempt to explain all the processes of life as mechanical operations. 14. These developments in science and similar tendencies in philosophy combined with urban conditions and expanding wealth to weaken religious belief. 15. The Industrial Revolution transformed morality. It did not change the nature of man, but it gave new powers and opportunities to old instincts primitively useful socially troublesome. It emphasized the profit motive to a point where it seemed to encourage and intensify the natural selfishness of man. The unsocial instincts had been checked by parental authority, by moral instruction in the schools, and by religious indoctrination. The Industrial Revolution weakened all these checks. In the agricultural regime, the family was the unit of economic production as well as of racial continuance and social order. It worked together on the land under the discipline of the parents and the seasons. It taught cooperation and molded character. Industrialism made the individual and the company the units of production. The parents and the family lost the economic basis of their authority and moral function. 
As child labor became unprofitable in the cities, children ceased to be economic assets. Birth control spread, most among the more intelligent, least among the less, with unexpected results to ethnic relations and theocratic power. As family limitation and mechanical devices freed woman from maternal cares and domestic chores, she was drawn into factories and offices. Emancipation was industrialization. As the sons took longer to reach economic self-support, the lengthened interval between biological and economic maturity made premarital continence more difficult and broke down the moral code that early economic maturity, early marriage, and religious sanctions had made possible on the farm. Industrial societies found themselves drifting in an amoral interregnum between a moral code that was dying and a new one still unformed. The Industrial Revolution is still proceeding, and it is beyond the capacity of one mind to comprehend it in all its facets, or to pass moral judgment upon its results. It has begotten new quantities and varieties of crime, and it has inspired scientists with all the heroic dedication of missionaries and nuns. It has produced ugly buildings, dismal streets, and squalid slums, but these were not derived from its essence, which is to replace human labor with mechanical power. It is already attacking its own evils, for it has found that slums cost more than education, and that the reduction of poverty enriches the rich. Functional architecture and mechanical excellence, as in a bridge, can produce a beauty that mates science with art. Beauty becomes profitable, and industrial design takes its place among the arts and embellishments of life. Chapter 28 The Political Drama 1756 to 1792. 1. The Political Structure. The Industrial Revolution was the most basic process, the political struggle was the most exciting drama of the second half of the eighteenth century in England. Now the giants of English oratory, Chatham, Burke, Fox, and Sheridan, made the House of Commons the stage of bitter and momentous conflicts between Parliament and the King, between Parliament and the people, between England and America, between the conscience of England and the English rulers of India, and between England and the French Revolution. The political structure was the frame and machinery of the play. The government of Great Britain was a constitutional monarchy, in the sense that the king implicitly agreed to rule according to existing laws and traditional usages, and to make no new laws without the consent of Parliament. The Constitution was an accumulation of precedents, not a document, with two exceptions. One was the Magna Carta, signed by King John in 1215. The other arose when the Westminster Convention in 1689, offering the crown of England to William of Orange and Mary his wife, accompanied the offer with an act declaring the rights and liberties of the subject and settling the succession of the crown. This Bill of Rights, as brevity called it, asserted that the power of suspending of laws or the execution of laws by regal authority without consent of Parliament is illegal, that levying money for or to the use of the Crown by pretense of prerogative without grant of Parliament is illegal. And it added, having therefore an entire confidence that the Prince of Orange will preserve them, the Parliament, from the violation of their rights which they have here asserted, and from all other attempts upon their religion, rights, and liberties, the Lords Spiritual and Temporal and Commons do resolve that William and Mary, Prince and Princess of Orange, be and be declared King and Queen of England, France, and Ireland. In accepting the throne, William the Third and Mary the Second implicitly accepted the limitations which the proud and powerful aristocracy of England, by this declaration, placed upon the authority of the King. When, by a later act of settlement in 1701, and on certain conditions, Parliament offered the throne to the Hanoverian Princess Sophia and the heirs of her body being Protestants, it assumed that she and those heirs, by accepting the crown, agreed to a Bill of Rights that took from them all power to make laws except by consent of Parliament. While nearly all other European states were, till 1789, ruled by absolute monarchs who made and unmade laws, England had a constitutional government that was praised by philosophers and envied by half the world. The census of 1801 estimated the population of Great Britain at nine million souls, divided into the following classes. 1. At the top, 287 temporal, 
or secular, peers and peeresses as heads of families totaling some 7,175 persons. Within this class there were ranks in descending order, princes of the royal blood, dukes, marquises, earls, viscounts, and barons. These titles carried down generation after generation to the eldest son. Two, twenty-six bishops, the spiritual lords. These, with the two hundred eighty-seven temporal lords, were entitled to sit in the house of lords. Together these three hundred thirteen families constituted the nobility proper. To all of them except dukes and princes, the appellation lord could be properly applied. A less formal and non-transmissible nobility could be acquired by appointment to the higher offices in the administration, the army, or the navy. But usually these appointments went to persons already ennobled. 3. Some 540 baronets and their wives, entitled to prefix Sir and Lady to their Christian names, and to transmit these titles. 4. Some 350 knights and their wives, entitled to the same prefixes, but not to transmit them. 5. Some 6,000 squires or esquires, the gentry, or most numerous class of landowners. The baronets, knights, and squires, and their wives constituted the lesser nobility, and were generally included with their superiors in the aristocracy. 6. Some 20,000 gentlemen or ladies living on income without manual work, having a coat of arms, and assumed to be of gentle birth, that is, born in the gents, or group of old and accepted families. 7. Below all these came the remainder of the population— the lower clergy, civil servants, businessmen, farmers, shopkeepers, artisans, laborers, soldiers, and sailors. Also some 1,040,000 paupers receiving public relief, and about 222,000 vagrants, gypsies, rogues, thieves, swindlers, counterfeiters of base money, in or out of prison, and common prostitutes. The aristocracy, with only occasional resistance, dominated the government by its wealth. The 287 peers received 29% of the national income in 1801, by its prominence in high civil or military posts, by the prestige of ancient rank, and by its control of parliamentary elections and legislation. Electorally, England was divided into 40 counties, or rural districts, and 203 boroughs, or townships. Excluded from the franchise were women, paupers, convicted criminals, Roman Catholics, Quakers, Jews, agnostics, and others who could not swear allegiance to the authority and doctrines of the Church of England. In the counties only those Protestant landowners who paid forty shillings annual tax were entitled to vote for Parliament. These totaled about a hundred and sixty thousand. As voting was public, very few voters dared support any candidate other than the one nominated by the principal landlords of the county. Hence, relatively few voters bothered to vote, and many elections were decided by arrangement among the leaders without any balloting at all. The major landowners thought it only just that, having so much at stake in the conduct of the government and the fate of the nation, their representation in Parliament should be proportionate to their property, and most of the lesser landlords agreed. The boroughs displayed a confusing variety of electoral patterns. In the city of Westminster, now central London, there were about 9,000 voters. In the city of London, as then constituted, there were 6,000. In Bristol, 5,000. Only 22 boroughs had more than 1,000. In 12 boroughs, all adult males could vote. In most of the others, only property holders. In several, the candidates were chosen by the municipal corporation which has been defined as an urban oligarchy of attorneys, merchants, brokers, and brewers, entrenched in a self-electing corporation which had by royal charter exclusive control over the town's property. Some of these corporations gave their vote to the candidate or candidates whose sponsor or sponsors paid the highest price. In 1761, the borough of Sudbury openly advertised its vote for sale and in the following election the Corporation of Oxford formally offered to re-elect its MPs if they would pay the corporation's debts. In some boroughs, the privilege of choosing the candidate belonged by custom to specific individuals or families not necessarily residing there. So Lord Camelford boasted that if he wished he could elect his Negro butler to Parliament. 
Such pocket burrows were sometimes sold like merchandise. Lord Egremont bought Midhurst for forty thousand pounds. In some rotten burrows, a handful of voters could send one or more representatives to Parliament, while the City of London returned only four. Even when the franchise was almost universal, the election was usually determined by bribery, by violence, or by keeping a refractory voter too intoxicated to vote. By various means, 111 patrons controlled the elections in 205 boroughs. There were some 85,000 voters in the boroughs, 160,000 in the counties, 245,000 in all. From such varied elections came the 558 members of the House of Commons in 1761. Scotland sent 45, the counties of England and Wales 94, the boroughs 415, the two universities two each. The House of Lords then contained 224 peers, temporal or spiritual. Parliamentary privilege included the right of Parliament to pass on bills proposed for legislation, to levy taxes and thereby hold the power of the purse, to judge the credentials of persons claiming admission to it, to penalize, with imprisonment if it so wished, any injury to its members or any disobedience to its rules, and to enjoy full freedom of speech, including immunity from punishment for words uttered in Parliament. The division of members into Tories or Whigs had by 1761 lost nearly all significance. The real division was between supporters and opponents of the current government or ministry or of the king. By and large, the Tories protected the landed interest. The Whigs were willing now and then to consider the desires of the business class. Otherwise, both Tories and Whigs were equally conservative. Neither party legislated for the benefit of the masses. No bill could become law unless approved by both Houses of Parliament and signed by the King. He possessed the royal prerogative, that is, powers, privileges, and immunities accorded him by English custom and law. He had military powers. He was supreme commander of the army and navy. He could declare war, but needed parliamentary appropriations to wage it. He could negotiate treaties and make peace. He had some legislative rights. He could withhold assent from a bill passed by Parliament but it could bring him to terms by its power of the purse, and so he never exercised that right after 1714. He could add to the laws by proclamation or by orders in council, but he could not alter the common law or create a new offense. For the colonies he could legislate as he pleased. He had executive powers. He alone could summon, prorogue, or dissolve Parliament. He appointed the ministers who directed policy and administration. Part of the Fuhrer in the first decades, from 1760 to 1782, of George III's sixty-year reign concerned the extent of the royal prerogative in choosing ministers and determining policy. The right of the king to legislate was narrowly limited, and the measures proposed to Parliament by his ministers could be made into law only by persuading both houses of Parliament to accept them. This was done by political bargains, by the promise or withholding of posts or pensions, or by bribery. In 1770, over 190 members of the House of Commons held appointed places in the administration. The pounds and plums required for these operations were mostly supplied by the king's civil list, an account of his expenses for himself and his family, the privy purse, for his houses and servants, for salaries paid by him, and for pensions awarded. Parliament allowed George III £800,000 annually for this civil list. He often exceeded this in his outlays. In 1769, Parliament added £513,511, and in 1777, £618,340 to pay the royal debts. Part of the King's money was used to buy votes in parliamentary elections. Part was used to buy votes in Parliament itself. Funds voted by Parliament for secret service were in many cases remitted to Parliament in bribes. When we add to this royal traffic the money spent in elections or legislation by nabobs returning to England with wealth gleaned in India, or by businessmen seeking governmental contracts or escape from governmental interference, we get a picture of political corruption hardly rivaled west of the Oder and unpleasantly instructive on the nature of man. Some minor details of the British system should be noted. Taxes were levied upon all landowners, great or small. Perhaps this entered into the respect that the commonalty paid to the peerage. No standing army, only a militia, was allowed by Parliament. 
This was a minor factor in England's superior prosperity at a time when France was supporting a permanent army of 180,000 men, Prussia 190,000, Russia 224,000. In wartime, however, the armed forces were rigorously recruited by enlistment and impressment. The violations of personal liberty by this custom and the brutalizing cruelties of army and navy life were dark shadows on the English scene. Blackston felt, about 1765, that the political structure of England was the best the nature and education of men permitted at that time. He quoted the classical opinion that the best form of government would be one that combined monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, and he found all these well and happily united in the British Constitution. For as with us the executive power of the laws is lodged in a single person, they have all the advantages of strength and dispatch that are to be found in the most absolute monarchy, and as the legislature of the kingdom is entrusted to three distinct powers entirely independent of each other, first the king, secondly the lords spiritual and temporal, which is an aristocratical assembly of persons selected for their piety, their birth, their wisdom, their valor, or their property, and thirdly the house of commons, freely chosen by the people among themselves, which makes it a kind of democracy, as this aggregate body, activated by different springs and attentive to different interests, has the supreme disposal of everything, there can no inconvenience be attempted by either of the three branches, but will be withstood by the other two, each branch being armed with a negative power sufficient to repel any innovation which it shall think inexpedient or dangerous. Here, then, is lodged the sovereignty of the British Constitution, and lodged as beneficially as is possible for society." We may smile at the patriotic conservatism of an eminent jurist viewing the matter from a comfortable eminence, but very probably his judgment would have been ratified by ninety percent of the English people under George the Third. 2. The Protagonists The persons of the drama were among the most famous in English history. At the top was George the Third, who held the throne for the fateful years, 1760 to 1820, that saw England through the American and French revolutions and the Napoleonic Wars. He was the first of the Hanoverian monarchs to be born in England, to think of himself as an Englishman, and to take an absorbing interest in English affairs. He was the grandson of George the Second and son of the unruly Frederick Louis, Prince of Wales, who had died in 1751. The future George the Third was then twelve years old. His mother, Princess Augusta of Saxe-Gotha, frightened by the ill-educated and vicious young people of quality whom she met, kept him in quarantine from such company, and brought him up, one of nine children, in an aseptic isolation from the gains, joys, turmoil, and thought of his peers and his time. He grew up timid, lethargic, pious, poorly educated, and unhappy. "'If I ever have a son,' he told his censorious mother, I will not make him so unhappy as you make me. She transmitted to him her scorn of his grandfather for having tolerated the supremacy of Parliament. Repeatedly she bade him, George, be a king. Recapture active leadership of the government. A tradition often questioned credits the youth with being influenced by Bolingbroke's idea of a patriot king from 1749, which exhorted rulers to govern as well as to reign and, while letting Parliament retain the powers it possessed, to initiate measures for improving English life. One of George's teachers, Lord Waldgrave, described him in 1758 as strictly honest, but wants that frank and open behavior which makes honesty amiable. He does not want resolution, but it is mixed with too much obstinacy. He has a kind of unhappiness in his temper, which will be a source of frequent anxiety. These qualities remained with him to the end of his sanity. After the death of George's father, the widow formed a close friendship with John Stuart, Earl of Bute, groom of the stole in the princely household. Bute was thirty-eight in 1751, and was already fifteen years married to Mary Wortley Montague, daughter of the famous Lady Mary of that name. In the last years before George became king, he accepted Bute as his chief preceptor and confidant. He admired the Scots' learning and integrity, gratefully received his advice, and was encouraged by him to prepare for aggressive leadership in government. 
When the royal youth thought of proposing marriage to the fifteen-year-old beauty Lady Sarah Lennox, he yielded sadly but affectionately to Bute's admonition that he must marry some foreign princess who would help to cement a useful political alliance. "'I surrender my future into your hands,' he wrote, "'and will keep my thoughts even from the dear object of my love, "'grieve in silence, and never trouble you more with this unhappy tale. "'For if I must either lose my friend or my love, I will give up the latter, "'for I esteem your friendship above every earthly joy.'" George took Bute with him when he ascended the throne. His reign was one of the most calamitous in English history, and he shared in the blame. Yet he himself was emphatically a Christian and usually a gentleman. He accepted the theology of the Anglican Church, observed its rites with unostentatious devotion, and rebuked a court preacher who praised him in a sermon. He imitated his political enemies in the use of bribery, and bettered their instruction but he was a paragon of virtue in his private life. In a generation noted for sexual license, he gave to England an example of husbandly fidelity that quietly contrasted with the adulteries of his predecessors and the irregularities of his brothers and sons. He was the soul of kindness in everything but religion and politics. Though lavish in gifts, he was a man of simple habits and tastes. He forbade gambling at his court, he toiled resolutely at government, attending to minute details and sending messages of instruction to his aides and ministers a dozen times a day. He was no somber Puritan. He liked the theater, music, and the dance. He was not wanting in courage. He fought his political foes tenaciously for half a century. He faced a violent mob bravely in 1780 and kept his composure in two attempts upon his life. He frankly recognized the defects of his education. To the end, he remained relatively innocent of literature, science, and philosophy. If he was a bit weak in the mind, it may have been due to some quirk in the genes or some negligence in his teachers, as well as to the thousand strains that hedge a king. One of George's faults was his suspicious jealousy of ability and independence. He could never forgive William Pitt I for conscious preeminence in political vision and understanding, penetration of judgment, force, and eloquence of speech. We have seen elsewhere the career of this extraordinary man from his entry into Parliament in 1735 to his triumph in the Seven Years' War. He could be arrogant and obstinate, far more so than George III. He felt himself to be the proper custodian of the empire that had been created under his leadership, and when the king in name met the king in deed, there followed a duel for the throne." Pitt was personally honest, untouched by the bribery that flourished around him, but he thought of politics purely in terms of national power, and allowed no sentiment of humanity to divert his resolve to make England supreme. He was called the Great Commoner because he was the greatest man in the House of Commons, not because he thought of improving the lot of the commonalty. However, he rose to defend Americans and the people of India against oppression by Englishmen. Like the king, he resented criticism— and was unapt to forget or to forgive. He would not serve the king unless he could rule him. He resigned from the ministry in 1761 when George III insisted on violating England's compact with Frederick and making a separate peace with France. If in the end he was defeated, it was by no other foe than gout. Pitt's influence on English politics was matched by Edmund Burke's influence on English thought. Pitt disappeared from the scene in 1778. Burke appeared on it in 1761 and held the attention of educated England intermittently till 1794. The fact that he was born in Dublin in 1729, the son of an attorney, may have handicapped him in his struggle for political office and power. He was not an Englishman except by adoption, and not a member of any aristocracy except that of the mind. The fact that his mother and sister were Catholics must have entered into his lifelong sympathy for the Catholics of Ireland and England, and his persistent emphasis upon religion as an indispensable bulwark of morality in the state. He received his formal education at a Quaker school in Ballator and at Trinity College, Dublin. He learned enough Latin to admire Cicero's orations and to make them the foundation of his own forensic style. In 1750, he passed to England to study law at the Middle Temple. Later, he praised law as 
a science which does more to quicken and invigorate the understanding than all the other kinds of learning put together. But he thought it not apt, except in persons very happily born, to open and to liberalize the mind exactly in the same proportion. About 1775 his father withdrew Edmund's allowance on the ground that he was neglecting his legal studies for other pursuits. Apparently Edmund had developed a taste for literature, and was frequenting the theatres and the debating clubs of London. A legend arose that he fell in love with the famous actress Peg Woffington. He wrote to a friend in 1757, I have broken all rules, I have neglected all decorum. And he described his manner of life as checkered with various designs, sometimes in London, sometimes in remote parts of the country, sometimes in France, and shortly, please God, to be in America. Otherwise, we know nothing about Burke in those experimental years, except that in 1756, in uncertain sequence, he published two remarkable books and married. One book was entitled, A Vindication of Natural Society, or a View of the Miseries and Evils Arising to Mankind from Every Species of Artificial Society, A Letter to Lord Blank, by a late noble writer. The essay, some forty-five pages long, is on its face a vigorous condemnation of all government, far more anarchistic than Rousseau's Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, which had appeared only a year before. Burke defined natural society as society founded in natural appetites and instincts, and not in any positive institution. The development of laws was a degeneration. History is a record of butchery, treachery, and war. And political society is justly charged with much the greater of this destruction. All governments follow the Machiavellian principles, reject all moral restraints, and give the citizens a demoralizing example of greed, deceit, robbery, and homicide. Democracy in Athens and Rome brought no cure for the evils of government, for it soon became dictatorship through the ability of the demagogues to win admiration from gullible majorities. Law is injustice codified. It protects the idle rich against the exploited poor, and adds a new evil, lawyers. Political society has made the many the property of the few. Look at the condition of the miners of England, and consider whether such misery could have existed in a natural society, that is, before the making of laws. Should we nevertheless accept the state, like the religion that upholds it, as being made necessary by the nature of man? Not at all. If we are resolved to submit our reason and our liberty to civil usurpation, we have nothing to do but to conform as quietly as we can to the vulgar, or popular, notions which are connected with this, and take up the theology of the vulgar as well as their politics. But if we think this necessity rather imaginary than real, we shall renounce their dreams of society, together with their visions of religion, and vindicate ourselves into perfect liberty. This has the bold ring and angry sincerity of a young radical, a youth religious in spirit but rejecting the established theology, and sensitive to the poverty and degradation that he had seen in England, a talent conscious of itself but as yet without place and standing in the stream of the world. Every alert youngster passes through this stage on his way to position, possessions, and such frightened conservatism as we shall find in Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France. We note that the author of the Vindication covered his tracks with anonymity, even to playing dead. Nearly all readers, including William Warburton and the Earl of Chesterfield, understood the tract as a genuine attack upon current evils, and many ascribed it to Viscount Bolingbroke who, having died in 1751, was a late noble writer. Nine years after publishing the essay, Burke ran for election to Parliament. Fearing that his youthful ebullition would be held against him, he reprinted it in 1765 with a preface that said in part, The design of the following little piece was to show that the same literary engines which were employed for the destruction of religion might be employed with equal success for the subversion of government. Most biographers of Burke have accepted this explanation as sincere. We cannot join them, but we can understand the effort of a political candidate to protect himself against popular prejudice. Which of us would have a future if his past were known? Just as eloquent as the vindication, and much subtler, 
was Burke's other publication in 1756. A philosophical inquiry into the origin of the sublime and beautiful, to which in a second edition he added a discourse on taste. We must admire the courage of the twenty-seven-year-old youth who pursued these elusive subjects a full decade before Lessing's Laocoon. He may have taken a lead from the opening of Book Two of Lucretius's De Rerum Natura. Pleasant it is, when the winds are troubling the waters in a mighty sea, to witness from the land another's great toil, not because it is a delight to behold any one's tribulation, but because it is sweet to see from what evils you yourself are free. So Burke wrote, The passions which belong to self-preservation turn on pain and danger. They are simply painful when their causes immediately affect us. They are delightful when we have an idea of pain and danger without being actually in such circumstances. Whatever excites this delight, I call sublime. Secondarily, all works of great labor, expense, and magnificence are sublime, and all buildings of very great richness and splendor. For in contemplating them the mind applies the ideas of the greatness of exertion necessary to produce such works to the works themselves. Gloom, darkness, mystery help to arouse a sense of sublimity. Hence the care of medieval builders to let only dim and filtered light enter their cathedrals. Romantic fiction, as in Horace Walpole's Castle of Otranto, from 1764, or Anne Radcliffe's Mysteries of Udolpho, from 1794, profited from these ideas. Beauty, said Burke, is a name I shall apply to all such qualities in things as induce in us a sense of affection and tenderness, or some other passion the most nearly resembling these. He rejected the classical reduction of these qualities to harmony, unity, proportion, and symmetry. We all agree that the swan is beautiful, though its long neck and short tail are quite disproportionate to its body. Usually the beautiful is small, and thereby contrasts with the sublime. I do not now recollect anything beautiful that is not smooth. A broken or rugged surface, a sharp angle or sudden projection, will disturb us and limit our pleasure even in objects otherwise beautiful. An air of robustness and strength is very prejudicial to beauty. An appearance of delicacy and even of fragility, is almost essential to it. Color adds to beauty, especially if it is varied and bright, but not glaring or strong. Strange to say, Burke did not ask whether a woman is beautiful because she is small, smooth, delicate, and colorful, or whether these qualities seem beautiful because they remind us of woman who is beautiful because she is desired. In any case, June Nugent was desirable, and Burke married her in this fecund year, 1756. She was the daughter of an Irish physician. She was a Catholic, but she soon conformed to the Anglican worship. Her mild and gentle disposition soothed her husband's irascible temperament. The impression made by the style, if not the arguments of the vindication and the enquiry, opened doors to Burke. The Marquis of Rockingham engaged him as secretary, despite the Duke of Newcastle's warning that Burke was a wild Irishman, a Jacobite, a secret papist, and Jesuit. Late in 1765, Burke was elected to Parliament from the borough of Wendover, through the influence of Lord Barney, who owned it. In the House of Commons, the new member acquired the reputation of an eloquent yet not persuasive orator. His voice was harsh, his accent Tiburnian his gestures awkward, his jests occasionally coarse, his denunciations unduly passionate. Only in reading him did men perceive that he was creating literature as he spoke. By his command of the English language, his luminous descriptions, his range of knowledge and illustrations, his ability to bring philosophic perspective to the issues of the day. Perhaps these qualities were handicaps in the house. Some hearers, Goldsmith tells us, loved to see him wind into his subject like a serpent, but many others were impatient with his excessive detail, his digressions into theory, his ornate declamations, his massive periodic sentences, his flights into literary elegance. They wanted practical considerations and immediate relevance. They praised his diction, but ignored his advice. So, when Boswell said that Burke was like a hawk, Johnson countered, "'Yes, sir, but he catches nothing.' 
Almost to the end of his career he defended policies unpalatable to the people, the ministry, and the king. I know, he said, that the road I take is not the road to preferment. Apparently, during the years of his climb, he read much and judiciously. One contemporary described him as an encyclopedia, from whose stores everyone received instruction. Fox paid him an unmeasured compliment. If he, Fox, were to put all the political information which he had learned from books, all which he had gained from science, and all which any knowledge of the world and its affairs had taught him, into one scale, and the improvement which he had derived from his right honorable friend's instruction and conversation were placed in the other, he should be at a loss to decide to which to give the preference. Johnson, who usually administered praise in small doses, agreed with Fox. You could not stand five minutes with that man beneath a shed while it rained, but you must be convinced you had been standing with the greatest man you had ever yet seen. Burke joined the Johnson-Reynolds circle about 1758. He rarely entered into debate with the invincible debater, probably fearing his own temper as well as Johnson's. But when he did, the great cham drew in his horns. When Johnson was sick and someone mentioned Burke, the doctor cried out, That fellow calls forth all my powers. Were I to see Burke now, it would kill me. Yet the two men agreed on almost all basic questions of politics, morals, and religion. They accepted the aristocratic rule of Britain, though both were commoners. They scorned democracy as the enthronement of mediocrity. They defended orthodox Christianity and the established church as irreplaceable bastions of morality and order. Only the revolt of the American colonies divided them. Johnson called himself a Tory and denounced Whigs as criminals and fools. Burke called himself a Whig and gave a stronger, better-reasoned defense of Tory principles than any other man in English history. He seemed at times to uphold the most questionable elements of the existing order. He opposed changes in the rules for the election of members or the enactment of laws. He thought rotten or pocket boroughs forgivable since they sent good men like himself to Parliament. Instead of widening the suffrage, he would, by lessening the number, add to the weight and independency of our voters. Nevertheless, he espoused a hundred liberal causes. He advocated freedom of trade before Adam Smith, and attacked the slave trade before Wilberforce. He advised removing the political disabilities of Catholics, and supported the petition of the dissenters for full civil rights. He tried to soften the barbarous severity of the penal code and the handicaps of a soldier's life. He vindicated the freedom of the press, though he himself had felt its sting. He stood up for Ireland, America, India, in the face of chauvinistic majorities. He championed Parliament against the King with a candor and audacity that forfeited all chance of political office. We may debate his views and his motives, but we can never doubt his courage. The last crusade of Burke's career, against the French Revolution, cost him the friendship of a man whom he had long admired and loved. Charles James Fox returned his affection and shared with him the dangers of battle in a dozen causes, but differed from him in almost every quality of mind and character except humanity and bravery. Burke was Irish, poor, conservative, religious, moral. Fox was English, rich, radical, and kept only so much religion as comported with gambling, drinking, mistresses, and the French Revolution. He was the third but favorite son of Henry Fox, who inherited one fortune, squandered it, married another, accumulated a third as paymaster of the forces, helped Butte to buy MPs, was rewarded by being created Baron Holland, and was denounced as the public defaulter of unaccounted millions. His wife, Caroline Lennox, was granddaughter of Charles II by Louise de Kerouai, so that Charles James had in his veins the diluted blood of a rakish Stuart king and a French woman of complacent morals. His very names were Stuart memories, and must have grated on Hanoverian ears. Lady Holland tried to bring up her sons to integrity and responsibility, but Lord Holland indulged Charles in every humor and inverted old maxims for him. Never do today what you can put off till tomorrow, nor ever do yourself what you can get anyone else to do for you. When the boy was barely fourteen, his father took him from Eton College for a tour of continental casinos and spas, and allowed him five guineas per night for play. 
The youth returned to Eton a confirmed gambler and kept this up at Oxford. He found time to read much, both in classical and in English literature, but he left Oxford after two years to spend two years in travel. He learned French and Italian, lost sixteen thousand pounds in Naples, visited Voltaire at Pernay, and received from him a list of books to enlighten him on Christian theology. In 1768 the father bought a borough for him, and Charles took a seat in Parliament at the age of nineteen. This was quite illegal, but so many members were impressed by the youth's personal charm and presumptive wealth that no protest made itself heard. Two years later, through his father's influence, he was made a Lord of the Admiralty in the Ministry of Lord North. In 1774 the father, the mother, and an elder son died, and Charles became the master of a large fortune. His physical appearance in his mature years was as careless as his morals. His stockings were loosely tied, his coat and waistcoat were rumpled, his shirt was open at the neck, his face was puffed and ruddy with food and drink, and his swelling paunch, when he sat, threatened to tumble over his knees. When he fought a duel with William Adam, he rejected the advice of his second to assume the customary sideways stance, for, he said, I am as thick one way as the other. He took no pains to conceal his faults. It was common gossip that he proved to be an amiable victim of sharpers. Once, Gibbon tells us, he played for twenty-two hours at a sitting and lost in that time two hundred thousand pounds. Fox remarked that the greatest pleasure in life next to winning was losing. He kept a stable of racing horses, bet heavily on them, and we are asked to believe won more on them than he lost. Sometimes he was as careless of his political principles as of his morals and his dress. More than once he let his personal interests or animosity determine his course. He tended to indolence and did not prepare his parliamentary speeches or measures with that care and study which distinguished Burke. He had few graces as an orator and sought none. His addresses were often formless and repetitious, sometimes shocking the grammarians. He threw himself into the middle of his sentences, said the scholar Richard Porson, and left it to God Almighty to get him out again. But he was gifted with such quickness of mind and power of memory that he became, by general consent, the ablest debater in the house. Charles Fox, wrote Horace Walpole, has tumbled old Saturn, meaning Chatham, from the throne of oratory. Fox's contemporaries were lenient with his faults, since these were so widely shared, and they almost unanimously testified to his virtues. Through most of his life after 1744 he followed liberal causes at reckless sacrifice of preferment and popularity. Burke, who scorned vice, nevertheless loved Fox because he saw that Fox was unselfishly devoted to social justice and human liberty. "'He is a man made to be loved,' said Burke." of the most artless, open, candid, and benevolent disposition, disinterested in the extreme, of a temper mild and placable to a fault, without one drop of gall in his whole constitution. Gibbon agreed. Perhaps no human being was ever more perfectly exempt from the taint of malevolence, vanity, or falsehood. Only George the Third was immune to that spontaneous charm. Bound with Burke and Fox in leading the liberal factor of the Whigs was a second Irishman, Richard Brinsley Sheridan. This book is continued on Cassette 2, Side 1. Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 Continued Cassette 2, Side 1 Found with Burke and Fox in leading the liberal factor of the Whigs was a second Irishman, Richard Brinsley Sheridan. His grandfather, Thomas Sheridan I, published translations from Greek and Latin and an art of punning which may have infected the grandson. The father, Thomas Sheridan II, was by some ranked second only to Garrick as actor and theatrical manager. He married Francis Chamberlain, a successful playwright and novelist. He received degrees from Dublin, Oxford, and Cambridge, lectured at Cambridge on education, was instrumental in getting Johnson a royal pension, and got one for himself. 
He wrote an entertaining life of Swift and dared to publish a general dictionary of the English language in 1780, only twenty-five years after Johnson's. He helped his son manage Drury Lane Theatre and saw him rise in romance, literature, and parliament. So Richard had wit and drama in his milieu, if not in his blood. Born in Dublin in 1751, he was sent to Harrow at the age of eleven, stayed there six years, and acquired a good classical education. At twenty he echoed his grandfather by publishing translations from the Greek. In that year, 1771, while living at Bath with his parents, he fell into raptures over the lovely face and voice of Elizabeth Ann Linley, seventeen, who sang in the concerts presented by her father, composer Thomas Linley. Those who have seen any of Gainsborough's portraits of her will understand that Richard had no alternative but rapture. Neither had she, if we may believe his sister, who thought him irresistibly handsome and lovable. His cheeks had the glow of health, his eyes the finest in the world, a tender and affectionate heart, the same playful fancy, the same sterling and innoxious wit that was shown afterwards in his writings, cheered and delighted the family circle. I admired, I almost adored him. I would most willingly have sacrificed my life for him. Elizabeth Ann had many suitors, including Richard's elder brother, Charles. One of them, Major Matthews, rich but married, annoyed her to such aggravation that she took laudanum to kill herself. She recovered but lost all desire for life until Richard's devotion revived her spirits. Matthews threatened to force her. Half in fear, half in love, she eloped with Sheridan to France, married him in 1772, and then took refuge in a convent near Lille, while Richard returned to England to conciliate his father and hers. He fought two duels with Matthews. Victor in the first, he spared Matthews's life. Drunk in the second, he disarmed his adversary, allowed the duel to degenerate into a wrestling match, and returned to Bath smeared with blood, wine, and mud. His father disowned him, but Thomas Linley brought Elizabeth Ann back from France and sanctioned her marriage in 1773. Too proud to let his wife support him by public singing, Richard, twenty-two, undertook to make a fortune by writing plays. On January 17, 1775, his first comedy, The Rivals, was produced at Covent Garden. It was poorly acted and poorly received. Sheridan secured a better actor for the leading role, and a second performance on January 28th began a series of dramatic successes that brought Sheridan fame and wealth. Soon all London was talking about Sir Anthony Absolute, Sir Lucius O'Trigger, and Miss Lydia Languish, and was imitating Mrs. Malaprop's mangling of words. Forget this fellow. Illiterate him quite from your memory as headstrong as an allegory on the banks of the Nile. Sheridan had a mint of sallies in his brain, scattering them on every page, dowering lackeys with wit, and making fools talk like philosophers. Critics complained that the characters were not always consistent with their speech, and that the wit, crackling in every scene, bubbling in almost every mouth, dulled its point by excess. No matter, audiences relished the merriment, and relish it to this day. Even greater was the success of the Duenna, which had its premiere at Covent Garden on November 2nd, 1775. It ran for seventy-five nights in its first season, breaking the record of sixty-three nights set by the Beggar's Opera in 1728. David Garrick at the Drury Lane Theatre was alarmed by this lively competition, but could find no better repose than to revive The Discovery, a play by Sheridan's lately deceased mother. Flushed with success, Sheridan offered to buy Garrick's half-share of the Drury Lane. Garrick, feeling his years, agreed for thirty-five thousand pounds. Sheridan persuaded his father-in-law and a friend to contribute ten thousand pounds each. He himself invested one thousand three hundred pounds in cash. The remainder he raised on a loan in 1776. Two years later he gathered together another thirty-five thousand pounds, took ownership of the theatre with his partners, and assumed the management. Many thought that his confidence had overreached itself, but Sheridan went on to another triumph by producing, on May 8, 1777, The School for Scandal, the greatest dramatic success of the century. The author's father, who had been pouting ever since Richard's elopement five years before, was now reconciled with his son. After these victories there was a pause in Sheridan's ascent. 
The offerings at the Drury Lane proved unpopular, and the specter of bankruptcy frightened the partners. Sheridan saved the situation with a farce, The Critic, a satire of tragic dramas and dramatic pundits. However, his wanted dilatoriness intervened, and two days before the scheduled opening he had not yet written the final scene. By some ruse his father-in-law and others lured him to a room in the theatre, gave him paper, pen, ink, and wine, bade him finish the play, and locked him in. He emerged with the desired denouement. It was rehearsed and found adequate. The premiere on October 29, 1779, was another smile of fortune for the ebullient Irishman. He looked around for new worlds to conquer and decided to enter Parliament. He paid the Burgesses of Stafford five guineas for their vote, and in 1780 he took his seat in the House of Commons as an ardent liberal. He shared with Fox and Burke in prosecuting Warren Hastings, and in one brilliant day outshone them both. Meanwhile, he lived with his accomplished wife in happiness and luxury, famed for his conversation, his wit, his exuberance, his kindness, and his debts. Lord Byron summed up the marvel. Whatsoever Sheridan has done or chooses to do has been par excellence, always the best of its kind. He has written the best comedy, the best drama, the best farce, the best address, a monologue on Garrick, and to crown all delivered the very best oration ever conceived or heard in this country. And he had won and kept the love of the loveliest woman in England. Sheridan was all romance. It is hard to picture him in the same world and generation as William Pitt II, who recognized only reality, stood above sentiment, and ruled without eloquence. He was born in 1759 at the height of his father's career. His mother was sister to George Grenville, chief minister from 1763 to 65. He was nursed on politics and grew up in the odor of Parliament. Frail and sickly in childhood, he was kept from the rigors and socializing contacts of public school. He was tutored at home under the careful supervision of his father, who taught him elocution by making him recite Shakespeare or Milton every day. By the age of ten, he was a classical scholar and had written a tragedy— at fourteen he was sent to Cambridge, soon fell ill, returned home. A year later he went again, and being a peer's son, he was graduated as Master of Arts in 1776 without examination. He studied law at Lincoln's Inn, practiced law briefly, and was projected into Parliament at the age of twenty-one from a pocket borough controlled by Sir James Lowther. His maiden speech so well supported Burke's proposal for economic reforms that Burke called him not a chip of the old block, but the old block itself. Being a second son, he was allowed only three hundred pounds a year, with occasional help from his mother and uncles. These conditions encouraged a stoic simplicity in his conduct and character. He avoided marriage, having pledged himself indivisibly to the pursuit of power. He took no pleasure in gambling or the theatre. Though he later used liquor in excess to dull his nerves after the tumult of politics— he earned a reputation for purity of life and incorruptibility of purpose. He could buy, but he could not be bought. He never sought wealth and seldom made concessions to friendship. Only an intimate few discovered, behind his cold aloofness and self-control, a friendly gaiety, even at times an affectionate tenderness. Early in 1782, when Lord North's ministry was about to resign, the boy, as some members condescendingly called Pitt, included in one of his speeches a rather unusual announcement. For myself, I could not expect to form part of a new administration, but were my doing so within my reach, I feel myself bound to declare that I never would accept a subordinate position. That is, he would accept no place lower than the six or seven seats that constituted what came to be called the Cabinet. When the new ministry offered to appoint him vice-treasurer of Ireland at five thousand pounds a year, he declined and continued to live on his three hundred. He was confident of advancement and hoped to win it on his own merits. He worked hard and became the best-informed man in the House on domestic politics, industry, and finance. A year after his proud pronouncement, the king turned to him not merely to join, but to head the government. No man before him had ever been chief minister at the age of twenty-four, and few ministers have left a deeper mark on English history. 3. The King versus Parliament George II completed his reign of thirty-three years with a decided distaste for English politics. 
I am sick to death of all this foolish stuff, and wish with all my heart that the devil may take all your bishops, and the devil take your ministers, and the devil take your parliament, and the devil take the whole island, provided I can get out of it and go to Hanover. He found peace on October 25th, 1760, and was buried in Westminster Abbey. The accession of George III on the day of his grandfather's death was welcomed enthusiastically by nearly all Englishmen except a few who still hankered after the Stuarts. He was twenty-two, handsome, industrious, and modest. He was the first English king since Henry VI to omit in his title a claim to the sovereignty over France. In his first address to Parliament, he added, to the text prepared for him by his ministers, words that neither of his Hanoverian predecessors could have spoken. Born and educated in this country, I glory in the name of Britain. The young king, wrote Horace Walpole, has all the appearance of being amiable. There is great grace to temper much dignity and extreme good nature, which breaks out on all occasions. He added to his popularity by the proclamation that he issued on October 31st for the encouragement of piety and virtue and for preventing and punishing of vice, profaneness, and immorality. In 1761 he married Princess Charlotte Sophia of mecklenburg strelitz Adjusting himself to her charmlessness, he begot fifteen children by her and found no time for adultery. This was unprecedented for a Hanoverian king. He did not like the Seven Years' War, then four years old, and felt that some adjustment could be made with France. William Pitt I, Secretary of State for the Southern Department and the dominant figure in the ministry of the Duke of Newcastle, insisted on continuing the war until France should be weakened beyond any likelihood of her challenging the empire that had been created by British victories in Canada and India. Moreover, he urged, no peace should be made except in concert with England's ally, Frederick the Great. In March 1761, the Earl of Butte was made Secretary of State for the Northern Department and proceeded with the plan for a separate peace. Pitt resisted in vain, and on October 5th he resigned. George mollified him with a pension of three thousand pounds for himself and his heir, and a peerage for his wife, who became Baroness of Chatham. Pitt, till 1766, refused a peerage for himself, since this would have excluded him from his favorite battlefield, the House of Commons. As he had spoken of pensions with scorn, he was severely criticized for accepting these emoluments, but they were less than he had earned, and others who had earned far less received far more. On May 26, 1762, the Duke of Newcastle gave up his post after forty-five years of prominence in politics. Three days later, Bute succeeded him as chief minister. Now the purpose of the young king took form and drive. He and Bute considered it part of the royal prerogative to determine the major lines of policy, especially in foreign affairs. Furthermore, he was eager to break the hold which a few rich families had taken on the government. In 1761, an old Whig, William Pulteney, Earl of Bath, in an anonymous pamphlet, urged the king not to be content with the shadow of royalty, but to use his legal prerogatives to check the illegal claims of factious oligarchy. The majority in the House of Commons held that the king should choose his ministers from the acknowledged leaders of the party or faction victorious in the elections. George insisted on his legal right to choose his ministers regardless of party, with no restrictions except his responsibility to the nation. The Whigs had engineered the accession of the Hanoverian elector to the throne of England. Some Tories had negotiated with the exiled Stuarts. Inevitably, the first two Georges had taken only Whigs into their government. Most of the Tories had retired to their estates. But in 1760 they accepted the new dynasty, and came in considerable number to offer their homage to the British-born king. George welcomed them, and saw no reason why he should not appoint able Tories as well as able Whigs to office. The Whigs protested that if the king were free to choose ministers and determine policy without responsibility to Parliament, the Bill of Rights of 1689 would be violated, the authority of the king would remount to the level claimed by Charles I, and the revolutions of 1642 and 1688 would be nullified. The party system had its faults, but, the leaders argued, it was indispensable to responsible government. It offered to each ministry an opposition that watched it, criticized it, and, when the electors so desired, 
could replace it with men equipped to alter the direction of policy without disturbing the stability of the state. So the lines formed for the first major conflict of powers in the new reign. Bute bore the brunt of the battle. Criticism mostly spared the king, but not his mother. Lampoons accused her of being Bute's mistress. This calumny roused the king to uncompromising wrath. Bute concluded a separate peace with France, and to force Frederick's acquiescence, he ended England's subsidies to Prussia. Frederick called him a scoundrel and fought on. The English people, though glad to have the war ended, denounced the peace as too lenient to defeated France. Pitt fulminated against it and predicted that France, with her navy left intact, would soon resume war on England, which she did in 1778. The House of Commons ratified the treaty 319 to 65. George's mother rejoiced that the royal will had prevailed. Now, she said, my son is really King of England. Hitherto the new sovereign had enjoyed a reputation for integrity, but when he saw that the Whigs were buying parliamentary votes and were engaging journalists to attack his policies, he resolved to better the instruction. He used his funds and his power of patronage to induce authors like Smollett to defend the aims and actions of the ministry. Perhaps Bute had such services in view when, in July 1762, he persuaded the king to give a pension to Samuel Johnson, and he was not disappointed. But no partisan of the minister could offset the clever diatribes of John Wilkes, the savage satires of Charles Churchill, or the anonymous vituperation of Junius. Libels on the court, exceeding in audacity and rancor any that had been published for many years, now appeared daily in both prose and verse. Parliament took the king's money and gave him votes, but it disliked his chief minister as a Scot who had not risen to power through long service to some party in the House. Feeling against Scotland ran high in an England that still remembered the Scottish invasion of 1745. Moreover, Bute had given political plums to his countrymen. He had made Robert Adam court architect and Alan Ramsay court painter, ignoring Reynolds. He had pensioned John Hume, the Scottish playwright, while refusing a professorship to Thomas Gray. The London populace expressed its feelings by hanging or burning a jackboot, as a pun for Bute, and by attacking the minister's carriage. He had to hide his face when he attended the theatre. Attacks on cider alienated the rural population and left Bute the most unpopular minister in English history. Unable to breast the torrent, broken in health and spirits, and realizing his unfitness for the agitation and intrigues of politics, Bute resigned on April 8, 1763, after less than a year as chief minister to the king. His successor, George Grenville, suffered three misfortunes. He was attacked in the press by the invincible John Wilkes from 1763 on. He put through Parliament in March 1765 the Stamp Act that began the alienation of the American colonies, and George III had his first bit of insanity. The failure and resignation of Bute had broken the king's nerves and resolution. His marriage had brought him no happiness, and Grenville was painfully independent, almost domineering. George soon recovered, but he no longer felt strong enough to resist the Whig oligarchy that controlled most of Parliament and the press. He compromised by inviting a Whig, the Marquess of Rockingham, to form a new ministry. Perhaps on suggestions from his secretary, Edmund Burke, the Marquess in a year put through Parliament several mollifying measures. The cider tax was abolished or modified, the stamp tax was repealed, a treaty with Russia furthered trade, the agitation over Wilkes was subdued, and apparently no bribery was used to advance this legislation. The king resented the repeal of the tax and the concessions to Wilkes. On July 12, 1766, he dismissed the Rockingham ministry, offered a peerage to Pitt, and asked him to take charge of the government. Pitt agreed. But the great commoner had lost his health almost his mind. Now he sacrificed what remained of his popularity by accepting ennoblement as Earl of Chatham, thereby abandoning his place in the house. He had some excuse. He felt too weak to bear the tensions and conflicts of the commons. In the lords he would have more leisure and less strain. 
He took a relatively quiet post as Lord of the Privy Seal, and allowed his friend, the Duke of Grafton, to fill the nominally preeminent post as First Lord of the Treasury. His colleagues, however, noted that he determined policy without consulting them, or over their opposition, and many were relieved when he went to Bath to seek some easing of his gout. He achieved this, but with drugs that disordered his mind. When he returned to London, he was in no condition to attend to politics. In October 1768 he resigned, and Grafton became chief minister. It was in this period of political anarchy, from 1766 to 68, that a group known as the King's Friends associated themselves to further the aims of the King. They guided George in his distribution of favors for political support, and used every means to elect candidates and advance ministers pledged to the royal views. When Grafton enmeshed himself in difficulties and blunders, they compounded his confusion until he resigned on January 27, 1770. On February 10th, they achieved their greatest victory when Frederick North, known to us as Lord North, though he fell heir to this title only in 1790, began his twelve years of service as First Lord of the Treasury. North was a weak but not a bad man. It was his sense of loyalty and pity that kept him in office and earned him so unpleasant a place in history. Born to fortune as son of the Earl of Guildford, he received all the advantages of education and association, entered the House of Commons at the age of twenty-two, and kept his seat there for nearly forty years. He made many friends by his modesty, kindliness, affability, and humor. When one speaker complained that North slept through the oration, North replied that it was unjust to complain of his taking a remedy which the honorable gentleman himself had supplied. When an irate member demanded his head, he answered that he would gladly surrender it, provided he did not have to accept the member's head in exchange. But he followed the conservative side too consistently to please anyone but the king. He supported the Stamp Act, the expulsion of Wilkes, and, until its last stages, the war with America. He defended the policies of George III even when he doubted their wisdom. He considered himself the agent of the king, not of the parliament, much less of the people, and he seems to have been sincere in his conviction that the sovereign had the legal right to choose ministers and direct policy. Through North and his tact in managing the House of Commons, and through the use of funds voted by Parliament, George III for a decade ruled England. Through his agents he bought seats and boats, sold pensions and posts, subsidized journalists, and tried to shackle the press. It is a measure of his courage and his obstinacy that it took a combination of John Wilkes, Junius, Burke, Fox, Sheridan, Franklin, and Washington to defeat him. 4. Parliament versus the People We read in Gibbon's journal, under September 23, 1762, Colonel Wilkes dined with us. I scarcely ever met with a better companion. He has inexhaustible spirits, infinite wit and humor, and a great deal of knowledge, but is a thorough profligate in principle as in practice. His character is infamous, his life strained with every vice, and his conversation full of blasphemy and bawdy. These morals he glories in, for shame is a weakness he has long since surmounted. He told us himself that in this time of public dissension he was resolved to make his fortune. This was the view of a conservative who voted with the government in all his eight years as a member of the House of Commons, and who could not readily sympathize with the confessed and colorful enemy of Parliament and the King. Wilkes, however, would have admitted most of the indictment. He had discarded the ethics as well as the theology of Christianity, and enjoyed flaunting his hedonism in the face of MPs who shared his morals but were alarmed by his candor. John Wilkes was the son of a malt distiller in Clerkenwell, North London. He received a good education at Oxford and Leiden, enough to surprise Johnson with his knowledge of the classics and his manners of a gentleman. At twenty he married a lady half as old again as myself, but of a large fortune. She was a dissenter given to a solemn piety. He took to drink and mistresses. About 1757 he joined Sir Francis Dashwood, Bub Doddington, George Selwyn, the poet Charles Churchill, and the fourth Earl of Sandwich in a hellfire club that met in the old Cistercian Abbey of Medmenham on the banks of the Thames near Marlow. There, as the mad monks of Medmenham, 
They caricatured Roman Catholic rites by celebrating a black mass to Satan and indulging their profane and preapian bent. Through the influence of his associates and by the expenditure of seven thousand pounds, Wilkes was elected MP for Aylesbury in 1757. He attached himself at first to the elder Pitt and after 1760 to the foes of Butte. As Butte was subsidizing Smollett's journal, The Briton, Wilkes, aided by Churchill, began in June 1762 a counterweekly, The North Briton, which gained a wide readership through the verve and wit of its style and the virulence of its attacks upon the ministry. In one number he denied at length, that is, he spread, the rumor that Butte had made a mistress of the king's mother. In number 45, April 23, 1763, he inveighed against Butte for violating England's agreement with Prussia by concluding a separate peace with France, and for pretending in a speech from the throne presented by the minister in the name of the king that this treaty had the sanction of Frederick the Great. This week has given the public the most abandoned instance of ministerial effrontery ever attempted on mankind. The minister's speech of last Tuesday is not to be paralleled in the annals of this country. I am in doubt whether the imposition is greater on the sovereign or on the nation. Every friend of his country must lament that a prince of so many great and amiable qualities can be brought to give the sanction of his sacred name to the most odious measures and to the most unjustifiable public declarations. I am sure all foreigners, especially the King of Prussia, will hold the minister in contempt and abhorrence. He had made our sovereign declare, My expectations have been fully answered by the happy effects which the several allies of my crown have derived from the definitive treaty. The powers at war with my good brother, the King of Prussia, have been induced to agree to such terms of accommodation as that great prince has approved. The infamous fallacy of this whole sentence is apparent to all mankind, for it is known that the King of Prussia was basely deserted by the Scottish Prime Minister of England. As to the entire approbation of Parliament, which is so vainly boasted of, the world knows how that was obtained. The large debt on the civil list shows pretty clearly the transactions of the winter. Though Wilkes had interpreted the King's speech as really Butte's, George III took the article as a personal affront, and ordered Lords Halifax and Egremont, then Secretaries of State, to arrest all persons involved in the publication of the North Britons No. 45. They issued a general warrant, that is, one not naming the persons to be apprehended, and on its vague terms forty-nine persons were imprisoned on April 30, 1763, including Wilkes, despite his claim of immunity as a member of Parliament. Williams, printer of the journal, was put in the pillory, but a crowd cheered him as a martyr and raised two hundred pounds for his relief. Wilkes applied to the Court of Common Pleas for a writ of habeas corpus, obtained it, argued his case, and won from Chief Justice Charles Pratt, a friend of Pitt, an order for his release on the ground that his arrest violated parliamentary privilege. Wilkes sued Halifax and others for illegal arrest and property injury and obtained five thousand pounds in damages. Pratt's condemnation of General Warrants ended an abuse almost as obnoxious to Britons as Lettre de Cachet to the French. Tempting fate, Wilkes collaborated with Thomas Potter, son of the Archbishop of Canterbury, in composing an essay on woman as a poetic parody of Pope's essay on man. It was a medley of obscenity and blasphemy equipped with learned notes in the same key, ascribed to Bishop William Warburton, who had added notes to Pope's poem. The little piece was printed by Wilkes's press in his own home. It was not published, but thirteen copies were struck off for a few friends. The King's ministers secured the proof sheets and persuaded the Earl of Sandwich to read them to the House of Lords. The Earl did, on November 15th, to the amusement of the peers who knew his reputation for profligacy. Walpole tells us that they could not keep their countenance, as Sandwich proceeded, but they agreed that the poem was a scandalous, obscene, and impious libel, and asked the king to prosecute Wilkes for blasphemy. When Sandwich told Wilkes that he would die either on the gallows or from venereal disease, Wilkes answered, "'That depends, my lord, on whether I embrace your principles or your mistress.'" On that same November 15th, Wilkes rose in the Commons to enter a complaint of breach of privilege in his arrest. He was voted down, and Parliament ordered the hangman to publicly burn number 45 of the North Britain. 
On the 17th, Samuel Martin, who had been abused in that issue, challenged Wilkes to a duel. They met in Hyde Park. Wilkes was seriously wounded and was bedded for a month. The people of London condemned Martin as a hired assassin. They rioted when the hangman tried to burn number 45. Wilkes and Liberty and number 45 became watchwords of a rising popular rebellion against both King and Parliament. After a frenzied Scot tried to kill him, Wilkes left for France on December 26th. On January 19, 1764, he was formally expelled from Parliament. On February 21st, he was judged guilty in the Court of King's Bench for reprinting number 45 and for printing the essay on woman. He was summoned to appear for sentencing. He did not come, and on November 1st he was declared an outlaw. For four years Wilkes wandered in France and Italy, fearing life imprisonment if he returned to England. In Rome he saw much of Winkelmann. In Naples he met Boswell, who found him interesting company. His lively and energetic sallies on moral questions gave to my spirits a not unpleasant agitation. On the way back to Paris, Wilkes visited Voltaire at Ferney and charmed the wittiest man in Europe with his wit. The return of the liberals to power under Rockingham and Grafton led Wilkes to hope for a pardon. He received private assurances that he would not be molested if he remained quiet. He returned to England in 1768 and announced his candidacy for Parliament from London. Losing that contest, he sought election from Middlesex and received a substantial plurality after a riotous campaign. That county, largely urbanized, it now includes northwest London, was known for its radical leanings and its hostility to the rising capitalism. On April 20th, Wilkes submitted to the court, expecting to have his sentence of outlawry annulled. It was, but he was condemned to a fine of a thousand pounds and imprisonment for twenty-two months. An angry crowd rescued him from the officers and bore him in triumph through the streets of London. Having escaped from his admirers, he gave himself up to jail in St. George's Fields. A mob assembled there on May 10th and proposed to free him again. Soldiers fired upon the rioters. Five were killed, fifteen wounded. On February 4th, 1769, the House of Commons again expelled him. Middlesex again elected him on February 16th. He was again expelled. Middlesex again elected him on April 13th, this time by a vote of 1,143 to 296 for Henry Luttrell. Parliament gave the seat to Luttrell on the ground that Wilkes, having been expelled from Parliament, was legally disqualified during the tenure of that Parliament. Luttrell was attacked as he left the House. He did not dare appear on the streets. Seventeen counties and many boroughs sent up addresses to the throne, complaining that the rights of freeholders to choose their representatives in the House of Commons had been flagrantly violated. The king, who had vigorously supported the expulsions, ignored the petitions, whereupon one member, Colonel Isaac Barre, said in Parliament that disregard of petitions might teach the people to think of assassination. John Horn took, a young parson who had surrendered his faith to the charm of Voltaire, unfrocked himself and declared, after the repeated disbarments of Wilkes, that he would dye his ministerial black coat red. Took led in organizing the Society of Supporters of the Bill of Rights in 1769, whose immediate purpose was to free Wilkes from jail, pay his debts, and restore him to Parliament. In public meetings it agitated for the dissolution of the current Parliament as irreclaimably corrupt and as unresponsive to the general will. It called for annual Parliaments elected by universal adult male suffrage and for the responsibility of ministries to Parliament in their policies and expenditures. Every candidate for Parliament should take oath never to accept any form of bribe, nor any post or pension or other emolument from the Crown, and every member must defend the views of his constituents even if contrary to his own. The grievances of Ireland should be redressed, and the American colonies should alone have the right to tax their people. In July 1769, William Beckford, as Lord Mayor of London, and the city's livery, or uniformed officials, presented to the king an address censuring the conduct of his ministers as subverting the constitution on which the House of Hanover had been given the throne of England. On March 14, 1770, they sent up to the king a remonstrance that used the language of revolution. Under the secret and malign influence which, through each successive administration, has defeated every good and suggested every bad intention, the majority of the House of Commons have deprived your people of their dearest rights. 
They have done a deed more ruinous in its consequences than the levying of ship money by Charles I or the pensioning power assumed by James II. It appealed to the king to restore constitutional government, remove those evil ministers forever from your councils, and dissolve the present parliament. The infuriated monarch, laying his hand on his sword, exclaimed, Sooner than yield to a dissolution, I will have recourse to this. London, rather than Paris, seemed near to revolution in 1770. Into this fiery vortex of politics, Junius dropped the most incendiary letters in the history of England. He kept his identity so secret, even from his publishers, that to this day no one knows who he was, though most guesses name Sir Philip Francis, whom we shall meet as the unrelenting foe of Warren Hastings. The author had already signed some letters Lucius, some Brutus. Now he took the middle name of that Lucius Junius Brutus, who, according to Livy, had deposed a king, circa 510 B.C., and founded the Roman Republic. The virile command of English in these letters indicates that Junius had the education, if not the manners, of a gentleman. He was probably a man of means, for he took no money for the letters, whose force and sting profitably enlarged the circulation of the public advertiser, in which they appeared from November 21, 1768, to January 21, 1772. In a dedication to the English nation, which he prefixed to the collected letters of Junius in 1772, the author proclaimed his purpose to assert the freedom of election and vindicate your exclusive right to choose your representatives. He took as his starting point the repeated disbarment of Wilkes and the arrest by a general warrant of everybody connected with the North Britons No. 45. The liberty of the press is the palladium of all the civil, political, and religious rights of an Englishman, and the right of juries is an essential part of our Constitution. From this standpoint, the author reviewed the foundations of the British government. The power of the king, lords, and commons is not an arbitrary power. They are the trustees, not the owners of the estate. The fee simple is in us. I am persuaded you will not leave it to the choice of seven hundred persons, notoriously corrupted by the crown, whether seven million of their equals shall be freemen or slaves." Junius proceeded to charge the administration of Grafton, 1768 to 70, with selling offices and corrupting Parliament by favors and bribes. Here the attack became direct and rose to such heat as to suggest a resolve to avenge some personal injury or affront. Come forward, thou virtuous minister, and tell the world by what interest Mr. Hine has been recommended to so extraordinary a mark of His Majesty's favor. What was the price of the patent he has bought? You are basely setting up the royal patronage to auction. Do you think it possible such enormities should escape without impeachment? It is indeed highly your interest to maintain the present House of Commons. Having sold the nation in gross, they will undoubtedly protect you in the detail, for while they patronize your crimes, they feel for their own. The attack continued long after Grafton had resigned, as in the letter of June 22, 1771. I cannot, with any decent appearance of propriety, call you the meanest and basest fellow in the kingdom. I protest, my lord, I do not think you so. You will have a dangerous rival in that kind of fame, as long as there is one man living who thinks you worthy of his confidence, and fit to be trusted with any share in his government. This seemed to name George the Third himself as the basest fellow in the kingdom. Already, in letter 35, Junius had proposed to attack the king with dignity and firmness, but not with respect. Sir, it is the misfortune of your life that you should never have been acquainted with the language of truth until you heard it in the complaints of your people. It is not, however, too late to correct the error of your education. Junius advised George to dismiss his Tory ministers and to allow Wilkes to hold the seat to which he had been elected. The prince, while he plumes himself upon the security of his title to the crown, should remember that, as it was acquired by one revolution, it may be lost by another. Henry Woodfall, who published this letter in the public advertiser, was arrested on a charge of seditious libel. The jury, reflecting the feelings of the middle class, refused to convict him, and he was released on payment of costs. Junius had now reached the apex of his temerity and power but the king stood his ground and strengthened his position by giving the chief ministry to the amiable and immovable Lord North. 
Junius continued his letters till 1772 and then left the field. We note that in 1772 Sir Philip Francis left the war office, of whose affairs Junius had shown intimate knowledge, and departed for India. The letters belong to the literary as well as the political history of England, for they are a living example of the style to which many British statesmen could rise or stoop when passion inflamed and anonymity protected them. Here is a sterling English alloyed with abuse, but the abuse itself is often a masterpiece of subtle thrust or piercing epigram. There is no mercy here, no generosity, no thought that the accuser's own party shared in sin and guilt with the accused. We sympathize with Sir William Draper, who, answering Junius's letter of January 21, 1769, wrote, The kingdom swarms with such numbers of felonious robbers of private character and virtue that no honest man is safe, especially as these cowardly base assassins stab in the dark, without having the courage to sign their real names to their malevolent, wicked productions. The passage of the British press to ever greater freedom and influence was marked by another conflict in these years. Toward 1768, some newspapers began to print reports of the major speeches delivered in Parliament. Most of these reports were partisan and inaccurate. Some were imaginary, some were scurrilous. In February 1771, Colonel George Onslow complained to the House of Commons that a journal had referred to him as the little scoundrel and that paltry, insignificant insect. On March 12th, the House ordered the arrest of the printers. They resisted, arrested their would-be captors, and brought them before two aldermen, one of whom was Wilkes, and the Lord Mayor, Brass Crosby. The latter voided the attempted apprehension of the printers on the ground that the charters of the city forbade the arrest of a Londoner, except on warrant issued by a city magistrate. The Lord Mayor was committed to the Tower by order of Parliament, but the populace rose in his support, attacked the carriages of MPs, threatened the ministers, hissed the King, and invaded the House of Commons. The Lord Mayor was released and was acclaimed by an immense crowd. Newspapers resumed their reports of parliamentary debates. Parliament ceased to prosecute the printers. In 1774, Luke Hansard, with the consent of Parliament, began to publish with promptness and accuracy the journals of the House of Commons, and he continued these till his death in 1828. This historic victory of the British press affected the character of parliamentary debates and contributed to make the second half of the 18th century the golden age of English eloquence. Orators became more cautious, perhaps more dramatic, when they felt that they were being heard throughout the British Isles. Some advance toward democracy was inevitable now that political information and intelligence were more widely spread. The business class, the intellectual community, and the rising radicals found in the press a voice that became increasingly bold and effective until it subdued monarchy itself. Electors could know now how well their representatives had defended them and their interests in the making and unmaking of laws. Corruption continued but diminished, for it could be more openly exposed. The press became a third force that could sometimes hold the balance between classes in the nation or parties in Parliament. Men who could buy or control newspapers became as powerful as ministers. The new freedom, like most liberties, was frequently abused. Sometimes it became the instrument of aims more selfish and partisan, of opposition coarser and more violent than any that had appeared in Parliament. Then it deserved the name that Chatham gave it, a chartered libertine. In its turn, it had to be chastened by a fourth voice, public opinion, of which, however, the press was partly the source— often the seducer, sometimes the voice. Armed with broader knowledge, untitled men and women began to speak out on the policies and methods of the government. They gathered in public meetings, and their debates occasionally rivaled those of Parliament in influence on history. Now money as well as birth could claim the right to rule, and occasionally, between the combatants, the people would be heard. Wilkes was released from jail on April 17, 1770. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 Continued Cassette 2, Side 2 Wilkes was released from jail on April 17, 1770. Many houses were illuminated as for a festival, 
and the Lord Mayor displayed before his mansion house a sign bearing the word Liberty in letters three feet high. Soon Wilkes was elected alderman, then Lord Mayor, and in 1774 he was again sent to Parliament by Middlesex. Now the Commons did not dare refuse him his seat, and he kept it through all elections till 1790. He led a small group of radicals in Parliament who urged parliamentary reform and the enfranchisement of the lower orders. Every free agent in this kingdom should, in my wish, be represented in Parliament. The mean and insignificant boroughs, so emphatically styled the rotten part of our Constitution, should be lopped off, and the rich, populous trading towns, Birmingham, Manchester, Sheffield, Leeds, and others, be permitted to send deputies to the great council of the nation. I wish, sir, an English Parliament to speak the free, unbiased sense of the body of the English people. Parliament waited fifty-six years to accept these reforms. Wilkes refused to stand for re-election in 1790 and retired into private life. He died in 1797, aged seventy, as poor as he was born, for he had been scrupulously honest in all his offices. 5. ENGLAND VERSUS AMERICA In 1750 the population of the English colonies in North America was approximately 1,750,000. The population of England and Wales was some 6,140,000. As the rate of growth in the colonies was much higher than in the mother country, it was only a matter of time when the offspring would rebel against the parent. Montesquieu had predicted this in 1730, even to specifying that the break would be caused by British restrictions on American trade. The Marquis d'Argenson, about 1747, foretold that the colonies would rise against England, form a republic, and become one of the great powers. Vergennes, soon after England had taken Canada from France in the Seven Years' War, told an English traveller, England will soon repent of having removed the only check that could keep her colonies in awe. They stand no longer in need of her protection. She will call upon them to contribute to the burdens they have helped to bring upon her, and they will answer by striking off all dependence. The British Crown claimed authority to veto laws passed by the colonial assemblies. It did not often use that power, but when the Assembly of South Carolina, sensible of the great social and political danger arising from the enormous multiplication of Negroes in the colony, passed a law imposing a heavy duty upon the importation of slaves, the law was rescinded by the Crown, for the slave trade was one of the most lucrative branches of English commerce. In economic matters, Parliament assumed the right to legislate for all the British Empire, and usually its acts favored the motherland at the expense of the colonies. Its aim was to make America a source of articles not readily produced in England and a market for British manufactured goods. It discouraged the growth of colonial industries that would compete with England's. It forbade the colonists to manufacture cloth, hats, leather wares, or iron products. So the Earl of Chatham, otherwise so friendly to the colonies, declared that he would not allow a single nail to be made in America without the permission of Parliament. The colonies were forbidden to set up steel furnaces or rolling mills. Many checks were put upon American merchants. They could ship goods only in British vessels. They could sell tobacco, cotton, silk, coffee, sugar, rice, and many other articles only to British dominions. They could import goods from the European continent only after these had first been landed in England, had paid a port duty, and had been transferred to British vessels. To protect the export of English woolens to American colonies, colonial merchants were prohibited from selling colonial woolens outside the colony that had produced them. A heavy tax was laid by Parliament in 1733 upon American imports of sugar or molasses from any but British sources. The colonists, especially in Massachusetts, evaded some of these regulations by smuggling and by secret selling of American products to foreign nations, even to the French during the Seven Years' War. Of 1,500,000 pounds of tea imported yearly into the American colonies, only some 10% conformed to the requirement of passing through English ports. 
Much of the whiskey produced by the 63 distilleries of Massachusetts in 1750 used sugar and molasses smuggled in from the French West Indies. In justification of the restrictions, the British pointed out that other European nations, to protect or reward their own people, laid similar restraints upon their colonies, that many American products enjoyed a virtual monopoly of the English market through their exemption from import dues, and that England deserved some economic return for the cost of the protection which her navy gave to colonial shipping and which her armies gave to the colonists against the French and the Indians in America. The expulsion of French power from Canada and of Spanish power from Florida had freed the English from dangers that had long troubled them. England felt warranted in asking America to help her pay off the enormous debt, a hundred and forty thousand pounds, which Great Britain had incurred in the Seven Years' War. The colonists replied that they had furnished twenty thousand troops for that war, and had themselves incurred a debt of two million five hundred thousand pounds. In any case, England decided to tax the colonies. In March 1765, Grenville proposed to Parliament that all colonial legal documents, all bills, diplomas, playing cards, bonds, deeds, mortgages, insurance policies, and newspapers be required to bear a stamp, for which a fee would have to be paid to the British government. Patrick Henry in Virginia, Samuel Adams in Massachusetts, advised rejection of the tax on the ground that by tradition, Magna Carta, the Great Rebellion against Charles I, the Bill of Rights, Englishmen could justly be taxed only with their consent or the consent of their authorized representatives. How, then, could English colonials be taxed by a Parliament in which they had no representation? Britons answered that difficulties of travel and communication made American representation in Parliament impracticable, and they pointed out that millions of adult Englishmen had for centuries loyally accepted taxation by Parliament, though they had had no vote in electing it. They felt what Americans should feel, that they were virtually represented in Parliament because its members considered themselves as representing the whole British Empire. The colonists were not convinced. Since Parliament had retained the power of taxing as the fulcrum of control over the king, so the colonies defended their exclusive right to tax themselves as the only alternative to financial oppression by men whom they had never seen and who had never touched American soil. Lawyers evaded the requirement to use stamped documents. Some newspapers carried a death's head where the stamp should have appeared. Americans began to boycott British goods. Merchants cancelled orders for British products, and some refused payment of their debts to England till the Stamp Act should be repealed. Colonial maidens pledged themselves to accept no suitors who would not denounce the Stamp Act. Popular resentment rose to the pitch of rioting in several cities. In New York, the governor, appointed by the king, was hanged in effigy. In Boston, the home of the lieutenant governor, Thomas Hutchinson, was burned down. The distributors of the stamps were forced, under threat of hanging, to resign their offices. Feeling the boycott, British merchants called for a repeal of the act. Petitions were sent to the government from London, Bristol, Liverpool, and other cities, stating that without repeal, many English manufacturers would be ruined. Already thousands of workers had been dismissed because of lack of orders from America. Perhaps it was in recognition of these appeals that Pitt, after a long illness, made a dramatic return to Parliament and declared on January 14, 1766, It is my opinion that this kingdom has no right to lay a tax upon the colonies. He ridiculed the idea that the colonies are virtually represented in the House. When George Grenville interrupted and implied that Pitt was encouraging sedition, Pitt answered defiantly, I rejoice that America has resisted. On March 18th, Lord Rockingham persuaded Parliament to repeal the Stamp Act. To appease the king's friends, he added to the repeal a declaratory act reaffirming the authority of the king with the consent of Parliament to make laws binding on the colonies and the authority of Parliament to tax the British colonies. The Americans accepted the repeal and ignored the declaratory act. Reconciliation now seemed possible. But in July the Rockingham Ministry fell, and in the Grafton Ministry that followed it the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Charles Townsend, 
renewed the attempt to make the colonies pay for the administrative and military forces needed to protect them against internal disorder or external attack. On May 13, 1767, he proposed to Parliament that new duties be laid upon glass, lead, paper, and tea imported into America. The revenue from these imposts was to be used by the king to pay the salaries of the governors and judges appointed by him for America. Any surplus would be directed to maintain the British troops there. Parliament approved. Townsend died a few months later. The Americans resisted the new duties as disguised taxation. They had kept the royal troops and governors under control by making them largely dependent for their sustenance upon funds voted by the colonial assemblies. To surrender this power of the purse to the king would be to yield the direction of the American government to royal authority. The assemblies united in urging a renewed boycott of British goods. Efforts to collect the new duties were violently resisted. Lord North sought a compromise by cancelling all the towns and imposts except for a threepence per pound duty on tea. The colonies relaxed their boycott but resolved to drink only such tea as had been smuggled in. When three ships of the East India Company tried to land 298 chests of tea at Boston, half a hundred irate colonials, disguised as Mohawk Indians, boarded the vessels, overpowered the crews, and emptied the cargoes into the sea, this on December 16, 1773. Riots in other American ports frustrated further efforts to bring in the company's tea. The rest of the story belongs mostly to America, but the part played in it by British statesmen, orators, writers, and public opinion forms a vital element in the history of England. Just as in America, a numerous and active minority called for loyalty to the mother country and its government, so in England, while the public generally supported the martial measures of Lord North's ministry, a minority, represented in Parliament by Chatham, Burke, Fox, Horace Walpole, and Wilkes, labored for peace on terms favorable to America. Some saw in this division of English opinion a revival of the opposition between royalists and parliamentarians in 1642. The Anglican Church fully supported the war against the colonies, so did the Methodists, following Wesley's lead. But many other dissenters regretted the conflict, for they remembered that a majority of the colonists had come from dissenting groups. Gibbon agreed with Johnson in condemning the colonies, but David Hume, nearing death, warned Britain that the attempt to coerce America would lead to disaster. The business interests veered to support of the king as war orders brought them profits. War, Burke mourned, is indeed become a substitute for commerce. Great orders for provisions and stores of all kinds keep up the spirits of the mercantile world and induce them to consider the American war not so much their calamity as their resource. The liberals feared that the war would strengthen the Tories against the Whigs and the king against Parliament. One liberal, the Duke of Richmond, thought of moving to France to escape royal despotism. George III gave some excuse for such fears. He took full charge of the war, even of its military details. Lord North and the other ministers, often against their private judgment, obeyed the royal lead. The king felt that if the Americans succeeded, England would face revolt in other colonies and would finally be confined to its island. The Earl of Chatham, however, warned Parliament that the forcible suppression of America would be a victory for the principles of Charles I and James II. On November 20th, 1777, when British armies had suffered many defeats in America and France was sending subsidies to the colonies, Chatham, coming to the House of Lords as if from the grave, heard with mounting impatience the ministerial address from the throne, and rose to make one of the greatest speeches in the records of British eloquence. Here history and literature unite. I rise, my lords, to declare my sentiments on this most solemn and serious subject. I cannot concur in a blind and servile address which approves and endeavors to sanctify the monstrous measures that have heaped disgrace and misfortune upon us that have brought ruin to our doors. This, my lords, is a perilous and tremendous moment. It is not a time for adulation. The smoothness of flattery cannot now avail. It is now necessary to instruct the throne in the language of truth. This, my lords, is our duty. It is the proper function of this noble assembly, sitting upon our honors in this house, the hereditary council of the crown. And who is the minister? Where is the minister? 
that has dared to suggest to the throne the contrary unconstitutional language this day delivered from it. The accustomed language from the throne has been application to Parliament for advice. But on this day, and in this extreme momentous exigency, no reliance is reposed on our constitutional councils, no advice is asked from the sober and enlightened care of Parliament, but the crown, from itself and by itself, declares an unalterable determination to pursue measures dictated and forced upon us, which have reduced this late flourishing empire to ruin and contempt. But yesterday and England might have stood against the world, now none so poor to do her reverence. My lords, you cannot conquer America. You may swell every expense and every effort still more extravagantly, pile and accumulate every assistance you can buy or borrow, traffic and barter with every little pitiful German prince that sells and sends his subjects to the shambles. Your efforts are forever vain and impotent, doubly so from this mercenary aid on which you rely, for it irritates to an incurable resentment the minds of your enemies. If I were an American as I am an Englishman, while a foreign troop was landed in my country, I would never lay down my arms. Never, never, never. Burke used all his powers of reasoning in the effort to dissuade Parliament and the Ministry from a policy of force against America. From 1774 to 1780, he represented in Parliament the city of Bristol, whose merchants at first opposed war with America. He was also at this time a salaried agent of the state of New York. He did not, like Chatham, deny the right of Parliament to tax the colonies, and he did not support the appeal of the colonists to abstract theories of natural right. He brought the question down to where hard-headed men of action could understand him. Was it practical to tax America? In his speech on American taxation of April 19, 1774, he condemned not only the Townsend Acts, but the Thruppence Tax on Tea. He warned that if taxes were added to the industrial and commercial restrictions already laid upon America, the colonists would persist in a revolt that would break up the nascent British Empire and tarnish the prestige of the Parliament. Beaten on this issue, he renewed on March 22, 1775, his plea for conciliation. He pointed out that trade with America had grown tenfold between 1704 and 1772, and he asked was it wise to disrupt, perhaps sacrifice, that commerce with war. He feared that war with the colonies would leave England open to attack by a foreign enemy. This happened in 1778. He agreed that American representation in Parliament was made impracticable by the sea, opposuit natura. He asked only that England rely not upon taxation, but upon voluntary grants from the colonial assemblies. Such grants might well exceed the proceeds of direct taxation after the costs of forcible collection had been deducted. His motion to this effect was rejected 270 to 78, but he had the solace of winning to his cause the eloquence and skill of Charles James Fox. So began a friendship cemented by the American Revolution and sundered by the French. Gibbon called Fox's speech of October 31, 1776, the most masterly that he had ever heard, and Horace Walpole declared it one of his, Fox's, finest and most animated orations. Walpole ranged himself on the side of conciliation. He deplored the collapse of British statesmanship under Lord North, and on September 11, 1775, he wrote to Horace Mann, the Parliament is to meet on the 20th of next month and vote 26,000 seamen. What a paragraph of blood is there! With what torments must liberty be preserved in America? In England, what can save it? O oh, mad, mad England! What frenzy to throw away its treasures, lay waste its empire of wealth, and sacrifice its freedom, that its prince may be the arbitrary lord of boundless deserts in America, and of an impoverished, depopulated, and thence insignificant island in Europe. Not the fervor of Chatham, Burke, and Fox, but the victories and diplomacies of the colonies persuaded the English people, and then their government, to thoughts of peace. Burgoyne's surrender at Saratoga on October 17, 1777, was the turning point. For the first time England appreciated Chatham's warning, You cannot conquer America. 
When France recognized the United States of America and joined in war against England on February 6, 1778, the judgment of French statesmen confirmed Chatham's, and the weight of French arms and of a restored French navy was added to the burden borne by the British nation. Lord North himself lost heart and begged permission to resign. The king, loading him with gifts, bade him stay on. Many prominent Englishmen now felt that only a government led by the Earl of Chatham could win the colonies back from the French alliance to union with England. But George would not hear of it. I solemnly declare, he told North, that nothing shall bring me to treat personally with Lord Chatham. The Earl came to the House of Lords for the last time on April 7, 1778, supported by crutches and his son William, his face ghastly with the nearness of death, his voice so weak as to be barely heard. Again he counseled conciliation, but stood out against the dismemberment of this ancient and most noble monarchy by a grant of independence to America. The Duke of Richmond answered that only by such a grant could America be won away from France. Chatham tried to rise and speak again, but he collapsed in an apoplectic fit. He died on May 11, 1778. Parliament voted him a public funeral with a tomb and monument in Westminster Abbey. He was, by general consent, the greatest Englishman of his time. Events hurried to complete the catastrophe that he had predicted. In June 1779, Spain joined France in war against England. It laid siege to Gibraltar and sent its fleet to share in the attack upon British shipping. In August, a combined flotilla of 60 French and Spanish vessels entered the English Channel. England feverishly prepared to resist invasion. Sickness disabled the hostile fleet and compelled it to retire to Brest. In March 1780, Russia, Denmark, and Sweden united in a declaration of armed neutrality, which vowed to resist England's practice of boarding neutral vessels in search of enemy goods. Soon other neutrals signed the declaration. English search of Dutch vessels continued. It found evidence of secret agreements between the city of Amsterdam and an American negotiator. England demanded the punishment of the Amsterdam officials. The Dutch government refused. England declared war in December 1780. Now almost all the Baltic and Atlantic states were allied against the England that only recently had ruled the seas. The mood of Parliament reflected the multiplication of disasters. Resentment was mounting against the King's frustration of his minister's desire to end the war. On April 6, 1780, John Dunning had offered to the House of Commons a motion declaring that the influence of the Crown has increased, is increasing, and ought to be diminished. The motion was approved by a vote of 233 to 215. On January 23, 1781, the younger Pitt took his seat in the House. In his second speech, he denounced the war with America as most accursed, wicked, barbarous, cruel, unnatural, unjust, and diabolical. Fox joyfully welcomed Pitt to the ranks of the opposition, not foreseeing that this youth was soon to be his strongest foe. On October 19, 1781, Lord Cornwallis surrendered to Washington at Yorktown. "'Oh, God, it is all over!' exclaimed Lord North. But the king insisted that the war must go on. In February and March 1782, news came that Menorca had been taken by the Spaniards and several West Indian islands by the French. Public meetings throughout England clamored for peace. North's majority in the Commons fell to twenty-two, to nineteen, to one, on a motion that the House could no longer repose confidence in the present ministers. This on March 15, 1782. This set an historic precedent for Parliament's procedure enforcing a change of ministry. On March 18th, North wrote to George III a letter telling him, in effect, that both the royal policy toward America and the attempt to establish the supremacy of the king over Parliament had failed. Your Majesty is well apprised that in this country the prince on the throne cannot with prudence oppose the deliberate resolution of the House of Commons. The Parliament have uttered their sentiments, and their sentiments, whether just or erroneous, must ultimately prevail. Your Majesty can lose no honor if you yield. On March 20, 1782, after twelve years of patient service and submission, Lord North resigned. George III, his spirit broken, wrote a letter of abdication, but did not send it. He accepted a ministry of triumphant liberals, Rockingham, 
the Earl of Shelburne, Charles James Fox, Burke, and Sheridan. When Rockingham died on July 1st, Shelburne succeeded him as First Lord of the Treasury. Fox, Burke, and Sheridan, disliking Shelburne, resigned. Shelburne proceeded to arrange a treaty of peace. Paris, November 30th, 1782, Paris and Versailles, January 20th and September 3rd, 1783, that surrendered Menorca and Florida to Spain and Senegal to France, and acknowledged not only the independence of the American colonies, but their right to all the territory between the Alleghenies, Florida, the Mississippi, and the Great Lakes. The English people had been eager for peace, but they resented the cession of so much terrain to the colonies. Criticism of Shelburne reached such bitterness that he submitted his resignation on February 24, 1783. As the quarrel between Shelburne and Fox had divided the liberal Whigs into factions, neither of which was strong enough to control Parliament, Fox agreed to form a coalition ministry with his old enemy Lord North. Burke again became paymaster of the forces. Sheridan, who was always in debt, was made Secretary of the Treasury. Both Fox and Burke had for some time been studying the behavior of Englishmen in India, and that country now replaced America as the most urgent problem in British politics. 6. England and India The British East India Company had been reorganized in 1709 as the United Company of Merchants of England Trading to the East Indies. Its charter from the British government entitled it to a monopoly of British trade with India. It was managed by a chairman and twenty-four directors annually elected by a court of proprietors, in which every holder of five hundred pounds or more of stock had one vote. In India, the company became a military as well as a commercial organization, and fought Dutch, French, and native armies for pieces of the crumbling empire of the Mughals. It was in one of these wars that Siraj Daula, the Nawab, or Viceroy of Bengal, captured Calcutta from the company and imprisoned 146 Europeans in the black hole of Calcutta, a room 18 by 14 feet with only two small windows. 123 of the prisoners died overnight, June 20th to 21st, 1756, from heat or asphyxiation. Robert Clive, governor of Fort St. David, led a small force to recapture Calcutta for the company. He joined in the plot of Mir Jafar, a noble at Siraj Daula's court, to overthrow the viceroy. With 900 European and 2,300 native troops, he defeated 50,000 men at Plassey on June 23, 1757. Siraj Daula was put to death, and Mir Jafar was set up in his place as Nawab of Bengal. Clive entered the capital, Murshidabab, as a conqueror. It seemed to him equal to London in size and perhaps superior in wealth. In the Nawab's treasury he saw an incredible accumulation of rupees, jewels, gold, silver, and other riches. Invited to name his reward for enthroning Mir Jafar, he asked a hundred and sixty thousand pounds for himself, five hundred thousand pounds for his army and navy, twenty-four thousand pounds for each member of the company's governing board, and one million pounds as indemnity for damage to the company's property in Calcutta. It was to this occasion that Clive referred when he told the House of Commons that he marveled at his own moderation. He received a total of £200,000 as presents from Mir Jafar and was acknowledged as British Governor of Bengal. The company, by paying a yearly rental of £27,000 to Mir Jafar, was recognized as Supreme Landlord of 882 square miles around Calcutta. In 1759, in return for aid in suppressing a rebellion, Mir Jafar agreed to remit to Clive annually the rental paid by the company. Secure from competition, the company exploited with scant mercy the natives subject to its rule. Armed with superior weapons, it made Indian rulers pay heavily for British protection. Far from supervision by the British government and immune to the Ten Commandments east of Suez, its senior officials made huge profits in trade and returned to England as nabobs capable of buying, without serious injury to their capital, a pocket borough or a member of Parliament. Clive came home to England in 1760, aged 35, expecting to enjoy fame and wealth. He bought enough boroughs to command a block in the Commons and was himself elected from Shrewsbury. Some directors of the East India Company, feeling that he had stolen beyond his years, 
attacked him for using forged documents in dealing with Siraj Udaula and Mir Jafar. But when word reached London that native revolts, official venality, and administrative incompetence were endangering the position of the company in India, Clive was hurried back to Calcutta in 1765 as governor of Bengal. There he labored to stem corruption among his aides, mutiny among his troops, and recurrent uprisings of native rulers against the company. On August 12, 1765, he persuaded the helpless mogul Shah Alam to give the company full financial control of the provinces of Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, with a population of 30 million souls and an annual revenue of 400 million pounds. This, and Clive's victory at Plassey, created the British Empire in India. His health shattered by two years of strife, Clive returned to England in January 1767. The attack upon him by company directors was renewed and was seconded by officials whose extortions he had checked. News of a great famine in India and of native attacks upon company strongholds shared in causing a panic in which prominent Englishmen suffered severe losses. In 1772, two parliamentary committees investigated Indian affairs and revealed such exactions and cruelties that Horace Walpole cried out, We have outdone the Spaniards in Peru. We have murdered, deposed, plundered, usurped. Nay, what think you of the famine in Bengal, in which three millions perished, being caused by a monopoly of provisions by the servants of the East India Company? In 1773, one of the investigating committees called upon Clive to account to the House of Commons for his methods and gains in India. He admitted nearly all the facts, defended them as warranted by local customs and the necessities of the situation, and added that when the members came to judge of his honour they should not forget their own. The House voted, 155 to 95, that he had received 234,000 pounds during his first administration of Bengal, but that he did at the same time render great and meritorious services to his country. A year later, aged 49, Clive killed himself on November 22, 1774. In 1773, Lord North put through Parliament a regulatory act that advanced a loan of £1,400,000 to the company to save it and its parliamentary shareholders from bankruptcy and brought all company-ruled territory in India under the presidency of Bengal, which in turn would be responsible to the British government. Warren Hastings was appointed governor of Bengal. He had risen to this position from lowly origins. His mother died in giving him birth. His father went off to adventure and death in the West Indies. An uncle sent the boy to Westminster School, but in 1749 the uncle died, and Warren, aged 17, sailed to seek fortune in India. He enrolled as a volunteer under Clive, shared in the recapture of Calcutta, showed diligence and ability in administration, and was appointed to the council governing company affairs in Bengal. In 1764 he returned to England. Four years later the directors persuaded him to join the Council of Madras. On his way to India, he met Baron Imhoff and his wife, Marion, who became Hastings's mistress, and then his wife. He did well in Madras, and in 1774 he began his turbulent rule as governor of Bengal. He worked hard, but his methods were dictatorial, and some of his measures provided material for attacks upon him by Sir Philip Francis in the Bengal Council, as later by Burke in Parliament. When Maratha tribes restored Shah Alam to the Mughal throne at Delhi, and he made over to them those districts of Kora and Allahabad which Clive had assigned to him, Hastings sold the districts to the Nawab of Oud for fifty lakhs of rupees, or about twenty million dollars, and assigned company troops to help the Nawab recover the region. He allowed the Nawab to use company troops to invade and appropriate the territory of Rohil Khand, whose chief, said the Nawab, owed him money. The company received a large sum for these soldiers. Hastings' action clearly violated orders given him by the directors. However, those directors reckoned the worth of a governor by the money he sent back to England. An Indian official, Nan Kumar, accused Hastings of accepting a bribe. Francis and other counselors credited the charge and alleged that there was no species of peculation from which the honorable governor has thought it reasonable to abstain. Nankumar was arrested on a charge of forgery, was convicted, and was put to death in 1775. Hastings was suspected of having influenced the Chief Justice, Sir Elijah Impey, formerly a fellow student at Winchester, to exact an unusually severe penalty. 
In 1780, Hastings promoted Impey to an additional post, bringing £6,500 a year. Mutual recrimination between Hastings and Francis led to a duel, in which Francis was seriously wounded. Haidar Ali, Maharaja of Mysore, thought the quarrels between Hastings and his council offered an opportunity for expelling the company from India. Supported by the French, he attacked company strongholds and won some alarming victories in 1780. Hastings sent troops and money from Bengal to oppose him. Haidar Ali died in 1782, but his son, Tipu Saib, carried on the war till his final defeat in 1792. Probably it was to finance these campaigns that Hastings resorted to money-raising schemes that led to his impeachment. He demanded from Chait Singh, Raja of Banaras, a war subsidy additional to the revenue which that district annually paid to the company. The Raja pleaded inability to comply. Hastings led a small force to Banaras in 1781, deposed Chait Singh, and exacted double the revenue from Chait's successor. The Nawab of Oud, remiss in his payments to the company, explained that he could make these payments if the company would help him compel his mother and grandmother, the Begums, or princesses of Oud, to release to him some of the two hundred million pounds left them by the Nawab's father. The mother had already yielded him a large sum on his promise to ask for no more. The company, over Hastings' protest, made a like promise. Hastings advised the Nawab to ignore the promise. He sent company troops to Fizabad. By torture and near starvation they forced the eunuch servitors of the princesses to surrender the treasure in 1781. Out of this the Nawab paid his dues to the company. Meanwhile, Sir Philip Francis, having recovered from his wounds, returned to England in 1781, and expounded to the directors and to his friends in Parliament what he considered to be the crimes of Hastings. In 1782 the House of Commons censured Hastings and other company agents as having, in sundry instances, acted in a manner repugnant to the honour and policy of the nation, and ordered the directors to recall them. The directors issued such an order, but the court proprietors countermanded it, probably because the Mysore revolt was continuing. In November 1783, Charles James Fox, as Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs in the Coalition Ministry, offered Parliament an India Reform Bill that would have put the East India Company under control of commissioners appointed by the Ministry. Critics moaned that the bill would give the fox Burke Whigs a rich well of patronage. It passed the House, but the King sent word to the Lords that he would consider as his enemy any man who voted for the measure. They voted against it, 95 to 76. The Commons filed a formal protest that this royal interference with legislation was a scandalous breach of parliamentary privilege. The King, claiming that the coalition ministry had lost the confidence of Parliament, dismissed it on December 18, 1783, and invited William Pitt, aged 24, to form a new government. Believing that he could win a national election, George III dissolved the Parliament on March 23, 1784, and ordered his agents to spread the royal wishes and plums among the electorate to ensure the return of a conservative majority. The Parliament that assembled on May 18th was overwhelmingly for Pitt and the King. Pitt was a master of political administration and management. His meticulous devotion to his task, his detailed knowledge of affairs, his habit of careful reflection and prudent judgment, gave him a superiority which nearly all his fellow ministers soon conceded. Now, for the first time since Robert Walpole, for whom his son had used the term in 1773, England had a prime minister, for no important action was taken by Pitt's colleagues without his consent. In effect, he established cabinet government. He assembled deliberation and united responsibility of the leading ministers under one leadership. Though Pitt had assumed office as favoring the royal authority, his hard work and wide information gradually raised him to a position where he guided rather than followed the king. After George III's second seizure in 1788, it was Pitt who ruled England. His special acquaintance with business and finance enabled him to restore a treasury dangerously burdened by two major wars in one generation. Pitt had read Adam Smith. He listened to merchants and manufacturers. He reduced import dues negotiated a treaty of lowered tariffs with France in 1786, and delighted industrial leaders by declaring that manufacturers should in general be free from taxes. He made up for this by taxing consumption, 
ribbons, gauzes, gloves, hats, candles, couches, salt, wine, bricks, tiles, paper, windows. Many houses boarded up some windows to reduce the tax. By 1788, the budget was balanced, and England had escaped the governmental bankruptcy that was leading France to revolution. Before the election, Pitt had introduced his first India bill, which had been defeated. Now he offered a second bill. A board of control appointed by the king was to manage the political relations of the East India Company, while commercial relations and patronage were left in company hands, subject to royal veto. The bill was passed on August 9, 1784, and governed British Indian affairs till 1858. Fox and Burke considered this arrangement a shameful surrender to a company notorious for corruption and crime. Burke had special reasons for dissatisfaction. His patron, Lord Barney, his brother Richard Burke, and his relative William Burke had invested in the East India Company and had suffered heavy losses in the fluctuations of its stock. When William Burke went to India, Edmund recommended him to Sir Philip Francis as one whom he loved tenderly. William was made a paymaster and proved as corrupt as any. Francis, back in England, gave Burke and Fox his version of Hastings's administration. He was one source of Burke's remarkable knowledge of Indian affairs. The attack upon Hastings by the liberal Whigs was presumably motivated in part by desire to discredit and overthrow Pitt's ministry. In January 1785, Hastings resigned and returned to England. He hoped that his long years of administration, his restoration of the company to solvency, and his rescue of British power in Madras and Bombay would be rewarded with a pension, if not with a peerage. In the spring of 1786, Burke asked the House of Commons for the official records of Hastings's rule in India. Some were refused, some were given him by the ministers. In April, he laid before the House a bill of charges against the ex-governor of Bengal. Hastings read to the House a detailed reply. In June, Burke presented charges relating to the Rohilkhand War and asked for the impeachment of Hastings. The Commons refused to prosecute. On June 13, Fox told the cabinet of Chait Singh and asked for impeachment. Pitt surprised his cabinet by voting with Fox and Burke. Many of his party followed his lead, which may have been designed to dissociate the ministry from Hastings's fate. The motion to impeach was carried, 119 to 79. The prorogation of Parliament and the pressure of other issues interrupted the drama, but it was resumed with éclat on February 7, 1787 when Sheridan made what Fox and Burke and Pitt called the best speech ever heard in the House of Commons. Sheridan was offered a thousand pounds for a corrected copy of the address. He never found time to do this, and we know it only from subdued summaries. With all the art of a man born to the theatre, and all the fervour of a romantic spirit, Sheridan recounted the spoliation of the Begums of Oud. After speaking for over five hours, he demanded that Hastings be impeached, Again, Pitt voted for the prosecution. The motion was carried, 175 to 68. On February 8th, the House appointed a committee of twenty, with Burke, Fox, and Sheridan at their head, to prepare the articles of impeachment. These were presented, and on May 9th, the House ordered Mr. Burke, in the name of the House of Commons, to go to the bar of the House of Lords and impeach Warren Hastings, Esquire, of high crimes and misdemeanors. Hastings was arrested and brought before the peers, but was released on bail. After a long delay, the trial began on February 13, 1788, in Westminster Hall. All lovers of literature will recall Macaulay's gorgeous description of that historic assemblage. The lords sitting in ermine and gold as the high court of the realm, before them Hastings, pale and ill, aged fifty-three, height five feet six inches, weight a hundred and twenty-two pounds. The judges under their great ear-lapping wigs, the family of the king, the members of the House of Commons, the galleries crowded with ambassadors, princesses, and duchesses, Mrs. Siddons in her stately beauty, Sir Joshua Reynolds amid so many notables whom he had portrayed, and on one side the committee, now called the managers, ready to present the case for impeachment. Clerks read the charges and Hastings's reply. For four days, in the most powerful speech of his career, Burke laid upon the accused an overwhelming mass of accusations. This book is continued on Cassette 3, Side 1.
Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 Continued Cassette 3, Side 1 For four days, in the most powerful speech of his career, Burke laid upon the accused an overwhelming mass of accusations. Then, on February 15th, he made the historic hall ring with his passionate demand. I impeach Warren Hastings, Esquire, of high crimes and misdemeanors. I impeach him in the name of the Commons of Great Britain, whose parliamentary trust he has betrayed. I impeach him in the name of the people of India, whose laws, rights, and liberties he has subverted, whose properties he has destroyed, whose country he has laid waste and desolate. I impeach him in the name and by the virtue of those eternal laws of justice which he has violated. I impeach him in the name of human nature itself, which he has cruelly outraged, injured, and oppressed in both sexes, in every age, rank, situation, and condition of life. With a hundred interruptions, the trial proceeded, as Burke, Fox, Sheridan, and others told the story of Hastings's administration. When it became known that at noon on June 3rd, Sheridan would present the evidence concerning the Begums of Oud, the streets leading to Westminster Hall were crowded from eight in the morning with persons, many of high rank, anxious to find admittance. Some who had secured cards of admission sold them for fifty guineas, or about fifteen hundred dollars each. Sheridan understood that a dramatic performance was expected of him. He gave it. He spoke at four sittings. On the final day, June 13, 1788, after holding the floor for five hours, he sank exhausted into the arms of Burke, who embraced him. Gibbon, who was in the gallery, described Sheridan as a good actor, and remarked how well the orator looked when the historian called upon him the next morning. That speech was the climax of the trial. Each of the score of charges required investigation. The lords took their time and may have dallied to let the effect of eloquence wear off and let interest in the case be diverted to other events. These came. In October 1788, King George went mad, quite seriously mad, borne down by the stress of the trial and the misconduct of his son. George Augustus Frederick, Prince of Wales, was fat, good-natured, generous, wasteful, and amorous. He had maintained a succession of mistresses and had accumulated debts which his father or the nation paid. In 1785 he had privately married Mrs. Maria Ann Fitzherbert, a devout Roman Catholic, already twice widowed and six years older than the prince. The Whigs, led by Fox, proposed to set up a regency under the prince, who sat up through two nights waiting for the king to be declared incompetent. George III confused matters by having lucid intervals in which he talked of Garrick and Johnson, sang snatches of Handel, and played the flute. In March 1789 he recovered, shed his straitjacket, and resumed the forms of rule. The French Revolution provided another diversion from the trial. Burke gave up the chase of Hastings and ran to the aid of Marie Antoinette. The immoderation of his speeches ended the remains of his popularity. He complained that the members of Parliament slipped away when he began to speak. Most of the press was hostile to him. He charged that twenty thousand pounds had been used in buying journalists to attack him and defend Hastings, and unquestionably a large part of Hastings's fortune had been so spent. It must have been no surprise to Burke when, at last, eight years after the impeachment, the House of Lords acquitted Hastings in 1795. The general feeling was that the verdict was just. The accused had in many respects been guilty, but he had saved India for England, and had been punished by a trial that had broken his health and his hopes, and had left him tarnished in reputation and ruined in purse. Hastings survived all his accusers. The East India Company rescued him from insolvency by voting him a gift of ninety thousand pounds. He bought back his family's ancestral estate at Dalesford, restored it, and lived in oriental luxury. In 1813, aged eighty-one, he was asked to testify on Indian affairs before the House of Commons. He was received there with acclamation and reverence, his services remembered, his sins washed away by time. Four years later he passed away, and of his tumultuous generation only one remained, the blind and imbecile king. 7. England and the French Revolution After almost exhausting himself in his war against the East India Company, 
Bert took on the French Revolution as his personal enemy, and in the course of this new campaign he made a major contribution to political philosophy. He had predicted the revolution twenty years before its coming. Under such extreme straightness and distraction labors the whole of French finances, so far does their charge outrun their supply in every particular, that no man who has considered their affairs with any degree of attention or information but must hourly look for some extraordinary convulsion in that whole system, the effect of which on France and even on all Europe it is difficult to conjecture. In 1773 he visited France. At Versailles he saw Marie Antoinette, then Dauphine. He never forgot that vision of youthful beauty, happiness, and pride. He formed a favorable opinion of the French nobility and still more of the French clergy. He was shocked by the anti-Catholic, often anti-religious propaganda of the philosophe, and on his return to England he warned his countrymen against atheism as the most horrid and cruel blow that can be offered to civil society. When the revolution came, he was alarmed by the acclaim it received from his friend Fox, who hailed the fall of the Bastille as the greatest event that ever happened in the world and the best. Radical ideas, stemming from the campaigns of Wilkes and the Society of Supporters of the Bill of Rights, had slowly spread in England. One obscure writer in 1761 proposed communism as a cure for all social ills except overpopulation, which he feared might cancel all attempts to relieve poverty. A society for commemorating the revolution of 1688 had been formed in 1788. Its membership included prominent clergymen and peers. At its meeting on November 4, 1789, it was so stirred by a Unitarian preacher, Richard Price, that it sent an address of congratulations to the National Assembly at Paris, expressing the hope that the glorious example given in France might encourage other nations to assert the inalienable rights of mankind. The message was signed by the third Earl Stanhope, president of the society and brother-in-law of William Pitt. That sermon and that message aroused Burke to fear and wrath. He was now sixty years old and had reached the right to be conservative. He was religious and owned a large estate. The French Revolution seemed to him not only the most astonishing that has hitherto happened in the world, but the most outrageous attack upon religion, property, order, and law. On February 9, 1790, he told the House of Commons that if any friend of his should concur in any measures tending to introduce into England such democracy as was taking form in France, he would renounce that friendship, however long established and dearly cherished. Fox soothed the orator with his famous compliment to Burke as his best educator. The break between the two was postponed. In November 1790, Burke published Reflections on the Revolution in France in the form of a letter, 365 pages long, to a gentleman in Paris. Leader of the Liberals during the American Revolution, Burke was now the hero of conservative England. George III expressed his delight with his old enemy. The book became the Bible of courts and aristocracies. Catherine the Great, once the friend and darling of the philosophe, sent her congratulations to the man who had set out to dethrone them. Burke began with a reference to Dr. Price and the Society for Commemorating the Revolution. He deplored the entry of clergymen into political discussions. Their business was to guide souls to Christian charity, not to political reform. He had no trust in the universal male suffrage that Price pleaded for. He thought the majority would be a worse tyrant than a king, and that democracy would degenerate into mob rule. Wisdom lies not in numbers, but in experience. Nature knows nothing of equality. Political equality is a monstrous fiction, which, by inspiring false ideas and vain expectations into men destined to travel in the obscure walks of laborious life, serves only to aggravate that real inequality which it never can remove. Aristocracy is inevitable, and the older it is, the better it will fulfill its function of silently establishing that social order without which there can be no stability, no security, and no liberty. Hereditary monarchy is good because it gives to government a unity and continuity without which the legal and social relations of the citizens would fall into a hectic and chaotic flux. Religion is good because it helps to chain those unsocial impulses which run like subterranean fire beneath the surface of civilization, and which can be controlled only by the constant cooperation of state and church, law and creed, fear and reverence. 
Those French philosophers who undermined religious belief in the educated ranks of their people were foolishly loosing the reins that had kept men from becoming beasts. Burke was revolted by the triumph of the mob at Versailles over a mild and lawful monarch, treating him with more fury, outrage, and insult than ever any people raised against the most illegal usurper and the most sanguinary tyrant. Here came the famous page that thrilled our youth. It is now sixteen or seventeen years since I saw the Queen of France, then the Dauphiness, at Versailles, and surely never lighted on this orb, which she hardly seemed to touch a more delicate vision. I saw her just above the horizon, decorating and cheering the elevated sphere she just began to move in, glittering like the morning star, full of life and splendor and joy. Oh, what a revolution, and what a heart must I have to contemplate without emotion that elevation and that fall! Little did I dream when she added titles of veneration to those of enthusiastic, distant, respectful love, that she should ever be obliged to carry the sharp antidote against disgrace concealed in that bosom. Little did I dream that I should have lived to see such disasters fallen upon her in a nation of gallant men, in a nation of men of honor and of cavaliers. I thought ten thousand swords must have leaped from their scabbards to avenge even a look that threatened her with insult. But the age of chivalry is gone, that of sophisters, economists, and calculators, has succeeded, and the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. Sir Philip Francis laughed at all this as romantic moonshine, and assured Burke that the Queen of France was a Messalina and a jade. So thought many patriotic Englishmen. Horace Walpole, however, affirmed that Burke had pictured Marie Antoinette exactly as she appeared to me the first time I saw her when Dauphiness. As the revolution proceeded, Burke continued his attack with a letter to a member of the National Assembly in January 1791. In this he suggested that the governments of Europe should unite to check the revolt and to restore the King of France to his traditional power. Fox was alarmed at this proposal, and in the House of Commons on May 6th, the friends who had fought shoulder to shoulder in so many campaigns came to a dramatic parting of the ways. Fox reiterated his praise of the revolution. Burke rose in protest. It is indiscreet, he said, at any period, but especially at my time of life, to provoke enemies or give my friends occasion to desert me. Yet if my firm and steady adherence to the British Constitution placed me in such a dilemma, I am ready to risk it. Fox assured him that no severance of friendship was involved in their differences. Yes, yes, answered Burke, there is a loss of friends. I know the price of my conduct. Our friendship is at an end. He never spoke to Fox again except formally in their constrained union in the Hastings trial. In his writings on the French Revolution, Burke gave a classical expression to a conservative philosophy. Its first principle is to distrust the reasoning of an individual, however brilliant, if it conflicts with the traditions of the race. Just as a child cannot understand the reasons for parental cautions and prohibitions, so the individual, who is a child compared with the race, cannot always understand the reasons for customs, conventions, and laws that embody the experience of many generations. Civilization would be impossible if the practice of all moral duties and the foundations of society rested upon having their reasons made clear and demonstrative to every individual. Even prejudices have their use. They prejudge present problems on the basis of past experience. So the second element of conservatism is prescription. A tradition or an institution should be doubly reverenced and rarely changed if it is already written or embodied in the order of the society or the structure of the government. Private property is an example of prescription and of the apparent irrationality of wisdom. It seems unreasonable that one family should own so much, another so little, and even more unreasonable that the owner should be allowed to transmit his property to successors who have not lifted a hand to earn it. Yet experience has found that men in general will not bestir themselves to work and study, or to laborious and expensive preparation, unless they may call the results of their efforts their own property, to be transmitted in large measure as they desire. And experience has shown that the possession of property is the best guarantee for the prudence of legislation and the continuity of the state. A state is not merely an association of persons in a given space at a given moment. 
It is an association of individuals through extensive time. Society is indeed a contract, a partnership, not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. That continuity is our country. In this triune whole, a present majority may be a minority in time, and the legislator must consider the rights of the past, through prescription, and of the future, as well as those of the living present. Politics is, or should be, the art of adjusting the aims of clashing minorities with the good of the continuing group. Moreover, there are no absolute rights. These are metaphysical abstractions unknown to nature. There are only desires, powers, and circumstances. And circumstances give to every political principle its distinguishing color and discriminating effect. Expediency is sometimes more important than rights. Politics ought to be adjusted not to abstract human reasonings, but to human nature, of which the reason is but a part, and by no means the greatest part. We must make use of existing materials. All these considerations are illustrated by religion. The doctrines, myths, and ceremonies of a religion may not conform to our present individual reason, but this may be of minor moment if they comport with the past, present, and presumed future needs of society. Experience dictates that the passions of men can be controlled only by the teachings and observances of religion. If we should uncover our nakedness, or release our instincts, by throwing off that Christian religion which has been one great source of civilization amongst us, we are apprehensive, being well aware that the mind will not endure a void, that some uncouth, pernicious, and degrading superstition must take place of it. Many Englishmen rejected Burke's conservatism as a cult of stagnation, and Thomas Paine answered him vigorously in The Rights of Man, 1791-92. But the England of Burke's old age generally welcomed his ancestor worship. As the French Revolution went on to the September massacres, the execution of the king and the queen, and the reign of terror, the great majority of Britons felt that Burke had well predicted the results of revolt and irreligion and for a full century England, though eliminating her rotten boroughs and widening her suffrage, kept resolutely to its constitution of king, aristocracy, established church, and a parliament thinking in terms of imperial powers rather than of popular rights. After the revolution, France returned from Rousseau to Montesquieu, and Joseph de Mestre rephrased Burke for the repentant French. Burke continued to the end his campaign for a holy war, and he rejoiced when France declared war on Great Britain in 1793. George III wished to reward his old enemy for recent services with a peerage and with that title of Lord Beaconsfield, which Disraeli later graced. Burke refused, but accepted a pension of £2,500 in 1794. When talk rose of negotiations with France— he issued four letters on a regicide peace, from 1797 onward, passionately demanding that the war go on. Only death cooled his fire on July 8, 1797. Fox proposed that he be buried in Westminster Abbey, but Burke had left instructions that he should have a private funeral and be interred in the little church at Beaconsfield. Macaulay thought him the greatest Englishman since Milton, which may have slighted Chatham, and Lord Morley, more prudently, called him the greatest master of civil wisdom in our tongue, which may have slighted Locke. In any case, Burke was what conservatives had longed for in vain throughout the Age of Reason, a man who could defend custom as brilliantly as Voltaire had defended reason. 8. The Heroes Retire As the French Revolution advanced, Charles James Fox found himself in a diminishing minority in Parliament and in the country. Many of his allies were won to the view that England must join Prussia and Austria in fighting France. After the execution of Louis XVI, Fox himself turned against the Revolution, but he still opposed entry into the war. When war came, nevertheless, he consoled himself by drinking, by reading the classics, and by marrying, in 1795, his, and Lord Cavendish's, Lord Darby's, and Lord Chumley's, former mistress, Mrs. Elizabeth Armstead, who paid his debts. He welcomed the Peace of Amiens in 1802, traveled in France, was acclaimed there with civic and popular honors, 
was received by Napoleon as a patriot of civilization. In 1806, he served as foreign secretary in a Ministry of All the Talents. He labored to keep the peace with France and decisively supported Wilberforce's campaign against the slave trade. When he learned of a plot to assassinate Napoleon, he sent the emperor a warning through Talleyrand. Had Fox's health not broken down, he might have found a means of reconciling Bonaparte's ambition with England's security. But in July 1806 he was disabled by dropsy. A succession of painful operations failed to stay the progress of the disease. He made his peace with the established church, and on September 13th he died, mourned by his friends and his enemies, and even by the king. He was the most widely loved man of his time. The younger Pitt, prematurely old, preceded him to the abbey's vaults. He too found that he could bear the pace of political life only through the occasional amnesia of drink. The precarious sanity of George III was a constant problem. Any serious conflict of views between king and minister might throw the crowned head out of balance and bring in a regency by the Prince of Wales, who would sack Pitt and call in Fox. So Pitt abandoned his plans for political reform and withdrew his opposition to the slave trade when he found that on these, as on many other matters, George was fretfully resolved to perpetuate the past. Pitt concentrated his genius on economic legislation in which he served the rising middle class. Much to his distaste, he led England in war against what he called a nation of atheists. He did not do well as a war minister. Fearing a French invasion of Ireland, he tried to appease the Irish with a program of parliamentary union and Catholic emancipation. The king balked and Pitt resigned in 1801. He returned in 1804 to head his second ministry. Napoleon proved too much for him, and when the news came of the French victory at Austerlitz on December 2, 1805, which made Napoleon master of the continent, Pitt broke down in body and spirit. Seeing a large map of Europe, he bade a friend, Roll up that map. It will not be wanted these ten years. He died January 23, 1806, honorably poor, and only forty-six years old. Life took longer to destroy Sheridan. He had joined with Burke and Fox in the defense of America and the Battle of Hastings. He supported Fox in applauding the French Revolution. Meanwhile, that wife, whose charm and gentle nature were favorite themes among his friends, and who had put her beauty in the hustings to help him win a seat in Parliament, died of tuberculosis in her thirty-eighth year in 1792. Sheridan broke down. I have seen him, said an acquaintance, night after night cry like a child. He found some consolation in the daughter she had borne him, but she died in the same year. During those months of grief he faced the task of rebuilding the Drury Lane Theatre, which had become too old and weak for safety, and to finance this operation he incurred heavy liabilities. He had accustomed himself to luxurious living which his income could not maintain. He borrowed to continue that style. When his creditors came to dun him he treated them like lords, entertained them with liquor, courtesy, and wit, and sent them away in a humor that almost forgot his debts. He remained active in Parliament till 1812, when he failed of re-election. As a member of the House, he had been immune to arrest. Now his creditors closed in upon him, appropriated his books, his pictures, his jewels. Finally, they were about to carry him off to jail, when his physician warned them that Sheridan might die on the way. He succumbed on July 7, 1816, in his sixty-fifth year. He was rich again in his funeral— for seven lords and one bishop bore him to the abbey. The half-mad king survived them all, survived even the triumph of England at Waterloo, though he knew it not. By 1783 he recognized that he had failed in his attempt to make the ministers responsible to him rather than to Parliament. The long struggles with the House of Commons, with America, and with France proved too much for him, and in 1801, 1804, and 1810 he relapsed into insanity. In his old age the people came to recognize his courage and his sincerity, and the popularity that had been denied him in his days of strife came to him at last, tinged with pity for a man who had seen England suffer so many defeats and was not permitted to witness her victory. The death of his favorite daughter Amelia in 1810 completed his divorce from reality. In 1811 he became incurably insane as well as blind, and he remained in seclusion under guard till his death on January 29th, 1820. Chapter 29. The English People, 1756 to 1789. 
1. English Ways So much for the government. Let us now consider the people. First, look at their figures. Doubtless, Reynolds idealized them, showing us mostly the titled fortunate and glorifying their corpulence with the robes and insignia of dignity. But here Goethe on the Englishman he saw in Weimar. What fine, handsome people they are! And he worried lest these confident young Britishers, bearing empire in their stride, would disenchant German girls with German men. Several of these youths kept their figures into later years, but many of them, as they passed from the playgrounds of their schools to the pleasures of the table, swelled in paunch and jowls, blossomed like a red, red rose, and fought in the still of the night the gout they had fed in the jovial day. Some Elizabethan robustness had been lost in restoration roistering. English women, by contrast, were more beautiful than ever, at least on the easels. Refined features, flowered and ribboned hair, mysteries in silk, poems of stately grace. Sartorial class distinctions were disappearing on the streets as a new plenty of cotton clothing issued from the multiplying mills, but on formal occasions they remained. Lord Darwinwater rode to his execution in a scarlet coat and waistcoat laced with gold. Wigs were waning, and they vanished when Pitt the Second taxed the powder that deodorized them. They survived on doctors, judges, barristers, and Samuel Johnson. Most men were now content with their own hair, gathered at the back of the neck in a ribboned queue. About 1785 some men extended their breeches from knees to calves, in 1793, inspired by the triumphant French sans-culottes, they let them reach the ankle, and modern man was born. Women still laced their bosoms to the verge of suffocation, but the hoop skirt was losing fashion and breadth, and dresses were assuming those flowing lines that fascinated our youth. Friendliness was next to godliness in rarity, for water was a luxury. Rivers were lovely but usually polluted— the Thames was a drainage canal. Most London houses had water piped into them three times a week for three shillings per quarter. Some had mechanical toilets. A few had bathrooms with running water. Most privies, whose current name was Jericho's, were extramural, built over open pits that sent their seepage through the soil to wells from which much of the drinking water came. Nevertheless, public sanitation was improving. Hospitals were multiplying— Infant mortality fell from seventy-four per hundred births in 1749 to forty-one in 1809. No one drank water if he could get something safer. Beer was considered a food necessary for any vigorous work. Wine was a favorite medicine. Whiskey was a portable stove, and drunkenness was a venial sin, if not a necessary part of social conformity. "'I remember,' said Dr. Johnson, when all the decent people in Litchfield got drunk every night and were not the worst thought of. Pitt the Second came drunk to the House of Commons, and Lord Cornwallis went drunk to the opera. Some hackney coachmen added to their incomes by cruising the streets at late hours, picking up gentlemen who were as drunk as a lord, and delivering them to their homes. Drunkenness declined as the century advanced. Tea took up some of the task of warming the vitals and loosing the tongue. Tea imports rose from a hundred pounds in 1668 to fourteen million pounds in 1786. The coffee houses now served more tea than coffee. Meals were hearty, bloody, and immense. Dinner came about four in the afternoon for the upper classes, and was progressively deferred till six as the century declined. A hurried man might ease his hunger with a sandwich. This contraption took its name from the fourth Earl of Sandwich, who, not to interrupt his gambling with dinner, ate two slices of bread divided by meat. Vegetables were eaten under protest. Smoking has gone out of fashion, Johnson told Boswell in 1773, but tobacco was taken in the form of snuff. Opium was widely used as a sedative or a cure. At table the Englishman could drink himself into loquacity, and then the conversation might rival that of the Paris salons in wit and excel it in substance. One day, April 9, 1778, as Johnson, Gibbon, Boswell, Alan Ramsey, and other friends gathered in the home of Sir Joshua Reynolds, the doctor remarked, 
I question if in Paris such a company as is sitting around this table could be got together in less than half a year. Aristocratic gatherings preferred wit to learning and Selwyn to Johnson. George Selwyn was the Oscar Wilde of the 18th century. He had been expelled from Oxford in 1745 because he did impiously affect to personate the Blessed Saviour and did ridicule the institution of the Holy Sacrament. But this did not prevent him from getting several lucrative sinecures in the administration or from sitting and sleeping in the House of Commons from 1747 to 1780. He had a host of friends, but never married. He had a passion for executions, but skipped that of a namesake of Charles James Fox, a political enemy for whom he hopefully awaited a Tyburn elevation. I make a point of never attending rehearsals. He and Horace Walpole were intimate friends for sixty-three years, without a cloud or a woman between them. Those who did not enjoy executions could choose among a hundred other amusements, from whist or bird-watching, to horse races or prize fights. Cricket was now the national game. The poor squandered their wages in taverns, the rich gambled their fortunes in clubs or in private homes. So Walpole, at Lady Hartford's, lost fifty-six guineas before I could say an Ave Maria. James Gilray, in famous caricatures, called such hostesses Pharaoh's daughters, Pharaoh being spelled F-A-R-O. To take losses calmly was a prime requisite of an English gentleman, even if he ended by blowing out his brains. It was a man's world, legally, socially, and morally. Men took most of their social pleasures with other men. Not till 1770 was a club organized for bisexual membership. Men discouraged intellect in women, and then complained that women were incapable of intellectual conversation. Some women, nevertheless, managed to develop intellects. Mrs. Elizabeth Carter learned to speak Latin, French, Italian, and German, studied Hebrew, Portuguese, and Arabic, and translated Epictetus with a Greek scholarship that drew Johnson's praise. She protested against the reluctance of men to discuss ideas with women, and she was one of those ladies who made the blue stockings the talk of literate London. The name was first given to the mixed gatherings at the home of Mrs. Elizabeth Beasy in Hartford Street, Mayfair. At these evening assemblies, card-playing was banned and discussion of literature was encouraged. Meeting one day Benjamin Stillingfleet, who had a momentary reputation as poet, botanist, and philosopher, Mrs. Vesey invited him to her next rout. He excused himself on the ground that he had no clothes fit for a party. He was wearing blue hose. "'Don't mind dress,' she told him. "'Come in your blue stockings.' He came." Such was the excellence of his conversation, Boswell relates, that it used to be said, We do nothing without the blue stockings. And thus, by degrees, the title was established. And Mrs. Vesey's group came to be called the Bas Bleu Society. There came Garrick and Walpole, and there, one evening, Johnson awed all with pontifical discourse. But the Queen of the Blues, as Johnson called her, was Elizabeth Robinson Montague. She was married to Edward Montague, grandson of the first Earl of Sandwich and relative of Edward Wortley Montague, husband of the volatile Lady Mary, whom we celebrated in pages gone by. Elizabeth was a wit, a scholar, an author. Her essay, The Writings and Genius of Shakespeare, from 1769, indignantly defended the national bard against the strictures of Voltaire. She was rich, and she could afford to entertain in style. She made the Chinese room in her Berkeley Square home the favorite center of London's intellect and beauty. There came Reynolds, Johnson, Burke, Goldsmith, Garrick, Horace Walpole, Fanny Burney, Hannah Moore. There artists met lawyers, prelates met philosophers, poets met ambassadors. Mrs. Montague's excellent cook put them all in good humor, but no liquor was served, and intoxication was taboo. She played Mycenas to budding authors and scattered bounty. Other London ladies, Mrs. Thrale, Mrs. Boscawen, Mrs. Monckton, opened their homes to talent and charm. London society became bisexual and began to rival Paris in the fame and genius of its salons. 2. English Morals 
In every society, said Adam Smith, where the distinction of ranks has once been completely established, there have always been two different schemes or systems of morality current at the same time, of which one may be called the strict or austere, the other the liberal, or if you will, the loose system. The former is generally admired and revered by the common people, the latter more esteemed and adopted by what are called people of fashion. John Wesley, who belonged to the austere class, described English morality in 1757 as a medley of smuggling, false oaths, political corruption, drunkenness, gambling, cheating in business, chicanery in the courts, servility in the clergy, worldliness among Quakers, and private embezzlement of charitable funds. It is an old refrain. Then, as now, sexual differentiation was far from complete. Some women tried to be men and almost succeeded. We hear of cases where women disguised themselves as men and maintained the deception till death. Some joined the army or navy as men, drank, smoked, and swore like men, fought in battle, and bore flogging manfully. Toward 1772, macaronis became prominent on London streets. They were young men who wore their hair in long curls, dressed in rich materials and striking colors, and wenched without passion. Selwyn described them as a kind of animal neither male nor female, but of the neuter gender. Homosexualism had its brothels, though homosexual acts, if detected and proved, were punishable with death. The double standard flourished. A thousand bordellos served to messant men, but those men branded female unchastity as a crime for which only death could atone. So the gentle goldsmith, When lovely woman stoops to folly, And finds too late that men betray, What charm can soothe her melancholy, What art can wash her guilt away? The only art her guilt to cover, To hide her shame from every eye, To give repentance to her lover, And wring his bosom, is to die. Early marriage was advised As a preventative of such calamities. The law allowed girls to marry at twelve, boys at fourteen. Most women of the educated classes married young and deferred their deviations, but then the double standard checked them. Here Johnson on adultery in 1768. Confusion of progeny constitutes the essence of the crime, and therefore the woman who breaks her marriage vows is much more criminal than a man who does it. A man, to be sure, is criminal in the sight of God, but he does not do his wife a very material injury if he does not insult her. If, for instance, from mere wantonness of appetite, he steals privately to her chambermaid. Sir, a wife ought not greatly to resent this. I would not receive home a daughter who would run away from her husband on that account. A wife should study to reclaim her husband by more attention to please him. Sir, a man will not, once in a hundred instances, leave his wife and go to a harlot, if his wife has not been negligent of pleasing. In Boswell's own circle, it was taken as quite ordinary that men should occasionally go to a prostitute. In the aristocracy, even in the royal family, adultery was widespread. The Duke of Grafton, while chief minister, lived openly with Nancy Parsons and took her to the opera in the face of the Queen. Divorce was rare. It could not be obtained except by act of Parliament and as this cost several thousand pounds, it was a luxury of the rich. Only 132 such grants were recorded in the years 1670 to 1800. It was generally supposed that the morals of the commonalty were better than those of the aristocracy, but Johnson thought otherwise in 1778. There is as much fornication and adultery amongst farmers as amongst noblemen, and so far as I have observed, the higher in rank the richer ladies are, they are the better instructed and the more virtuous. The literature of the day, as in Fielding and Burns, pictured the peasant as celebrating almost every weekend with a carouse, spending half his pay in taverns and some on tarts. Each class sinned according to its ways and means. The poor fought one another with fists and cudgels, the rich with pistols and swords. Dueling was a point of honor in the nobility. Fox fought Adam, Shelburne fought Fullerton, Pitt the Second fought Tierney. It was difficult to get through a titled life without at least one puncture. Many stories attest the sang froid of British gentlemen in these encounters. Lord Shelburne, having received a wound in the groin, assured his anxious seconds, I don't think Lady Shelburne will be the worse for it. 
Worse than the looseness of sexual morals was the brutality of industrial exploitation, the merciless consumption of human life in the grasp for profits, the use of children six years of age in factories or as chimney sweeps, the reduction of thousands of men and women to such destitution that they sold themselves into payless bondage for passage to America, the governmental protection of the slave trade as a precious source of England's wealth. From Liverpool, Bristol, and London, as from Holland and France, merchants sailed to Africa, bought and captured Negroes, shipped them to the West Indies, sold them there, and returned to Europe with lucrative cargoes of sugar, tobacco, or rum. By 1776, English traders had carried three million slaves to America, add 250,000 who died in passage and were thrown into the sea. The British government granted an annual subsidy of £10,000 to the African Company and its successor, the Regulated Company, toward the maintenance of their forts and posts in Africa, on the ground that they were the most beneficial to this island of all the companies that were ever formed by our merchants. George III, in 1770, forbade the governor of Virginia to assent to any law by which the importations of slaves should be in any respect prohibited or obstructed. In 1771, there were in England about 14,000 Negroes who had been brought in by their colonial masters or had escaped from them. Some were used as domestic servants with no right to wages. Some were sold at public auction, as in Liverpool in 1766. In 1772, however, an English court ruled that a slave automatically became a free man the moment he touched English soil. Slowly the conscience of England awoke to the contradiction between this traffic and the simplest dictates of religion or morality. The finest spirits in Britain denounced it. George Fox, Daniel Defoe, James Thompson, Richard Steele, Alexander Pope, William Paley, John Wesley, William Cooper, Francis Hutcheson, William Robertson, Adam Smith, Josiah Wedgwood, Horace Walpole, Samuel Johnson, Edmund Burke, Charles James Fox. The first organized opposition to slavery was by the Quakers in England and in America. In 1761 they excluded from their membership all persons engaged in the traffic. In 1783 they formed an association for the relief and liberation of the Negro slaves in the West Indies and for the discouragement of the slave trade on the coast of Africa. In 1787 Granville Sharp formed a committee to advance abolition. In 1789, William Wilberforce began his long campaign in the House of Commons to end the English trade in slaves. The merchants repeatedly persuaded the House to defer action. It was not till 1807 that Parliament enacted that no vessel should carry slaves from any port within the British dominions after May 1, 1807, or to any British colony after March 1, 1808. In political morality, England now touched nadir. The rotten borough system flourished, and the nabobs outbid all other purchasers. Franklin deplored the American war for a peculiar reason. Why did they not let me go on? If they, the colonies, had given me a fourth of the money they have spent on the war, we should have had our independence without spending a drop of blood. I would have bought all the Parliament, the whole government of Britain, Corruption ruled in the church, the universities, the judiciary, the civil service, the army and navy, and the councils of the king. Military discipline was more rigorous than in any other European country, with the possible exception of Prussia, and when the men were demobilized, nothing was done to ease their transition into a useful and law-abiding life. Social morality hovered between the essential good nature of the individual Englishman and the irresponsible brutality of mobs. Between 1765 and 1780, there were nine major riots, nearly all in London. We shall see an example presently. Crowds ran to a hanging as a holiday, and sometimes bribed the hangman to be especially thorough in flogging a prisoner. The penal code was the severest in Europe. Language in nearly all classes tended to violence and profanity. The press engaged in orgies of vituperation and calumny. Almost everyone gambled, if only in the national lottery, and almost everyone drank to excess. The faults of the English character were allied to its basic quality, a hearty, lusty vigor. 
This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 Continued Cassette 3, Side 2 The faults of the English character were allied to its basic quality, a hearty, lusty vigor. The peasant and the factory laborer expended it in toil. The nation showed it in every crisis but one. Out of that vigor came the voracious appetite, the high spirits, the resort to prostitutes, the brawls in the pubs and the duels in the park, the passion of parliamentary debate, the capacity for suffering silently, the proud claim of every Englishman that his home was his castle, not to be entered except by due process of law. When, in this age, England was defeated, it was by Englishmen who had transplanted to America the English passion for freedom. Madame du Deffon noted the diversity of individuals in the Englishmen whom she met, and most of whom she never saw. Each one, she said, is original. There are no two alike. We French are just the opposite. When you have seen one of our courtiers, you have seen all. And Horace Walpole agreed. It is certain that no other country produces so many singular and discriminate characters as England. Look at Reynolds's men. They agree only in their pride of country and class, their ruddy faces, their bold confronting of the world. It was a powerful breed. 3. Faith and Doubt the English masses remained faithful to their various forms of the Christian creed. The most widely read book next to the Bible was Nelson's Festivals and Fasts, a guide to the ecclesiastical year. Johnson's Prayers and Meditations, published after his death, went through four editions in four years. In the upper classes, religion was respected as a social function, an aid to morals and an arm of government, but it had lost private credence and all power over policy. The bishops were named by the king, and the parsons were appointees and dependents of the squires. The deistic attack on religion had so far subsided that Burke could ask in 1790, Who, born within the last forty years, has read one word of Collins and Toland and Tyndall and Chubb and Morgan, and that whole race who called themselves freethinkers? But if no one rose to answer him, it may be because those rebels had won the battle, and educated men shrugged off the old questions as settled and dead. Boswell, in 1765, forgetting the commonalty, described his time as an age when mankind are so fond of incredulity that they seem to pique themselves in contracting their circle of belief as much as possible. We have seen Selwyn mocking religion at Oxford and Wilkes at Medmenham Abbey. The younger Pitt, according to Lady Hester Stanhope, never went to church in his life, and one did not have to believe in order to preach. There are, Boswell wrote in 1763, many infidels in orders who, considering religion merely as a political institution, accept of a benefice as of any civil employment, and contribute their endeavors to keep up the useful delusion. The forms of orthodoxy, the articles of faith, said Gibbon, are subscribed with a sigh or a smile by the modern clergy. Private clubs offered relief from public conformity. Many aristocrats joined one or another of the Freemason lodges. These condemned atheism as stupid and required of their members a belief in God, but they inculcated toleration of differences in all other doctrines of religion. In the Lunar Society of Birmingham, manufacturers like Matthew Bolton, James Watt, and Josiah Wedgwood heard without horror the heresies of Joseph Priestley and Erasmus Darwin. Nevertheless, the furor of deism had passed, and nearly all freethinkers accepted a truce by which they would not interfere with the propagation of the faith if the Church allowed some latitude to sin. The English upper classes, with their sense of order and moderation, avoided the reckless radicalism of the French Enlightenment. They recognized the intimate union of religion and government, and were too economical to replace a supernatural morality with an infinitude of police. Since they were now servants of the state, the Anglican bishops, like the Catholic cardinals, thought themselves entitled to a measure of worldly enjoyment. Cooper satirized in bitter lines the clergymen who scrambled like politicians for richer or additional benefices, but many others led lives of quiet attention to their duties, and several were scholarly and able defenders of the faith. 
William Paley's Principles of Moral and Political Philosophy of 1785 displayed a generous spirit of doctrinal latitude and toleration, and his Evidences of Christianity of 1794 persuasively presented the argument from design. He welcomed into holy orders men of free-thinking tendencies so long as they preached the essentials of religion and served as moral leaders in their communities. Dissenters, Baptist. The faults of the English character were allied to its basic quality, a hearty, lusty vigor, Trinitarian Christianity. But no one could hold political or military office, or enter Oxford or Cambridge without accepting the Anglican Church and its thirty-nine articles. Methodism continued to spread among the lower classes. In 1784 it broke its tenuous ties with the established church, but meanwhile it had inspired the evangelical movement in a minority of Anglican clergymen. These men admired Wesley and agreed with him that the gospel, or evangel, should be preached precisely as handed down in the New Testament with no concessions to rationalist or textual criticism. England's memory of the gunpowder plot, the Great Rebellion, and the reign of James II still kept on the statute books the old laws against Roman Catholics. Most of these laws were no longer enforced, but many disabilities remained. Catholics could not legally buy or inherit land except through a subterfuge and payment of a double tax on their property. They were excluded from the army and navy, from the legal profession, from voting or standing for Parliament, and from all governmental posts. Even so, their number was growing. In 1781 they included seven peers, twenty-two baronets, a hundred and fifty gentlemen. Mass was celebrated in private homes, and only two or three arrests for this offence are recorded in the sixty years of George III's reign. In 1778 Sir George Saville offered Parliament a bill for Catholic relief legalizing the purchase and inheritance of land by Catholics, and allowing Catholics to enlist in the armed forces without renouncing their religion. The bill was passed and met with no serious opposition from the Anglican bishops in the House of Lords. It applied only to England, but in 1779 Lord North moved that it be extended to Scotland. When news of this proposal reached the Lowlands, riots broke out in Edinburgh and Glasgow in January 1779. Several houses inhabited by Catholics were burned to the ground. The shops of Catholic tradesmen were looted and wrecked. The houses of Protestants, like Robertson the historian, who expressed sympathy for the Catholics, were likewise attacked, and the outbreak ended only when Edinburgh magistrates announced that the Act for Catholic Relief would not be applied to Scotland. A Scottish member of Parliament, Lord George Gordon, took up the no-popery cause in England. On May 29, 1780, he presided over a meeting of the Protestant Association, which planned a mass march to present a petition for repeal of the Relief Act of 1778. On June 2nd, 60,000 men wearing blue cockades surrounded Parliament House. Many members were mauled on their way in. The carriages of Lords Mansfield, Thurlow, and Stormont were demolished. Some noble lords reached their seats wigless, disheveled, and trembling. Gordon and eight of his followers entered the House of Commons. They presented a petition, allegedly bearing 120,000 signatures, calling for repeal, and demanded immediate action as the sole alternative to invasion of the House by the mob. The members resisted. They sent for troops to check the crowd. They locked all doors. A relative of Gordon declared that he would kill him the moment any outsider forced his way into the chamber. Then the House voted to adjourn till June 6th. Troops arrived and cleared a way for the members to return to their homes. Two Catholic chapels, belonging to Sardinian and Bavarian ministers, were gutted, and their furniture made a bonfire in the streets. The crowd dispersed, but on June 5th rioters looted other foreign chapels and burned several private homes. On June 6th the mob regathered, broke into Nougat jail, freed the prisoners, captured an arsenal, and marched, armed, through the capital. Nobles barricaded themselves in their homes. Horace Walpole complimented himself on guarding a duchess in his garrison in Berkeley Square. On June 7th, more houses were looted and burned. Distilleries were entered, and thirst was freely quenched. Several rioters were cremated as they lay intoxicated in burning buildings. The London magistrates, who alone had legal authority over the municipal guard, refused to order them to fire upon the crowd. 
George III called out the citizen militia and bade them shoot whenever the mob used or threatened violence. Alderman John Wilkes earned forgiveness from the king and lost his popularity with the populace by mounting a horse and joining with the militia in attempting to disperse the assemblage. The militia, attacked by the rioters, fired upon them, killing twenty-two. The crowd fled. On June ninth, the riot flared again. Houses, whether of Catholics or of Protestants, were pillaged and burned, and firemen were prevented from extinguishing the flames. Troops suppressed the uprising at the cost of 285 men killed and 173 wounded. 135 rioters were arrested, 21 were hanged. Gordon was arrested in flight towards Scotland. He proved that he had taken no part in the riots. He was freed. Burke secured the approval of the Commons for reaffirmation of the Act for Catholic Relief in England. An Act of 1791 extended legal toleration to Catholic worship and education, but no Catholic church was to have a steeple or a bell. 4. Blackston, Bentham, and the Law A learned jurist thought the publication of Blackston's commentaries in some ways the most notable event in the history of the law. This is patriotic, but it serves to point the reverential awe with which English-speaking students, till our time, approached the commentaries on the laws of England, which William Blackstone published in four volumes and two thousand pages in 1765-69. to 69. Despite or because of its size, it was acclaimed as a monument of learning and wisdom. Every lord had it in his library, and George III took it to his heart as the apotheosis of kings. Blackstone was the son of a London tradesman rich enough to send him through Oxford and the Middle Temple to the practice of law. His lectures at Oxford, between 1753 and 63, reduced the contradictions and absurdities of the statutes to some order and logic, and expounded the result with clarity and charm. In 1761 he was elected to Parliament. In 1763 he was appointed Solicitor General to Queen Charlotte. In 1770 he began service as judge in the Court of Common Pleas. Addicted to study and hating locomotion, he sank into a gentle but premature decomposition and died in 1780 at the age of 57. His opus maximum had the virtues of his lectures, logical arrangement, lucid exposition, and a gracious style. Jeremy Bentham, his passionate opponent, praised him as the man who had taught jurisprudence to speak the language of the scholar and the gentleman, put polish on that rugged science, cleansed her from the dust and cobwebs of the office. Blackston defined law as a rule of action dictated by some superior being. He had an ideal and static conception of law as serving in a society the same function that the laws of nature served in the world. And he tended to think of the laws of England as rivaling the laws of gravitation in their majesty and eternity. He loved England and Christianity just as he found them, and would hardly admit any flaw in either. He was more orthodox than Bishop Warburton, and more royalist than George III. The King of England is not only the chief, but properly the sole magistrate of the nation. He may reject what bills, may make what treaties, may pardon what offenses he pleases, unless the Constitution hath expressly, or by evident consequence, laid down some exception or boundary. Blackstone placed the king above Parliament and above the law. The king is not only incapable of doing wrong, but even of thinking wrong. By which, however, Blackstone meant that there was no law above the king by which the king could be judged. But he warmed the pride of all England when he defined the absolute rights of every Englishman, the right of personal security, the right of personal liberty, and the right of private property. Blackstone's conception of English law as a system permanently valid because ultimately grounded on the Bible as the word of God eminently pleased his time, but it discouraged the growth of English jurisprudence and the reform of penology and prisons. It is to his credit, however, that he applauded the efforts of John Howard to ameliorate the conditions in British jails. Howard took Christianity not as a system of law, but as an appeal to the heart. Appointed sheriff at Bedford in 1773, he was appalled by conditions in the local prison. The jailer and his aides received no salary. They lived on fees exacted from the prisoners. No man was released after serving his term until he had paid all fees required of him. 
Many men remained incarcerated for months after the court had found them innocent. Traveling from county to county, Howard found similar abuses or worse. Defaulting debtors and first offenders were thrown in with hardened criminals. Most prisoners wore chains, heavy or light, according to the fee they paid. Each prisoner was allowed one or tuppence worth of bread daily. For additional food he had to pay or rely on relatives or friends. Three pints of water were allowed to each inmate daily for drinking and washing. No heat was provided in winter, and there was little ventilation in summer. The stench in these dungeons was so strong that it clung to Howard's clothes long after he emerged. Prison fever and other diseases killed many prisoners. Some died of slow starvation. At Newgate Jail in London, fifteen to twenty men lived in a room twenty-three by twenty-five feet. In 1774, Howard presented to Parliament his report on fifty prisons visited. The House of Commons passed an act requiring hygienic reforms in the jails, providing salaries for the jailers, and freeing all prisoners against whom the grand jury had failed to find a true bill. In 1775-76, to Howard visited continental prisons. He found those of Holland best equipped and relatively humane. Among the worst were those in Hanover, ruled by George III. The publication of Howard's book, The State of the Prisons in England and Wales, and an Account of Some Foreign Prisons, in 1777, stirred the sleeping conscience of the nation. Parliament voted funds for two penitentiary houses, in which an attempt was made to redeem prisoners by individual treatment, supervised labor, and religious instruction. Howard resumed his travels and reported his findings in new editions of his book. In 1789 he toured Russia. At Kherson he caught camp fever and died in 1790. His efforts for reform produced only modest results. The Act of 1774 was ignored by most jailers and justices. Descriptions of London prisons in 1804 and 1817 showed no improvement since Howard's time. Perhaps the condition of things had become worse instead of better. Reform had to wait for Dickens's account of the new Marshalsea prison in Little Dorrit, in 1855. Jeremy Bentham's diverse labors for reform in law, government, and education fall mostly after this period, but his fragment on government, from 1776, belongs here, as being principally a criticism of Blackstone. He scorned the jurist's worship of tradition. He pointed out that whatever now is established once was innovation. Present conservatism is reverence of past radicalism. Consequently, those who advocate reforms are quite as patriotic as those who tremble at the thought of change. Under a government of laws, what is the motto of a good citizen? To obey punctually, to censure freely. Bentham rejected Blackstone's view of royal sovereignty. A good government will distribute powers, encourage each of these to check the others, and allow freedom of the press, of peaceable assemblage and opposition. In the last resort, revolution may do less damage to the state than a dulling submission to tyranny. This little book was published in the year of the American Declaration of Independence. In the same essay, Bentham expounded that greatest happiness principle to which John Stuart Mill in 1863 gave the name utilitarianism. It is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. By this principle of utility, all moral and political proposals and practices should be judged, for the business of government is to promote the happiness of society. Bentham derived this principle of happiness from Elvesius, Hume, Priestley, and Beccaria, and his general viewpoint was formed from reading the Philosophe. In 1780 he wrote, and in 1789 he published, an introduction to the principles of morals and legislation giving a more detailed and philosophical exposition of his ideas. He reduced all conscious action to the desire for pleasure or the fear of pain, and he defined happiness as the enjoyment of pleasure, security from pain. This seemed to justify complete selfishness, but Bentham applied the happiness principle to individuals as well as states. Did the individual's action make for his greatest happiness? In the long run, he thought, the individual obtains most pleasure or least pain by being just to his fellow men. Bentham practiced what he preached, for he devoted his life to a long series of reform proposals, universal literate male adult suffrage, 
secret ballot, annual parliaments, free trade, public sanitation, the amelioration of prisons, the cleansing of the judiciary, the abolition of the House of Lords, the modernization and codification of the law in terms intelligible to laymen, and the extension of international law. Bentham invented this term. Many of these reforms were effected in the nineteenth century, largely through the efforts of utilitarians and philosophical radicals like James and John Stuart Mill, David Ricardo, and George Grote. Bentham was the last voice of the Enlightenment, the bridge between the liberating thought of the eighteenth century and the reforms of the nineteenth. Even more than the philosophe, he trusted to reason. He remained a bachelor to the end of his life, though he was one of the most lovable of men. When he died on June 6, 1832, aged 84, he willed that his body should be dissected in the presence of his friends. It was, and the skeleton is still preserved in University College London wearing Bentham's habitual dress. On the day after his death, the historic reform bill that embodied many of his proposals was signed by the King. 5. The Theatre 1. The Performance this second half of the eighteenth century was rich in theatre, poor in drama. It saw some of the finest actors in history, and produced only two dramatists whose works have escaped the reaper. Sheridan, whom we have already laid to rest, and Goldsmith, who will get a niche of his own under the rubric of literature. Perhaps the dearth of serious plays was cause and effect of the Shakespearean revival, which continued till the end of the century. The dramatists suffered from the tastes of the audience. There was much discussion of histrionic, little of dramatic technique and art. The author received, usually as his only material reward, the profits of the third performance, if this arrived. Some actors and actresses, however, became as rich as prime ministers. Hired clacks could damn a good play with hostile noise or make a worthless play an exciting success. A run of twenty nights in a season was attained only by the most favored dramas. Performances began at six or six-thirty, and ordinarily included a three-hour play and a farce or a pantomime. Seats cost one to five shillings. There were no reservations except by sending a servant to buy and hold a place till the master or lady came. All seats were backless benches. Some favored spectators sat on the stage until Garrick ended this abomination in 1764. All lighting was by candles in chandeliers, which remained lit throughout the program. Costumes, before 1782, were eighteenth-century English regardless of the play's time or place. Cato, Caesar, and Lear were shown in knee-breeches and wigs. Despite opposition by the clergy and the competition of opera and circuses, the theatre flourished, both in London and in the provinces. Bath, Bristol, Liverpool, Nottingham, Manchester, Birmingham, York, Edinburgh, and Dublin had good playhouses. Some had their own companies— and since the major companies went on tour, nearly every town saw good acting. London was kept on edge by the lively rivalry of two principal theatres. In 1750 both of these played Romeo and Juliet nightly for the same two weeks, with Spranger, Barry, and Susanna Sibber at Covent Garden, and Garrick and Miss Bellamy at Drury Lane. Samuel Foote had his own little theatre in the Haymarket, where he specialised in satirical mimicry— his imitations of Garrick were long a misery in David's life. Never had the English stage seen so many first-class performers. Charles Macklin opened the Great Age in 1741 with his productions of Shakespeare. He was the first actor to present Shylock as a serious character, though still as a merciless villain. Not till Henry Irving was Shylock interpreted with some sympathy. John Philip Kemble closed this century-long revival of Shakespeare— his supreme hours were when he and his sister Sarah played Macbeth at Drury Lane in 1785. Some memorable actresses now graced the stage. Peg Waffington was gifted with stirring beauty of figure and face, but she lived loosely, suffered a paralytic stroke in mid-play in 1757, and died prematurely old at forty-six in 1760. Kitty Clive stayed with Garrick's company twenty-two years— she astonished London by her exemplary morals. After quitting the stage in 1769, she lived sixteen years in a house that Horace Walpole gave her in Twickenham. Mrs. Hannah Pritchard was the foremost tragedienne before Mrs. Siddons surpassed her as Lady Macbeth. 
She absorbed her life in her acting, and it was said never read a book. Johnson called her an inspired idiot, but she outlasted many bells, acting till within a few months of her death. Mrs. Frances Abington starred as Beatrice, Portia, Ophelia, and Desdemona, but her most famous role was as Lady Teasel in The School for Scandal. Mary Robinson acquired her popular name Perdita from acting that part so well in A Winter's Tale. She served as mistress to the Prince of Wales and lesser lovers, and sat for Reynolds, Gainsborough, and Romney. The conscious goddess of the stage was Sarah Kemble Siddons. Born to a traveling actor in a hostelry in Wales in 1755, she married at eighteen the actor William Siddons, and starred at nineteen in Otway's Venice Preserved. Garrick engaged her a year later, but critics pronounced her powers not equal to a London stage. And Henry Woodward, who played comic parts for Garrick, advised her to go back to the country theatres for a while. She did, and for six years she played in provincial towns. Recalled to Drury Lane in 1782, she surprised everyone by her development as an actress. She was the first to adopt in her roles the dress of the period represented. Soon Garrick favored her for Shakespearean roles, and London marveled at the dignity and pathos with which she elevated the part of Lady Macbeth. Her private life won the respect and friendship of eminent contemporaries. Johnson wrote his name on the hem of her robe in Reynolds's picture of her as the tragic muse, and was struck by her great modesty and propriety when she called on him. Two of her brothers, one of her sisters, and two of her nieces continued the Kemble dynasty in the theatre till 1893. Through her and Garrick the social status of actors was raised, even in an England that made class distinctions the soul and machinery of government. 2. Garrick All who know of Johnson will recall that David Garrick was born in Litchfield in 1717, attended Johnson's school at Edial in 1736, and accompanied him in their historic migration to London in 1737. Seven years younger, he never won Johnson's full friendship, for the older man could not forgive David for being an actor and rich. On reaching London, Garrick joined his brother in importing and selling wine. This involved frequent visits to taverns. There he met actors. Their talk fascinated him. He followed some of them to Ipswich, where they let him take minor parts. He learned the histrionic art so rapidly that soon he undertook to play the lead in Richard III at an unlicensed theatre in Goodman's Fields in the East End of London. He relished that role because he was small, like the hunchback king, and because he enjoyed dying on the stage. His performance was so well received that he abandoned the vintner business to the shame and chagrin of his Litchfield relatives. But William Pitt the Elder came backstage to compliment him, and Alexander Pope, as crippled as Richard, said to another spectator, That young man never had his equal, and he will never have a rival. Here was an actor who poured all his body and soul into the part that he played, who became Richard III in face and voice and hands and broken frame and sly mind and evil aims, who did not cease to act his part when others spoke, and with difficulty forgot it when he left the stage. Soon he was the talk of theatre-going London. Aristocracy came to see him, lords dined with him. There are a dozen dukes a night at Goodman's Fields, wrote Thomas Gray. The Garricks of Litchfield proudly claimed David as their own. He tried Lear next on March 11, 1742. He failed. He was too active in his movements to portray an octogenarian, and he had not acquired the dignity for a king. The failure chastened him and proved invaluable. He gave up the part for a while, studied the play, practiced the facial expressions, the feeble gait, the ailing vision, the shrill and plaintive tones of the unhappy Lear. In April he tried again. He was transformed. The audience wept and cheered. Garrick had created another of the roles that for almost a century would recall his name. Everybody applauded but Johnson, who decried acting as mere pantomime, and Horace Walpole, who thought Garrick's expressiveness excessive, and Gray, who mourned the fall from classic restraint to romantic emotionalism and sentiment. Scholars complained that Garrick played not an unadulterated Shakespeare, but versions revised and bowdlerized, sometimes by Garrick himself. Half the lines of his Richard III were written by Colley Cibber, and the last act of his Hamlet was changed to provide a tender finale. 
In that season, 1741-42, to 42, Garrick offered 18 roles, a feat suggesting almost incredible powers of memory and attention. When he performed, the theatre was filled. When he was not filled, it was half empty. The licensed theatres suffered reduced attendance. By some backstage politics, the playhouse in Goodman's Fields was forced to close. Garrick, lost without a stage, signed a contract with the Drury Lane Theatre for 1742-43 to 43, at 500 pounds, a record salary for an actor. Meanwhile, he left for a spring season in Dublin. Handel had just captured that city with his Messiah on April 13, 1742. Now Garrick and Peg Waffington conquered it with Shakespeare. When they returned to London, they set up housekeeping together, and Garrick bought a wedding ring. But she resented his parsimony and he her extravagance. He began to wonder what kind of wife would emerge from Peg's miscellaneous past. He kept the ring, and they parted in 1744. His acting at Drury Lane marked an era in the art. He gave to each role all the force of his energy, and constant care that every motion of his body, every inflection of his voice, should be in character. He made the alarm and terror of Macbeth so vivid that this, more than any other of his roles, remained in the public memory. He replaced the declamation of older tragedians with a more natural speech. He achieved a sensitivity of facial expressions that varied with the slightest change of thought or mood in the text. Years later, Johnson remarked, David looks much older than he is, for his face has had double the business of any other man's. It is never at rest. And there was his versatility. He played comic parts with almost all the care and finish that he had given to his Macbeth or Hamlet or Lear. After five seasons as an actor, Garrick signed, on April 9, 1747, a contract to divide the management of Drury Lane with James Lacey. Lacey to take charge of business affairs, Garrick to choose the plays and the actors and direct the rehearsals. During his twenty-nine years as manager, he produced seventy-five different plays, wrote one himself, in collaboration with George Coleman, revised twenty-four of Shakespeare's dramas, composed a great number of prologues, epilogues, and farces, and wrote for the press anonymous articles promoting and praising his work. He appreciated money and tempered his choice of plays to the greatest happiness of the greatest paying number. He loved applause, as actors and writers must, and he arranged parts to get most of it. His actors thought him tyrannical and stingy and complained that he underpaid them while he was becoming rich. He established order and discipline among jealous and hypersensitive individuals, each of whom verged or brooded on genius. They grumbled, but they were glad to stay, for no other company weathered so well the winds of fortune and the tides of taste. In 1749, Garrick married Ava Maria Weigel, a Viennese dancer who had come to England as Mademoiselle Violette, and had earned plaudits for her performances in opera ballets. She was and remained a pious Catholic. Garrick smiled at her belief in the story of St. Ursula and the Eleven Thousand Virgins, but he respected her faith since she lived up to its moral code. She did much by her devotion to ease the strain of an actor-manager's life. He lavished his wealth upon her, took her on continental tours, and bought for her an expensive home in Hampton Village. There, and in his London house on Adelphi Terrace, he entertained sumptuously, and many lords and distinguished foreigners were happy to be his guests. There he romped with Fanny Burney and sheltered Hannah Moore. In 1763 he gave up acting except for special occasions. Now, he said, I will sit down and read Shakespeare. In 1768 he suggested, planned, and supervised the first Shakespeare festival at Stratford-on-Avon. He continued to manage Drury Lane, but found the tempers and quarrels of the actors ever harder on his aging nerves. Early in 1776 he sold his share of the partnership to Richard Brinsley Sheridan, and on March 7th he announced that he would soon retire. For three months thereafter he gave farewell performances of his favorite roles, and enjoyed such a succession of triumphs as probably no other actor in history has ever known. His departure from the stage caused as much talk in London as the war with America. On June 10, 1776, he closed his theatrical career with a benefit for the Decayed Actors Fund. He survived three years more. He died on January 20, 1779, aged 62, 
On February 1st, his corpse was borne to Westminster Abbey by members of Britain's highest nobility and was deposited in the poet's corner at the foot of Shakespeare's monument. 6. London Johnson's first view of London in 1737 was one of virtuous horror. Here malice, rapine, accident, conspire, and now a rabble rages, now a fire. There ambush here relentless ruffians lay, and here the fell attorney prowls for prey. Here falling houses thunder on your head, and here a female atheist talks you dead. Referring possibly to Lady Mary Wortley Montague. These, of course, were but some aspects of London, chosen to feed the rage of unplaced youth. Three years later, Johnson described London as a city famous for wealth and commerce and plenty, and for every other kind of civility and politeness, but which abounds with such heaps of filth as a savage would look on with amazement. The civic authorities at that time left street cleaning to the citizen, who was commanded to keep in neat repair the pavement, or earth, before his house. In 1762, the Westminster Paving Acts arranged for municipal cleaning of streets, collection of rubbish, paving and repair of main thoroughfares, and establishment of an underground sewerage system. Soon other sections of London followed suit. Elevated footpaths protected pedestrians, and gutters drained the streets. New streets were laid out in straight lines, houses were built more durably, and the venerable metropolis effused a more genteel odor. There was no public fire department, but insurance companies maintained private hose brigades to limit their losses. Coal dust and fog sometimes collaborated to blanket the city with a pall so thick that one could not tell friend from foe. When the sky was visible, certain streets were bright with colorful shops. On the Strand, the largest and richest stores in Europe displayed behind their windows the products of half the world. Not far away were a thousand shops of a hundred crafts, and here and there were potteries, glass factories, smithies, breweries. The noises of artisans and tradesmen, of carriages and horses, of hawkers and street singers, contributed to the din and sense of life. If one wished a quieter scene and cleaner air, he could saunter in St. James's Park, or watch fascinating ladies swing their spreading skirts and show their silken shoes on the mall. In the morning one could buy fresh milk from maids who milked cows on the park green. In the evening he might prowl, like Boswell, for a fille de joie, or wait for the night to cover a multitude of sins. Farther west one could ride or drive in Hyde Park, and there were the great amusement resorts, Vauxhall with its colorful crowds, its acres of gardens and arbored walks, and Ranelagh with its spacious tiered rotunda, where Mozart performed when a child of eight. The poor had alehouses, the middle and upper classes had clubs, and there were taverns for all. There was the Boar's Head and the Mitre, where the great cham supped, and the Globe, dear to Goldsmith, and the Devil's Tavern, which had entertained famous figures from Johnson to Johnson. There were two Turk's Heads, one a coffee shop on the Strand, the other a tavern in Gerard Street, which became the home of THE Club. Women, as well as men, came to taverns, and some were for sale. In clubs like White's or All Knacks, which became Brooks's, the well-to-do could drink and gamble in select privacy, and there were the theatres, with all the excitement of their competition and the radiance of their stars. Near the theatres were brothels. Preachers complained that to the said plays and interludes great numbers of mean, idle, and disorderly people do commonly resort, and after the performance is over, from thence they go to bawdy houses. Nearly all classes who could afford it patronized prostitutes, and agreed in condoning the habit as unavoidable in the current state of male development. There were some colored courtesans who drew customers even from the nobility. Boswell describes Lord Pembroke as exhausted after a night in a black body house. Slums continued. In the lower orders it was not unusual for a family to live in one room of a tenement. The very poor lived in damp, unheated cellars, or in garrets with leaky roofs. Some slept on bunks or in doorways or under booths. Johnson told Miss Reynolds that, as he returned to his lodgings about one or two o'clock in the morning, he often saw poor children asleep on thresholds and stalls, and that he used to put pennies into their hands to buy them a breakfast. A magistrate informed Johnson that in any week over twenty Londoners died of starvation. Now and then epidemics ran through the city. 
Even so, its population rose from 674,000 in 1700 to 900,000 in 1800, presumably due to immigration by landless peasants and to the growth of commerce and industry. The Thames and its docks were crowded with merchantmen and their cargoes. The whole surface of the Thames, wrote a contemporary, is covered with small vessels, barges, boats, and wherries, passing to and fro, and below the three bridges such a forest of masts for miles together that you would think all the ships of the universe were here assembled. Two new bridges were added in this period, Blackfriars and Battersea. Canaletto, coming to London from Venice in 1746 and 1751, painted magnificent views of city and river. Prints from these vedute enabled educated Europeans to realize how London had grown to be the chief port of the Christian world. Never since ancient Rome, excepting Constantinople, had history known so vast and rich and complex a city. In St. James's Palace, the king and queen and their attendants, the court and its ceremonies. In the churches, fat prelates mumbling hypnotic formulas and humble worshippers resting from reality and begging divine aid. In Parliament House, the lords and the commons played the game of politics with souls as their pawns. In Mansion House, the Lord Mayor and his liveried aides laying down ordinances about chapels and brothels and wondering how to control the next epidemic or mob. In the barracks, soldiers gaming, wenching, and profaning the air. In the shops, the tailors curving their spines, plumbers inhaling lead, jewelers, watchmakers, cobblers, hairdressers, vintners, hurrying to meet the demands of ladies and gentlemen. In Grub Street or Fleet Street, the hack writers puffing up clients, tumbling ministries, challenging the king. In the prisons, men and women dying of infection or graduating to greater crimes. In the tenements and cellars, the hungry, the unfortunate, and the defeated multiplying their like eagerly and forever. With all this, both Johnson and his biographer loved London. Boswell admired the liberty and the whims and curious characters, the immense crowd and hurry and bustle of business and diversion, the great number of public places of entertainment, the noble churches and the superb buildings, the satisfaction of pursuing whatever plan is most agreeable without being known or looked at, the protective, erosive anonymity of the crowd. And Johnson, relishing and deepening the full flow of London talk, settled the matter with one authoritative line. When a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. Chapter 30 The Age of Reynolds, 1756-1790 1. The Musicians This England loved great music, but could not produce it. Appreciation abounded. In Zoffany's picture, The Cooper and Gore Families, we see the part that music played in cultivated homes. We hear of the hundreds of singers and performers that were brought together for the Handel Commemoration Concert in 1784. The Morning Chronicle of December 30, 1790, announced for the ensuing months a series of professional concerts, another of ancient concerts, ladies' subscription concerts for Sunday evenings, oratorios twice a week, and six symphony concerts to be conducted by the composer himself, Joseph Haydn. This rivaled the musical wealth of London today. Just as Venice made choirs from orphans, so the charity children of St. Paul's Cathedral gave annual performances, of which Haydn wrote, No music has ever moved me so much in my life. Concerts and light operas were presented in the Ranala Rotunda and the Marlebon Gardens. A dozen societies of amateur musicians gave public performances. The English predilection for music was so widely known that a score of virtuosos and composers came to the island. Geminiani... Mozart, Haydn, Johann Christian Bach, and Bach remained. The taste for serious opera declined in England after Handel's surfeit. Some enthusiasm returned when Giovanni Manzuoli opened the 1764 season in Ezio. Bernie described his voice as the most powerful and voluminous soprano that has been heard on our stage since Farinelli. This was apparently the last triumph of Italian opera in England in that century. When the Italian Opera House in London was burned down in 1789, Horace Walpole rejoiced and hoped it would never be rebuilt. If there were now no memorable British composers, there were two eminent historians of music, 
whose works appeared in the same year, 1776, the Annus Mirabile of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and the wealth of nations, not to speak of the American Declaration of Independence. This book is continued on Cassette 4, Side 1. Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 Continued Cassette 4, Side 1 If there were now no memorable British composers, there were two eminent historians of music, whose works appeared in the same year, 1776, the Annus Mirabile of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire and the Wealth of Nations, not to speak of the American Declaration of Independence, Sir John Hawkins's five-volume General History of the Science and Practice of Music was a work of careful scholarship, and though he himself, attorney and magistrate, was not a musician, his appraisals have stood well amid the flux of critical opinion. Charles Burney was organist at St. Paul's and the most sought-for musical teacher in England. His handsome face and amiable personality, added to his accomplishments, won him the friendship of Johnson, Garrick, Burke, Sheridan, Gibbon, and Reynolds, who made an attractive portrait of him gratis. He traveled through France, Germany, Austria, and Italy to get materials for his general history of music, and spoke with first-hand knowledge of the leading composers who were then alive. About 1780 he reported that old musicians complain of the extravagance of the young, and these again of the dryness and inelegance of the old. 2. The Architects English builders now offered a lively contest between Gothic and classical revivals. The grandeur of the old cathedrals, the vestigial splendor of stained glass, the ivied ruins of medieval abbeys in Britain, stirred the imagination to idealize the Middle Ages, and fell in with the developing romantic reaction against classic couplets, cold columns, and oppressive pediments. Horace Walpole engaged a succession of second-rate architects to rebuild his Strawberry Hill at Twickenham in Gothic form and ornament, between 1748 and 1773. He gave years of finical care to make his home the very palladium of the anti-palladian style. Year after year he added rooms until there were twenty-two. One, the gallery, housing his art collections, was fifty-six feet long. Too often he used lath and plaster instead of stone. Even a first glance reveals a fragility forgivable in interior decoration, but unpardonable in external structure. Selwyn called Strawberry Hill gingerbread gothic, and another wit reckoned that Walpole had outlived three sets of crenellated battlements, which had to be repeatedly restored. Despite these experiments, Palladio and Vitruvius remained the tutelar deities of English architecture in the second as in the first half of the eighteenth century. The classic spirit was reinforced by the excavations at Herculaneum and Pompeii, and it was spread by descriptions of classic ruins in Athens, Palmyra, and Baalbek. Sir William Chambers defended the Palladian view in his Treatise on Civil Architecture in 1759, and added example to precept by rebuilding Somerset House, between 1776 and 86, with a vast façade of Renaissance windows and Corinthian porticos. A remarkable family of four brothers, John, Robert, James, and William Adam, came out of Scotland to dominate English architecture in this half-century. Robert left the strongest impression upon his time. After studying in the University of Edinburgh, he spent three years in Italy, where he met Piranesi and Winkelmann, noting that the private palaces praised by Vitruvius had disappeared from the Roman scene, and learning that one remained relatively intact, the Palace of Diocletian at Spalato, now split in Yugoslavia, he made his way to that ancient Dalmatian capital, spent five weeks making measurements and drawings, was arrested as a spy, was freed, wrote a book about his researches, and came back to England resolved to use Roman styles in British building. In 1768 he and his brothers leased for ninety-nine years a tract of sloping land between the Strand and the Thames, and erected on it the famous Adelphi Terrace, a district of fine streets and handsome houses, 
on an embankment supported by massive Roman arches and vaults. Here some dramatic notables lived, from Garrick to Bernard Shaw. Robert designed also some famous mansions, like Butte's Luton Who, that is, house at Luton, thirty miles north of London. This, said Johnson, is one of the places I do not regret having come to see. And he was hard to please. By and large, the classic orders won the battle against the Gothic revival. Many of the great palaces of this age, like Carlton House in London and Harewood House in Yorkshire, were in the neoclassic style. Walpole did not live to see Gothic return in triumph and splendor in the Houses of Parliament, 1840-1860. 3. Wedgwood The Adam brothers were not content with designing buildings and interiors. They built some of the loveliest furniture of the time. But the great name here is Thomas Chippendale. In 1754, at the age of 36, he published The Gentleman and Cabinet Maker's Director, which was to the art of furniture what Reynolds's discourses were to painting. His characteristic products were chairs with slim ribbon backs and charming legs. But also he delighted the lords and ladies of George III's reign with cabinets, writing tables, commodes, bookcases, mirrors, tables, and four-poster beds all elegant, mostly novel, generally frail. The frailty continued in the work of Chippendale's rival, George Hepplewhite, and their successor, Thomas Sheraton. They seemed converted to Burke's theory that in art, as in life, beauty must be frail. Sheraton carried lightness and grace to their apex. He specialized in satin wood and other beautifully grained products. He polished them patiently, painted them delicately, and sometimes inlaid them with metal ornaments. In his Cabinet Dictionary of 1802, he listed 252 master cabinet makers working in or near London. The upper classes in England now rivaled the French in the refinement of their furniture and interior appointments. They were giving a lead to the French in designing gardens and parks. Lancelot Brown earned the nickname Capability, because he was so quick to see the capabilities offered by his client's grounds for fantastic and expensive designs. In this spirit he laid out gardens at Blenheim and Kew. The fashion in gardens ran now to the exotic, unexpected, or picturesque. Miniature Gothic temples and Chinese pagodas were used as outdoor ornaments. Sir William Chambers, in decorating the Kew Gardens from 1757 to 62, introduced Gothic shrines, Moorish mosques, and Chinese pagodas. Funerary urns were favorite garden glories, sometimes holding the ashes of departed friends. The ceramic arts had an almost revolutionary development. England was producing glass as fine as any in Europe. The Chelsea and Derby potteries turned out delightful figures in porcelain, usually in the style of Sevres but the busiest ceramic centre was the Five Towns in Staffordshire, chiefly Burslem and Stoke-on-Trent. Before Josiah Wedgwood, the industry was poor in methods and earnings. The potters were coarse and letterless. When Wesley first preached to them, they pelted him with mud. Their houses were huts, and their market was restricted by impassable roads. In 1755, a rich deposit of kaolin, hard white clay like that used by the Chinese, was discovered in Cornwall, but that was two hundred miles from the five towns. Wedgwood began at the age of nine, in 1739, to work at the potter's wheel. He received little schooling, but he read much, and his study of Caelus's Requis des Antiquités Égyptiennes, Etrusques, Grec, Romaine et Galoise, 1752-67, inspired him with ambition to reproduce and rival classic ceramic forms. In 1753 he started his own business at the Ivy House Works, and built around it near Burslem a town which he called Etruria. He attacked with the energy of a warrior and the vision of a statesman the conditions that hampered the industry. He arranged better transport for the kaolin of Cornwall to his factories. He campaigned and helped to pay for the improvement of roads and the building of canals. He was resolved to open avenues from the five towns to the world. Heretofore, the English market for fine pottery had been dominated by Meissen, Delft, and Sevres. 
Wedgwood captured the domestic, then much of the foreign trade. By 1763 his potteries were annually exporting 550,000 pieces to the continent and North America. Catherine the Great ordered a dinner set of a thousand pieces. By 1785 the Staffordshire potteries were employing 15,000 workers. Wedgwood introduced specialization of labor, established factory discipline, paid good wages, built schools and libraries. He insisted on good workmanship. An early biographer describes him as stamping about his shops on his wooden leg and breaking with his own hand any pot that showed the least flaw. Usually in such cases he chalked on the careless artisan's bench the warning, This won't do for Josiah Wedgwood. He developed precision tools and bought steam engines to power his machines. As a result of his large-scale production of commercial pottery, pewter went out of general use in England. His output ranged from earthenware pipes for London drains to the most exquisite vessels for Queen Charlotte. He divided his offerings between useful and ornamental. For the latter, he frankly imitated classic models, as in his luxurious agate vases. But also he developed original forms, especially the famous jasper ware with Greek figures delicately embossed in white on a base of blue. His interest and enthusiasm ranged far beyond pottery. In experiments to find more satisfactory mixtures of earth and chemicals, and better methods of firing, he invented a pyrometer for measuring high temperatures. This and other researches won him entry into the Royal Society in 1783. He was an early member of the Society for the Abolition of Slavery. He designed and made the seal. He campaigned for universal male suffrage and parliamentary reform. He supported the American colonies from the beginning to the end of their revolt. He hailed the French Revolution as promising a happier and more prosperous France. He had the good sense to employ John Flaxman to provide new and refined designs for his pottery. From this work, Flaxman went on to illustrate Homer, Aeschylus, and Dante with drawings based on the art of the Greek vase painters. They are admirable in line, but lacking body and color, they are as attractive as a woman without flesh. Something of this cold quality was carried into Flaxman's sculpture, as in his monument to Nelson in St. Paul's. But in the marble Cupid and Marpessa, he achieved full-blooded forms in one of the best imitations of classic statuary. Funerary monuments became his specialty. He raised them to Chatterton at Bristol, to Reynolds in St. Paul's, to Paoli in Westminster Abbey. He served in England the same role as Canova in Italy the neoclassic attempt to recapture the smooth and voluptuous grace of Praxiteles. We find less beauty but more life in the portrait busts that Joseph Nollikens made of famous Englishmen. Born in London of Flemish parents, he studied there till he was twenty-three, then went to Rome. He lived and worked there for ten years, selling real and counterfeit antiques. Returning to England, he made so successful a bust of George III that he was soon in general demand. Stern, Garrick, Fox, Pitt II, and Johnson sat for him, sometimes to their sorrow, for Nollikens carved no compliments. Johnson grumbled that the sculptor had made him look as if he had taken physic. It was an age of popular engravers. The public was intensely interested in the powerful personalities that trod the political and other stages. Prints of their figures and faces were scattered throughout England. James Gilray's caricatures were almost as lethal as the letters of Junius. Fox confessed that such drawings did him more mischief than the debates in Parliament. Thomas Rowlandson caricatured men as beasts, but also he drew pleasant landscapes, and he amused several generations with his tours of Dr. Syntax. Paul Sandby and Edmund Dare developed watercolor to almost finished excellence. Britons returning from the Grand Tour brought back prints, engravings, paintings, and other works of art. The appreciation of art spread. Artists multiplied, raised their heads, their fees, and their status. Some were knighted. The Society for the Encouragement of Art, Manufacture, and Commerce, in 1754, gave good sums in prizes to native artists and presented exhibitions. The British Museum opened its collections in 1759. In 1761, a separate Society of Arts began annual displays. Soon it divided into conservatives and innovators. The Conservatives formed the Royal Academy of London, 
with a charter and five thousand pounds from George the Third, and made Joshua Reynolds its president for twenty-three years. The great age of English painting began. Four, Joshua Reynolds. Richard Wilson led the way. Son of a Welsh clergyman, he came to London at fifteen and made a living by painting portraits. In seventeen forty nine, he went to Italy. There and in France, he absorbed the heritage of Nicolas Poussin and Claude Lorrain, and learned to value historical and landscape painting above portraiture. Back in England, he painted landscapes luminous with atmosphere, but cluttered with gods, goddesses, and other classic ruins. Especially beautiful is the Thames at Twickenham, which catches the spirit of an English summer day, bathers lolling, trees and sailboats hardly moved by the quiet breeze. But the English would not buy landscapes. They wanted portraits to preserve their faces in their prime. Wilson persisted. He lived in poverty in a half-furnished room in Tottenham Court Road and sweetened his bitterness with alcohol. In 1776, the Royal Academy rescued him by making him its librarian. The death of a brother left him a small property in Wales. He spent his final years there in such obscurity that no journal mentioned his death in 1782. By contrast, the career of Reynolds was a lifelong pageant of honors and prosperity. He was fortunate in being born in 1723 to a Devonshire clergyman who kept a Latin school and loved books. Among these, Joshua found an essay on the whole art of painting from 1719 by Jonathan Richardson. This inflamed him with a desire to be a painter, and his sympathetic parents indulged his choice. They sent him to London to study with Thomas Hudson, a Devon man who had married Richardson's daughter and was then the most courted portrait painter in England. In 1746 the father died, and the young artist set up house with his two sisters in what is now Plymouth. In that famous port he met sailors and commanders, painted their portraits, and made precious friendships. When Captain Augustus Keppel was commissioned to take gifts to the day of Algiers, he offered Joshua free passage to Menorca, for he knew that the youth longed to study in Italy. From Menorca, Reynolds made his way to Rome in 1750. He remained in Italy three years, painting and copying. He labored to discover the methods used by Michelangelo and Raphael in achieving line, color, light, shade, texture, depth, expression and mood. He paid a price, for while copying Raphael in some unheated rooms of the Vatican, he caught a cold that apparently damaged his inner ear. Passing to Venice, he studied Titian, Tintoretto, and Veronese, and learned how to endow any sitter with the dignity of a doge. On his way home, he stopped for a month in Paris, but he found contemporary French painting too feminine for his taste. After a month in Devon, he established himself with his sister Frances in London in 1753, and remained there for the rest of his life. Almost at once he caught attention with another portrait of Captain Keppel, handsome, eager, masterful. Here the Van Dyke tradition was restored to make portraits as resplendent images of aristocracy. Within two years Reynolds had received 120 sitters and was recognized as the finest painter in England. His facility was his limitation. He became so absorbed and expert in portraiture that he lacked the time and skill for historical, mythological, or religious pictures. He did well a few, like the Holy Family and the Three Graces, but his inspiration was not in them, nor did his patrons want such pictures. They were nearly all Protestants who discountenanced religious paintings as encouraging idolatry. They loved nature, but as an adjunct to their personalities or their hunts. They wished to see themselves ageless on their walls, impressing themselves upon posterity. So they came to Reynolds, two thousand of them, and they sent him their wives and children, sometimes their dogs. None went away grieved, for Reynolds's amiable imagination could always supply what nature had failed to give. Never has a generation or a class been so fully preserved as in Reynolds's 630 surviving portraits. Here are the statesmen of that lusty age— Butte in a splendor of color, Burke rather somber for thirty-eight, Fox pot-bellied, wistful, and noble at forty-four. Here are the writers, Walpole, Stern, Goldsmith, looking really like poor Paul, Gibbon with those fat cheeks, 
which the Marquise de Defont, who could see only with her hands, mistook for the sitting part of a child, and Boswell, as proud as if he had created Johnson, and Johnson himself, lovingly painted five times, and sitting in 1772 for the best known of Reynolds's portraits of men. Here are the deities of the stage. Garrick, torn between the rival muses of tragedy and comedy, Mary Robinson as Perdita, Mrs. Abington as the comic muse, and Sarah Siddons as the tragic muse. An enthusiast paid Reynolds seven hundred guineas, or about eighteen thousand two hundred dollars, for this proud masterpiece. Most numerous in this incomparable gallery are the aristocrats who gave social order to an individualistic people, triumphant strategy to foreign policy, and a controlling constitution to the king. See them first in their handsome youth, like twelve-year-old Thomas Lister, a picture which, as Reynolds's brown boy, challenges the blue boy of Gainsborough. Many of them swelled in the girth when their dangerous days were over, like that same Augustus Keppel who had been so presentable as a captain in 1753, but was so fulfilled as an admiral in 1780. Despite such rotundities and the silk and lace of their investiture, Reynolds succeeded in transforming intangible courage and pride into color and line. Take as example the powerful form and personality of Lord Heathfield, bold in British red and holding the key to Gibraltar, which he had invincibly defended against a four-year siege by the Spanish and the French. And so we come to those D.I. Hinaikon, goddesses among women, whom Reynolds found in the wives and daughters of the British aristocracy. Unmarried, he was free to love all of them with his eyes and brush, to straighten their noses, refine their features, arrange their luxuriant hair, and transfigure them with such fluffy, flowing raiment as would make Venus long to be clothed. See Lady Elizabeth Keppel, Marchioness of Tavistock, wearing the courtly robes she had worn years ago as bridesmaid to Queen Charlotte. What would she be without those folds of painted silk enveloping legs that, after all, could not be much different from Xanthippe's? Sometimes Reynolds tried what he could do with a woman in simple garb. He pictured Mary Bruce, Duchess of Richmond, dressed in a common cloak and sewing a pattern into a cushion. This is a face that could haunt a philosopher's dreams. Almost as simple in dress and seraphic in profile is Mrs. Bouverie listening to Mrs. Crewe. There was a still profounder beauty in the quiet and gentle face of Emma Gilbert, Countess of Mount Edgecombe. This lovely portrait was destroyed by enemy action in the Second World War. Nearly all these women had children, for part of their aristocratic obligation was to maintain the family and the property in undivided continuity. So Reynolds painted Lady Elizabeth Spencer, Countess of Pembroke, with her six-year-old son, Lord Herbert-to-be, and Mrs. Edward Bouverie with her three-year-old Georgiana, and this daughter, become Duchess of Devonshire, the gay beauty who with kisses bought votes for Fox in his campaign for Parliament, with her three-year-old daughter, another Georgiana, the future Countess of Carlisle. Finally, and perhaps the most attractive of all, the children themselves, a full gallery of them, nearly all individualized as unduplicable souls, and sympathetically understood in the insecurity and wonderment of youth. The world knows Reynolds's masterpiece in this sector, The Age of Innocence, which he painted in 1788, in the last years of his vision. But how soon his understanding of childhood reached an almost mystic intuition can be seen in his indescribably beautiful portrait of Lord Robert Spencer, aged eleven, painted in 1758. Thereafter he painted them at every age. At age one, Princess Sophia Matilda, at two years, Master Wynne with his lamb. At three, Miss Bowles with her dog. At four, Master Crewe in a perfect imitation of Henry the Eighth, and about the same age, the Strawberry Girl. At five, the Brummel boys, William and George, Beau Brummel to be. At six, Prince William Frederick. At seven, Lord George Conway. At eight, Lady Caroline Howard. At nine, Frederick, Earl of Carlisle. And so on to youth and marriage and children. Reynolds admitted that he preferred titled sitters. The slow progression of things naturally makes elegance and refinement the last effect of opulence and power. 
and only the rich could pay the three hundred pounds that he asked for a whole length with two children. In any case, he had struck gold, and soon earned sixteen thousand pounds a year. In 1760, he bought a house at 17 Leicester Square, then the most select quarter of London. He furnished it luxuriously, collected old masters, and took for his studio a chamber as large as a ballroom. He had his own coach with painted panels and gilded wheels. He asked his sister to drive in it about town, for he believed that such an advertisement of prosperity would bring more. In 1761 he was knighted. He was received everywhere and himself played host to genius, beauty, and class. He had more literary men at his table than any other man in England. To him Goldsmith dedicated the deserted village and Boswell the life of Samuel Johnson. It was Reynolds who in 1764 founded The Club to give Johnson a forum of his peers. He must have loved Johnson. He made so many portraits of him. He made even more of himself. He was not blessed with good looks. His face was florid and scarred by childhood smallpox. His features were blunt. His upper lip had been disfigured by a fall in Menorca. At thirty he pictured himself shading his eyes and trying to pierce a maze of light and shade to catch the soul behind a face. He painted himself at fifty in his doctoral robes, for Oxford had just made him a doctor of civil law. Finest of the series is the portrait in the National Gallery, about 1775. His face is now more refined, but his hair is grey and his hand is cupped to his ear, for he was going deaf. When the Royal Academy of Arts was founded in 1768, Reynolds was by common consent made its president. For fifteen years he opened its seasons with a discourse to the students. Boswell was among the friends who sat in the front row at the first discourse, on January 2, 1769. Many who heard these addresses were surprised at their literary excellence. Some thought that Burke or Johnson had written them, but Sir Joshua had learned much from his associations and had developed a style as well as a mind of his own. Naturally, as an academician, he stressed the importance of study. He deprecated the notion that genius may dispense with schooling and hard work. He derided this phantom of inspiration— and insisted that labor is the only price of solid fame. Furthermore, every opportunity should be taken to discountenance that false and vulgar opinion that rules are the fetters of genius. There should be three stages in the normal development of an artist. First, tutelage, learning the rules, draftsmanship, coloring, modeling. Second, studying those masters who have received the approbation of time. Through such studies, Those perfections which lie scattered among various masters are now united in one general idea, which is henceforth to regulate the student's taste and enlarge his imagination. The third and last period emancipates the student from subjection to any authority but what he should himself judge to be supported by reason. Only then should he innovate. Having well established his judgment and stored his memory, he may now without fear try the power of his imagination. The mind that has been thus disciplined may be indulged in the wildest enthusiasm and venture to play on the borders of the wildest extravagance. Hogarth had rejected the old masters as black masters and had advised a realistic portrayal of nature. Reynolds thought that this should be merely a preparation for a more idealistic art. Nature herself is not to be too closely copied. The wish of the genuine painter must be more extensive. Instead of endeavoring to amuse mankind with the minute neatness of his imitations, he must endeavor to improve them by the grandeur of his ideas. He must strive for fame by captivating the imagination. Everything in nature is imperfect from the standpoint of beauty, has in it some blemish or defect. The artist learns to eliminate these from his creations. He combines in one ideal the excellences of many deficient forms. He corrects nature by herself, her imperfect state by her more perfect. This idea of the perfect state of nature, which the artist calls the ideal beauty, is the great leading principle by which the works of genius are conducted. To distinguish the faulty from the perfect, the noble from the base, and to school and chasten and exalt the imagination, the artist must enlarge himself with literature and philosophy, and by the conversation of learned and ingenious men. 
so Reynolds had done. In 1782, he suffered a paralytic stroke from which he partially recovered. For seven years more, he continued to paint. Then his left eye clouded and soon lost its vision. In 1789, the right eye began to fail, and he put down his brush, despondent that almost total blindness was to be added to the semi-deafness which since his twenty-seventh year had forced him to use an ear trumpet. On December 10, 1790, he delivered the last of his discourses. He reaffirmed his faith in the academic and conservative precepts of his earlier addresses, and renewed his counsel to study line before color and the classic painters before attempting innovation. He ended with a paean to Michelangelo. Were I now to begin the world again, I would tread in the steps of that great master. To kiss the hem of his garment, to catch the slightest of his perfections, would be glory and distinction enough for an ambitious man. I reflect, not without vanity, that these discourses bear testimony of my admiration of that truly divine man. And I should desire that the last word which I should pronounce in this academy, and from this place, might be the name of Michael Angelo. The repentant portraitist died on February 23, 1792, and nine noblemen were proud to bear his remains to St. Paul's. 5. Thomas Gainsborough. Reynolds was a man of the world, ready to make the obeisances required for social acceptance. Gainsborough was a passionate individualist who raged at the sacrifices demanded of his personality and his art at the price of success. His parents were dissenters. Thomas inherited their independence of spirit without their piety. Stories are told of his playing truant from school in his native Sudbury to roam the countryside, sketching trees and sky, and the cattle grazing in the fields or drinking at a pond. Having by the age of fourteen drawn all the trees in the neighborhood, he obtained permission from his father to go to London and study art. There he studied the women of the town, as we gather from his later advice to a young actor. Don't run about London streets fancying you are catching strokes of nature at the hazard of your constitution. It was my first school, and deeply read in petticoats I am. Therefore you may allow me to caution you. Suddenly, still but nineteen, he found himself married to a Scottish girl of sixteen, Margaret Burr. She was, by most accounts, the illegitimate daughter of a duke, but she had an income of two hundred pounds a year. In 1748 they settled in Ipswich. He joined a music club there, for he was fond of music, and played several instruments. I make portraits for a living, landscapes because I love them, and music because I cannot help myself. In the work of the Dutch Lanskip painters, he found a reinforcement of his interest in nature. Philip Thickness, governor of the nearby Landguard Fort, commissioned him to paint the fort, the neighboring hills, and Harwich. Then he advised him to seek a richer and wider clientele in Bath. Arrived there, in 1759, Gainsborough sought out the musicians rather than the artists, and soon numbered Johann Christian Bach among his friends. He had the soul and sensitivity of a musician, and in his paintings he turned music into warmth of color and grace of line. Bath had some good collections. Now he could study landscapes by Claude Lorrain and Gaspard Poussin, and portraits by Van Dyck. He became the inheritor of Van Dyck's English manner, portraits that added the highest refinement of art to distinction of personality and elegance of dress. In Bath he did some of his best work. The Sheridans were living there. Gainsborough painted Richard's lovely young wife. He lavished all his maturing artistry on the Honorable Mrs. Graham, whose red robe in its wrinkles and folds allowed him to display the most delicate gradations of color and shade. When this portrait was exhibited in the Royal Academy at London in 1777, it seemed to many observers to outshine anything that Reynolds had done. About 1770, Gainsborough transfigured Jonathan Buttle, son of an ironmonger, into the Blue Boy, for which the Huntington Art Gallery paid $500,000. Reynolds had expressed his conviction that no acceptable portrait could be done in blue. His rising rival met the challenge triumphantly. Blue became henceforth a favorite color in English painting. Now every notable in Bath wished to sit for Gainsborough. But I'm sick of portraits, he told a friend, and wish very much to take my veal de gamba and walk off to some sweet village, where I can paint landscapes 
and enjoy the fag end of life in quietness and ease. Instead, he moved to London in 1774 and rented sumptuous rooms in Schomburg House, Pell Mell, at three hundred pounds a year. He was not to be outdone by Reynolds's display. He quarreled with the Academy on the hanging of his pictures. For four years, from 1773 to 77, he refused to exhibit there. And after 1783, his new work could be seen only at the annual opening of his studio. Art critics began an ungracious war of comparisons between Reynolds and Gainsborough. Reynolds was generally rated superior, but the royal family favored Gainsborough, and he painted them all. Soon half of the blue bloods of England flocked to Schomburg House, seeking the precarious immortality of paint. Now Gainsborough portrayed Sheridan, Burke, Johnson, Franklin, Blackston, Pitt the Second, Clive. To establish himself and pay his rent, he had to resign himself to portraiture. His sitters found him hard to please. One lord put on all his airs as he posed. Gainsborough sent him away unpainted. Garrick's features were so mobile and changeful, for this was half the secret of his superiority as an actor, that the artist could find no expression that lasted long enough to reveal the man. He had the same trouble with Garrick's rival, Samuel Foote. "'Rot them for a couple of rogues!' exclaimed Gainsborough. "'They have everybody's face but their own.' He found a different difficulty with Mrs. Siddons. Damn your nose, madam, there's no end to it. He was at his best with women. He felt their sexual attraction strongly, but he sublimated this into a poetry of soft colors and dreamy eyes. When his expensive establishment allowed him, he painted landscapes, for which there was little demand. Often he placed his sitters or standees against a rustic scene, as in Robert Andrews and his wife which brought $364,000 at an auction in 1960. Too busy to go and sketch in the face of living nature, he brought into his studio stumps, weeds, branches, flowers, animals, and arranged them, with dressed-up dolls to serve as people, into a tableau. From these objects, from his memories and from his imagination, he painted landscapes. There was a certain artificial quality in them, a formalism and regularity seldom found in nature. Even so, the result conveyed an air of rural fragrance and peace. In his later years he painted some fancy pictures, in which he made no pretense to realism, but indulged his romantic temper. One of these, Cottage Girl with Dog and Pitcher, has all the sentiment of Greuze's La Cruche Cassée, The Broken Pitcher. Both were painted in 1785. Only an artist can measure Gainsborough's worth. In his own time he was ranked below Reynolds. His drawing was criticized as careless, his composition as lacking unity, his figures as improperly posed. But Reynolds himself praised the shimmering brilliance of his rival's coloring. There was a poetry and music to Gainsborough's work that the great portraitist could not warmly understand. Reynolds had a more masculine intellect and succeeded better in portraying men. Gainsborough was a more romantic spirit who preferred to paint women and boys. He had missed the classical training that Reynolds had received in Italy, and he lacked the stimulating associations that enriched Reynolds's mind and art. Gainsborough did little reading, had few intellectual interests, shunned the circle of wits that gathered around Johnson. He was generous but impulsive and critical. He could never have listened with patience to Reynolds's lectures or Johnson's decrees. Yet he kept Sheridan's friendship to the end. As he grew older, he turned melancholy, for the romantic spirit, unless it is religious, is helpless in the face of death. In many Gainsborough landscapes, a dead tree intrudes itself as a memento mori, amid rich foliage and lush grass. Probably he surmised that cancer was consuming him, and felt a rising bitterness at the thought of so prolonged an agony. A few days before he died, he wrote a letter of reconciliation to Reynolds and asked the older man to visit him. Reynolds came and the two men, who had not so much quarreled as been the subject of lesser men's disputes, engaged in a friendly chat. When they parted, Gainsborough remarked, "'Good-bye till we meet in the hereafter, Van Dyke in our company.' He died on August 2, 1788, in his sixty-first year. Reynolds joined Sheridan in carrying the body to Kew Churchyard. Four months later, Reynolds, in his fourteenth discourse, paid him a just tribute." He frankly noted defects as well as excellences in Gainsborough's work, but he added, If ever this nation should produce genius sufficient to acquire to us the honorable distinction of an English school, the name of Gainsborough will be transmitted to posterity in the
history of art among the very first of that rising name. George Romney struggled to reach the popularity of Reynolds and Gainsborough, but his defects of education, health, and character kept him to a more modest role. Without schooling after the age of twelve, he worked in his father's carpentry shop in Lancashire till he was nineteen. His drawings won him instruction in painting from a local wastrel. At twenty-two, he fell seriously ill. Recovering, he married the nurse. Soon restless, he left her to seek his fortune. He saw her only twice in the next thirty-seven years, but he sent her a part of his earnings. He made enough to visit Paris and Rome, where he was influenced by the neoclassical trend. Back in London, he attracted patronage by his ability to clothe his sitters in grace or dignity. One of these was Emma Lyon, the future Lady Hamilton. Romney was so captivated by her beauty that he portrayed her as goddess, Cassandra, Circe, Magdalene, Joan of Arc, and Saint. In 1782 he painted a portrait of Lady Sutherland, for which he received eighteen pounds. It was recently sold for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. In 1799, broken in body and mind, he returned to his wife. She nursed him again, as she had done forty-four years before. He lingered through three years of paralysis and died in 1802. Through him and Reynolds and Gainsborough, England was now, in this half-century, in painting as well as in politics and literature, in the full stream of European civilization. Chapter 31 England's Neighbors, 1756-1789 to 1. Grattan's Ireland An English traveller visiting Ireland in 1764 explained why the poor were taking to crime. What dread of justice or punishment can be expected from an Irish peasant in a state of wretchedness and extreme penury in which, if the first man that met him were to knock him on the head and give him an everlasting relief from his distressed and penurious life, he might have reason to think it a friendly and meritorious action. That many of them bear their abject state with patience is to me a sufficient proof of the natural civility of their disposition. The landlords, who were almost all Protestants, were not the direct or most brutal oppressors of the peasants, who were almost all Catholics. Usually all the owners lived in England, and did not see the blood on the rents exacted by the middlemen to whom they leased their land. It was the middlemen who drew every possible penny from the peasants, until these had to feed on potatoes and dress in rags. In 1758, because disease was decimating cattle in England, Ireland was allowed for five years to export livestock to Britain. Many acres in Ireland, including common lands formerly used by the tenant farmers, were changed from tillage to grazing or pasturage. The rich were enriched, the poor were further impoverished. They added to their problems by marrying early. Upon the first capacity, as Sir William Petty put it, presumably they hoped that children would soon earn their keep and then help pay the rent. So, despite a high death rate, the population of Ireland grew from 3,191,000 in 1754 to 4,753,000 in 1791. The industrial picture was brightening. Many Protestants and some Catholics had gone into the production of linens, woolens, cotton goods, silk, or glass. In the final quarter of the century, after Grattan had secured a moderation of British restrictions on Irish manufactures and commerce, a middle class developed which provided economic leverage for liberal politics and cultural growth. Dublin became one of the leading centers of education, music, drama, and architecture in the British Isles. Trinity College was becoming a university, and already had a long roster of distinguished graduates. If Ireland had kept her shining lights at home, Burke, Goldsmith, and Sheridan, as well as Swift and Barclay, she would have shone with the most brilliant nations of the age. After 1766 the Lord Lieutenant made Dublin his permanent home instead of paying brief visits once a year. Now majestic public buildings rose and elegant mansions. Dublin's theatres rivaled London's in the excellence of their productions. Here Handel's Messiah received its first performance and welcome in 1742, and Thomas Sheridan staged many successful plays, some of them written by his wife. Religion, of course, was the pervading issue in Ireland. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 Continued 
Cassette 4, Side 2. Religion, of course, was the pervading issue in Ireland. Dissenters, that is, Presbyterians, Independents, or Puritans, and Baptists, were excluded from office and from Parliament by the Test Act, which required reception of the sacrament according to the Anglican Rite as a precondition to eligibility. The Toleration Act of 1689 was not extended to Ireland. The Presbyterians of Ulster protested in vain against these disabilities. Thousands of them emigrated to America, where many of them fought devotedly in the revolutionary armies. The population of Ireland was 80% Catholic, but no Catholic could be elected to Parliament. Only a few Catholics owned land. Protestant tenants were given leases for their lives. Catholic tenants for no more than 31 years, and they had to pay two-thirds of their profits as rent. No Catholic schools were allowed, but the authorities did not enforce the law forbidding the Irish to seek education abroad. Some Catholic students were admitted to Trinity College, but they could not receive a degree. Catholic worship was permitted, but there were no legal means of preparing Catholic priests. Candidates for the priesthood, however, might go to seminaries on the continent. Some of these students adopted the genial manners and liberal views of the hierarchy in France and Italy. Returning to Ireland as priests, they were welcomed at the tables of educated Protestants and helped to soften bigotry on both sides. By the time that Henry Grattan entered the Irish Parliament in 1775, the movement for Catholic emancipation had won the support of thousands of Protestants in both England and Ireland. In 1760, Ireland was governed by a Lord Lieutenant, or Viceroy, appointed by and responsible to the King of England, and by a Parliament dominated in the House of Lords by Anglican bishops, and in the House of Commons by Anglican landowners and governmental placemen, or pensioners. Elections to Parliament were subject to the same system of rotten and pocket boroughs as in England. A few leading families, known as the Undertakers, owned the vote of their boroughs as they owned their homes. Catholic resistance to English rule was sporadic and ineffective. In 1763, bands of Catholics called White Boys, from the white shirts they wore over their clothes, roamed the countryside, tearing down enclosure fences, crippling cattle, and assaulting the collectors of taxes or tithes. The leaders were caught and hanged, and the rebellion collapsed. The movement for national liberation fared better. In 1776, most British troops were taken from Ireland for service in America. At the same time, the Irish economy was depressed by cessation of trade with America. To guard against domestic revolt or foreign invasion, the Protestants of Ireland formed an army called the Volunteers. These grew in number and power until, by 1780, they were a redoubtable force in politics. It was through support by these 40,000 armed men that Henry Flood and Henry Grattan won their legislative victories. Both of them were officers in the Volunteers, and both were among the greatest orators in a country which could send Burke and Richard Sheridan to England and still have a store of eloquence left. Flood entered the Irish Parliament in 1759. He led a brave campaign to reduce venality in a house where half the members were indebted to the government. He was defeated by wholesale bribery and surrendered in 1775 by accepting the office of vice-treasurer at a salary of £3,500. In that year, Henry Grattan was elected to the Parliament by a Dublin constituency. He soon took Flood's place as leader of the opposition. He announced an ambitious program to secure relief to Irish Catholics, to free dissenters from the Test Act, to end English restrictions on Irish trade, and to establish the independence of the Irish Parliament. He pursued these aims with an energy, devotion, and success that made him the idol of the nation, Catholic or Protestant. In 1778 he secured passage of a bill enabling Catholics to take leases of ninety-nine years and to inherit land on the same conditions as Protestants. A year later, on his urging, the Test Act was repealed and full civil rights were assured to dissenters. He and Flood persuaded the Irish Parliament and the Viceroy that the continuance of British obstructions to Irish trade would lead to revolutionary violence. Lord North, then heading the British government, favoured repeal of the restrictions. English manufacturers bombarded him with petitions against repeal. He yielded to them. The Irish began to boycott British goods. 
The volunteers assembled before the Irish Parliament House with arms in their hands and cannon labeled Free Trade or This. The English manufacturers, hurt by the boycott, withdrew their opposition. The English ministry withdrew its veto. The Free Trade Act was passed in 1779. Grattan next pressed for the independence of the Irish Parliament. Early in 1780 he moved that only the King of England, with the consent of the Parliament of Ireland, could legislate for Ireland, and that Great Britain and Ireland were united only by the bond of a common sovereign. His motion was defeated. The volunteers, meeting at Dungannon, 25,000 strong, in February 1782, announced that if legislative independence were not granted, their loyalty to England would cease. In March, Lord North's aged ministry fell. Rockingham and Fox came into power. Meanwhile, Cornwallis had surrendered at Yorktown in 1781. France and Spain had joined America in war against England. Britain could not afford to face an Irish revolution at this time. On April 16, 1782, the Irish Parliament, led by Grattan, declared its legislative independence. A month later this was conceded by England. The Irish Parliament voted a grant of £100,000 to Grattan, who was a relatively poor man. He accepted half. This, of course, was a victory for the Protestants of Ireland, not for the Catholics. When Grattan, strongly supported by the Anglican Bishop Frederick Harvey, went on to campaign for a measure of Catholic emancipation, the best he could do, in what historians call Grattan's Parliament, was to win the franchise for propertied Catholics in 1792. These few received the right to vote, but not the right to be elected to Parliament, to municipal office, or to the judiciary. Grattan went to England, secured election to the British Parliament, and there continued his campaign. He died in 1820, nine years before that Parliament passed the Catholic Relief Act, which admitted Catholics to the Irish Parliament. Justice is not only blind, it limps. 2. The Scottish Background When the Union of 1707 merged Scotland with England through a joint Parliament, London quipped that the whale had swallowed Jonah. When Bute, in 1762 and onward, brought a score of Scots into the British government, the wits grumbled that Jonah was swallowing the whale. Politically, the whale won. The sixteen Scottish peers and forty-five commoners were engulfed by a hundred and eight English peers and five hundred thirteen commoners. Scotland submitted its foreign policy and in large measure its economy to legislation dominated by English money and mines. The two countries did not forget their former enmity. The Scots complained of commercial inequalities between Jonah and the whale, and Samuel Johnson spoke for the whale in biting at Jonah with chauvinistic iteration. Scotland in 1760 had a population of some 1,250,000 souls. The birth rate was high, but the death rate followed close. Said Adam Smith, toward 1770, It is not uncommon, I have been told, in the highlands of Scotland, for a mother who has borne twenty children not to have two alive. The highland chieftains owned nearly all the land outside the towns, and kept the tenant farmers primitively poor, on a rocky soil harassed by summer downpours, and by winter snow from September to May. Rents were repeatedly raised, on one farm from five pounds to twenty pounds in twenty-five years. Many peasants, seeing no escape from poverty at home, emigrated to America. So, said Johnson, a rapacious chief could make a wilderness of his estate. The landlords pleaded depreciation of the currency as their excuse for raising rents. Conditions were even worse in the coal mines and salt pits, where, until 1775, workers were bound to their jobs as long as they lived. In the lowland towns, the Industrial Revolution brought prosperity to an expanding and enterprising middle class. Southwest Scotland was dotted with textile factories. Glasgow, through industries and foreign trade, grew from a population of 12,500 in 1707 to 80,000 in 1800. It had rich suburbs, slum tenements, and a university. In 1768 to 1790, a canal was dug connecting the rivers Clyde and Forth, so establishing an all-water commercial route between the industrial southwest and the political southeast. Edinburgh, which had some 50,000 inhabitants in 1740, was the focus of Scotland's government, intellect, and fashion. 
Every well-to-do Scottish family aspired to spend at least a part of the year there. Here came Boswell and Burns, here lived Hume and Robertson and Rayburn. Here were renowned lawyers like the Erskines, and a prestigious university, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And here were the headquarters of Scottish Christianity. Roman Catholics were few, but enough, as we have seen, to cause trepidation in a land still reverberating with echoes of John Knox. The Episcopal Church had many adherents among the affluent, who liked the bishops and ritual of the Anglican Communion, but the allegiance of the great majority went to the Church of Scotland. The Presbyterian Kirk, which rejected bishops, minimized ritual, and accepted in religion and morals no other rule than that of its parish sessions, its district presbyteries, its provincial synods, and its general assembly. Probably nowhere else in Europe except Spain was a people so thoroughly imbued with theology. The Kirk Session, composed of elders and minister, could levy fines and inflict penalties for misconduct and heresy. It could sentence fornicators to stand up and be publicly rebuked during the service. Robert Burns and Jean Armour were thus chastened in a Kirk Session on August 6, 1786. A Calvinist eschatology dominated the common mind, making free thought a danger to life and limb. But a group of moderate clergymen, led by Robert Wallace, Adam Ferguson, and William Robertson, tempered the intolerance of the people sufficiently to allow David Hume a natural death. Perhaps a hard religion was required to counter the revels of a people so cold that they drank to intoxication, and so poor that their only pleasure lay in sexual pursuit. The career of Burns indicates that the men drank and fornicated despite the devil and the dominies, and that willing girls were not rare. In the final quarter of the eighteenth century there was a marked decline in religious belief and in adherence to the traditional morality. William Creech, an Edinburgh painter, noted that in 1763 Sunday had been a day of religious devotion. In 1783 attendance on church was greatly neglected, and particularly by the men at night the streets were noisy with loose and riotous youth. In 1763 there were five or six brothels. In 1783 the number of brothels had increased twentyfold, and the women of the town more than a hundredfold. Every quarter of the city and the suburbs was infected with multitudes of females abandoned to vice. Golf was luring men from church to the links on Sundays, and on weekdays men and women danced, formerly a sin, went to theatres, still a sin, attended horse races, and gambled in taverns and clubs. The Kirk was the chief source of democracy and education. The congregation chose the elders, and the minister, usually chosen by a patron, was expected to organize a school in every parish. The hunger for education was intense. Of the four universities, that of St. Andrews was in decay, but claimed to have the best library in Britain. Johnson founded the University of Aberdeen, flourishing in 1773. The University of Glasgow had on its faculty Joseph Black, physicist, Thomas Reed, philosopher, and Adam Smith, economist, and was sheltering James Watt. Edinburgh University was the youngest of the four, but it was alive with the excitement of the Scottish Enlightenment. 3. The Scottish Enlightenment only the growth of trade with England and the world, and the rise of industry in the lowlands, can explain the outburst of genius that illuminated Scotland between Hume's Treatise of Human Nature in 1739 and Boswell's Life of Johnson in 1791. In philosophy, Francis Hutcheson, David Hume and Adam Ferguson, in economics, Adam Smith, in literature, John Home, Henry Home, Lord Kames, William Robertson, James Macpherson, Robert Burns, James Boswell. In science, Joseph Black, James Watt, Neville Maskelyne, James Hutton, Lord Monbado. In medicine, John and William Hunter. Here was a galaxy to rival the stars that shone in England around the Great Bear. Hume, Robertson, and others formed in Edinburgh a select society for weekly discussions of ideas. These men and their like kept in touch with French rather than English thought, partly because France had for centuries been associated with Scotland, partly because the lingering hostility between Englishmen and Scots impeded the fusion of the two cultures. Hume had a low opinion of the English mind in his time until, in the year of his death, he gratefully acclaimed 
the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. We have already discharged our debt to Hutchison and Hume. Now we look at Hume's genial enemy, Thomas Reed, who strove to bring philosophy back from idealistic metaphysics to an acceptance of objective reality. While teaching at Aberdeen and Glasgow, he wrote his Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense in 1764. Before publishing it, he sent the manuscript to Hume with the courteous letter conveying compliments and explaining his regret that he had to oppose the older man's skeptical philosophy. Hume replied with characteristic amiability and bade him publish without fear of reproach. Reed had formerly yielded to Barclay's view that we know only ideas, never things. But when Hume, by similar reasoning, contended that we know only mental states, never a mind additional to them, Reed felt that such a finical analysis undermined all distinctions between true and false, right and wrong, and all belief in God or immortality. To avoid this debacle, he thought, he had to refute Hume, and to refute Hume he had to reject Barclay. So he ridiculed the notion that we know only our sensations and ideas. On the contrary, we know things directly and immediately. It is only from an excess of refinement that we analyze our experience of a rose, for example, and reduce it to a bundle of sensations and ideas. The bundle is real, but so is the rose, which maintains an obstinate persistence when our sensations of it cease. Of course, the primary qualities, size, shape, solidity, texture, weight, motion, number, belong to the objective world and are subjectively altered only through subjective illusions. And even the secondary qualities have an objective source in so far as physical or chemical conditions in the subject or the environment give rise to the subjective sensations of smell, taste, warmth, brightness, color, or sound. Common sense tells us this, but the principles of common sense are not the prejudices of unlettered multitudes. They are the instinctive principles which the constitution of our nature, the sense common to us all, leads us to believe, and which we are under a necessity to take for granted in the common concerns of life. Compared with this universal sense, daily tested and a thousand times confirmed, the airy reasonings of metaphysics are merely a game played in solitary flight from the world. Even Hume, as he confessed, abandoned this intellectual game when he left his study. But the same return to common sense restores reality to the mind. It is not only ideas that exist. There is an organism, a mind, a self, that has the ideas. Language itself testifies to this universal belief. Every language has a first-person singular pronoun. It is I who feel, remember, think, and love. It seemed very natural to think that the treatise of human nature required an author, a very ingenious one, too. But now we learn that it is only a set of ideas which came together and arranged themselves by certain associations and attractions. Hume took all this good-naturedly. He could not accept Reed's theological conclusions— but he respected his Christian temper, and perhaps he was secretly relieved to learn that, after all, despite Barclay, the external world existed, and that despite Hume, Hume was real. The public, too, was relieved and bought three editions of Reed's inquiry before he died. Boswell was among the comforted. Reed's book, he tells us, settled my mind, which had been very uneasy from speculations in the abstruse and skeptical style. Art added color to Scotland's Age of Light. The four Adam brothers, who left their mark on English architecture, were Scots. Alan Ramsay, son of the poet Alan Ramsay, failing to win honors in his native Edinburgh, migrated to London in 1752, and, after years of labor, became painter in ordinary to the king, much to the fury of English artists. He made a good portrait of George III, but a still better one of his own wife. The dislocation of his right arm ended his career as a painter. Sir Henry Rayburn was the Reynolds of Scotland. Son of an Edinburgh manufacturer, he taught himself oil painting and portrayed a widowed heiress to such satisfaction that she married him and dowered him with her fortune. After two years of study in Italy, he returned to Edinburgh in 1787. Soon he had more patrons than he had time to paint. Robertson, 
John Home, Dougald Stewart, Walter Scott, and, best of his portraits, Lord Newton, an immense body, a massive head, a character of iron mingled with balm. At opposite poles is the modest loveliness that Rayburn found in his wife. Sometimes he rivaled Reynolds in picturing children, as in the Drummond children in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Rayburn was knighted in 1822, but died a year later, aged 67. The Scottish Enlightenment excelled in historians. Adam Ferguson shared in founding the study of sociology and social psychology with his Essay on the History of Civil Society in 1767, which had seven editions in his lifetime. History, Ferguson argued, knows man only as living in groups. To understand him, we must see him as a social but competitive creature, composed of gregarious habits and individualistic desires. Character development and social organization are determined by the interplay of these contrary tendencies and are seldom affected by the ideals of philosophers. Economic rivalry, political oppositions, social inequalities, and war itself are in the nature of man. They will continue, and by and large they advance the progress of mankind. Ferguson in his day was as famous as Adam Smith, but their friend William Robertson won still wider renown. We recall Vilant's hope that Schiller as historian would rise to a level with Hume, Robertson, and Gibbon. Horace Walpole asked in 1759, Can we think that we want writers of history while Mr. Hume and Mr. Robertson are living? Robertson's work is one of the purest style and of the greatest impartiality that I have ever read. Gibbon wrote in his memoirs, the perfect composition, the nervous language, the well-turned periods of Dr. Robertson influenced me to the ambitious hope that I might one day tread in his footsteps. And he was elated as often as I find myself ranked in the triumvirate of British historians with Hume and Robertson. He ranked these two with Guicciardini and Machiavelli as the greatest of modern historians, and later called Robertson the first historian of the present age. Like Reed, Robertson was a clergyman son of a clergyman. Installed as minister at Gladsmuir at the age of twenty-two in 1743, he was elected two years later to the General Assembly of the Kirk. There he became the leader of the moderates and protected heretics like Hume. After six years of labor and careful study of documents and authorities, he issued in 1759 a History of Scotland during the reigns of Queen Mary and of James the Sixth until his accession to the Crown of England. He modestly ended where Hume's history of England had begun. It pleased Scotland by avoiding idolatry of Mary, Queen of Scots, and pleased Englishmen with its style, though Johnson was amused to find in it some Johnsonianly cumbrous words. The book went through nine editions in fifty-three years. But Robertson's masterpiece was his three-volume History of the Reign of the Emperor Charles V, from 1769, we may judge of the reputation that he had won from the price paid him by the publishers, four thousand five hundred pounds, as compared with the six hundred pounds he had received for the history of Scotland. All Europe acclaimed the new book in its various translations. Catherine the Great carried it with her on her long journeys. I never leave off reading it, she said, especially the first volume. Like all of us, she was delighted with the long prologue, which reviewed medieval developments leading to Charles V. The book has been superseded by later research, but no later presentation of the subject can compare with it as a piece of literature. It is pleasant to note that the praise which the book received, considerably greater than that accorded to Hume's history, did not cool the friendship of the minister and the heretic. More famous than either was James Macpherson, who was ranked with Homer by Goethe and above Homer by Napoleon. In 1760, Macpherson, then twenty-four years old, announced that an epic of some length and splendor existed in scattered Gaelic manuscripts, which he could undertake to collect and translate if he could secure some financial aid. Robertson, Ferguson, and Hugh Blair, eloquent Presbyterian minister of Edinburgh, raised the money. Macpherson and two Gaelic scholars toured the Highlands and the Hebrides, gathering old manuscripts. And in 1762, Macpherson published Fingal, an ancient epic poem in six books, composed by Oshin, the son of Fingal, translated from the Gaelic language. 
A year later, he issued another epic, Tamora, allegedly by Oshin, and in 1765 he published both as the works of Oshin. Oshin, in Gaelic, Irish and Scottish, legend, was the poet son of the warrior Finn McCummel. He lived, we are told, three hundred years, long enough to express his pagan opposition to the new theology brought to Ireland by St. Patrick. Some poems attributed to him were preserved in three fifteenth-century manuscripts, chiefly in the Book of Lismore, which James MacGregor compiled in 1512. Macpherson had these manuscripts. Fingal told how the young warrior, having defeated Scottish invaders of Ireland, invited them to a feast and a song of peace. The story is vividly told, warmed by the Scots' appreciation of Irish girls. "'Thou art snow on the heath,' says one warrior to Morna, daughter of King Cormac. "'Thy hair is the mist of Cromla when it curls on the hill, when it shines to the beam of the west. Thy breasts are two smooth rocks seen from Brano of streams, thy arms like two white pillars in the halls of the great Fingal. We meet other bosoms, less rocky, white bosom, high bosom, heavy bosom. They are a bit distracting, but soon the tale turns from love to the hatreds of war. Macpherson's Oshin made a stir in Scotland, England, France, and Germany. Scots hailed it as a page from their heroic medieval past. England, which in 1765 was welcoming Percy's Relics of Ancient English Poetry, was ripe for the romance of Gaelic legend. Goethe, toward the end of Werther in 1774, showed his hero reading to Lotta six pages of Oshin. These were the story of the tender maiden Dora, as told by her father Armin, how the wicked Aerith lured her out to a rock in the sea by promising that her lover Armor would meet her there, how Aerith abandoned her on the rock and no lover came. She lifted up her voice. She called for her brother and her father. Arindel, Armin! Arindel rode out to rescue her, but an arrow well aimed by a hidden enemy slew him. Lover Armor came to the shore, tried to swim out to Dora. Sudden a blast from the hill came over the waves. He sank and he rose no more. The father, too old and weak to go to her, cried out in horror and despair. Alone on the sea-beat rock my daughter was heard to complain. Frequent and loud were her cries. What could her father do? All night I stood on the shore. I saw her by the faint beam of the moon. Loud was the wind. The rain beat hard on the hill. Before morning appeared her voice was weak. It died away like the evening breeze among the grass of the rocks. Spent with grief she expired. Gone is my strength in war. Fallen my pride among women. When the storms aloft arise, When the north wind lifts the wave on high, I sit by the sounding shore And look on the fatal rock. Often by the setting moon I see the ghosts of my children. Will none of you speak in pity? Controversy soon arose. Was Oshin really a translation from old Gaelic ballads, or was it a series of poems by Macpherson and foisted upon a poet who perhaps never lived? Herder and Goethe in Germany, Diderot in France, Hugh Blair and Lord Kames in Scotland credited Macpherson's claim. But in 1775 Samuel Johnson, in A Journey to the Western Islands of Scotland, after some inquiries in the Hebrides in 1773, declared of the Oceanic poems, I believe they never existed in any other form but that which we have seen. The editor or author never could show the original, nor can it be shown by any other. Macpherson wrote to Johnson that only the Englishman's age protected him from a challenge or a beating. Johnson replied, I hope I shall never be deterred from detecting what I think a cheat by the meanness of a ruffian. I thought your book an imposture. I think it an imposture still. Your rage I defy." Hume, Horace Walpole, and others joined in Johnson's doubts. Asked to produce the originals which he claimed to have translated, Macpherson delayed, but at his death he left the manuscripts of Gaelic ballads, some of which he had used in contriving the plot and setting the tone of his poems. Many phrases and names he took from these texts. The two epics, however, were his own composition. The deception was not so complete or so heinous as Johnson supposed. 
let us call it poetic license on too grand a scale. Taken in themselves, the two prose poetry epics warranted some of the admiration they received. They conveyed the beauty and terrors of nature, the fury of hatred, and the zest of war. They were tenderly sentimental, but they had some of the nobility that Sir Thomas Mallory had conveyed in Le Mort d'Arthur in 1470. They rose to fame on the romantic wave that engulfed the Enlightenment. 4. Adam Smith Next to Hume, Adam Smith was the greatest figure in the Scottish Enlightenment. His father, controller of the customs at Kirkaldy, died some months before Adam's birth in 1723. Almost the only adventure the economist had in his life came when, a child of three years, he was kidnapped by gypsies, who, being pursued, abandoned him beside the road. After some schooling at Kirkaldy and attending the courses of Hutchison at Glasgow, Adam went down to Oxford in 1740, where he found the teachers as lazy and worthless as Gibbon would describe them in 1752. Smith educated himself by reading, but the college authorities confiscated his copy of Hume's Treatise of Human Nature as quite unfit for a Christian youth. One year with the Dons was enough. Loving his mother better, he returned to Kirkaldy and continued to absorb books. In 1748 he moved to Edinburgh, where he lectured independently on literature and rhetoric. His discourses impressed influential persons. He was appointed to the chair of logic in the University of Glasgow in 1751, and a year later became professor of moral philosophy, which included ethics, jurisprudence, and political economy. In 1759 he published his ethical conclusions in Theory of Moral Sentiments, which Buckle, ignoring Aristotle and Spinoza, pronounced the most important work that has ever been written on this interesting subject. Smith derived our ethical judgments from our spontaneous disposition to imagine ourselves in the position of others. Thereby we echo their emotions, and by this sympathy or fellow-feeling we are moved to approve or condemn. The moral sense is rooted in our social instincts or in the mental habits developed by us as members of a group but it is not inconsistent with self-love. The summit of a man's moral development comes when a man learns to judge himself as he judges others, to command himself according to the objective principles of equity, natural law, prudence, and justice. Religion is not the source nor the mainstay of our moral sentiments, but these are strongly influenced by belief in the derivation of the moral code from a rewarding and punishing God. In 1764, Smith, now forty-one, was engaged as tutor and guide to accompany the eighteen-year-old Duke of Buckleu on a tour of Europe. The fee, three hundred pounds a year for life, gave Smith the security and leisure for his masterpiece, which he began to write during an eighteen-month stay in Toulouse. He visited Voltaire at Ferney, and in Paris he met Alvesius and d'Alembert, Quenet and Turgot. Returning to Scotland in 1766, he lived for the next ten years contentedly with his mother in Kirkaldy, working on his book, The Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, appeared in 1776, and was greeted with a letter of praise from Hume, who died shortly thereafter. Hume himself, in his essays, had helped to form the economic as well as the ethical views of Adam Smith. He had ridiculed the mercantile system, which favored protective tariffs, trade monopolies, and other governmental measures to ensure an excess of exports over imports, and the accumulation of precious metals as a nation's basic wealth. This policy, said Hume, was like toiling to keep water from seeking its natural level, and he called for liberation of the economy from the numberless bars and imposts which all nations of Europe, and none more than England, have put upon trade. Of course, Smith was acquainted with the campaign of Quenet and other French physiocrats against the obstructive regulations of industry and trade by guilds and governments, and their demand for a laissez-faire policy that would let nature take its course, and all prices and wages find their level in free competition. The revolt then rising in America against British restrictions on colonial trade was part of the background of Smith's thought. If the freedom of trade which he proposed had guided the British government, the year of his book might not have seen the Declaration of Independence. Smith had some ideas about the strife between Britain and America. He considered the English monopoly of colonial trade to be one of the mean and malignant expedients of the mercantile system. 
He proposed that if the colonists refused to be taxed to support the expenses of the British Empire, America should be given its independence without further quarrel. By thus parting good friends, the natural affection of the colonists to the mother country would quickly revive. It might dispose them to favor us in war as well as in trade, and instead of turbulent and factious subjects, to become our most faithful and generous allies. And he added, such has hitherto been the rapid progress of that country in wealth, population, and improvement, that in the course of little more than a century, perhaps, the produce of America might exceed that of British taxation. The seat of empire would then naturally remove itself to that part of the empire which contributed most to the general defense and support of the whole. Smith defined the wealth of a nation not as the amount of gold or silver it possessed, but as the land with its improvements and products, and the people with their labor, services, skills, and goods. His thesis was that, with some exceptions, the greatest physical wealth results from the greatest economic liberty. Self-interest is universal, but if we let this powerful motive operate with the greatest economic freedom, it will stimulate such industry, enterprise, and competition as will generate more riches than any other system known to history. This was Mandeville's fable of the bees worked out in detail. Smith believed that the laws of the market, especially the law of supply and demand, would harmonize the liberty of the producer with the welfare of the consumer. For if a producer made excessive profits, others would enter the same field, and the mutual competition would keep prices and profits within fair limits. Moreover, the consumer would enjoy a kind of economic democracy— by buying or refusing to buy, he would in great measure determine what articles would be produced, what services would be offered, in what quantity and at what price, instead of having all these matters dictated by a government. Following the physiocrats, but judging the products of labor and the services of trade to be wealth as real as the produce of the land, Smith called for an end to feudal tolls, guild restrictions, governmental economic regulations, and industrial or commercial monopolies, as all limiting that freedom which, by allowing the individual to work, spend, save, buy, and sell at his pleasure, keeps the wheels of production and distribution in motion. The government must laissez-faire, must let nature, the natural propensities of men, operate freely. It must allow the individual to shift for himself, to find by trial and error the work that he can do, the place that he can fill in the economic life. It must let him sink or swim." According to this system of natural liberty, the sovereign, or the state, has only three duties to attend to. First, the duty of protecting the society from the violence and invasion of other independent societies. Secondly, the duty of protecting as far as possible every member of the society from the injustice or oppressions of every other member of it. Or the duty of establishing an exact administration of justice. And thirdly, the duty of maintaining certain public works and public institutions, which it can never be for the interest of any individual or small number of individuals to erect or maintain. Here was the formula of Jeffersonian government and the outline of a state that would enable the new capitalism to grow and flourish exceedingly. There was a loophole in the formula. What if the duty of preventing injustice should imply the obligation to prevent the inhumane usage of the simple or the weak by the clever or the strong? Smith answered, Such injustice can come only through monopolies in restraint of competition or trade, and his principles called for the suppression of monopolies. We must rely upon the competition of employers for workers and of these for jobs to regulate wages. All attempts of governments to regulate them are sooner or later frustrated by the laws of the market. Though labor, and not land, as the physiocrats held, is the sole source of wealth, it is a commodity, just like capital, and is subject to the laws of supply and demand. Whenever the law has attempted to regulate the wages of workers, it has always been rather to lower them than to raise them. For whenever the legislature attempts to regulate the differences between masters and their workmen, its counselors are always the masters. This was written at a time when English law allowed employers, but for bad employees, to organize themselves to protect their economic interests. Smith denounced this partiality of the law and foresaw that better wages would be obtained not through governmental regulation, but by the organization of labor. The supposed herald of capitalism, 
almost always took the side of the workers against the employers. He warned against letting merchants and manufacturers determine the policy of the government. The interest of the dealers in any particular branch of trade or manufactures is always in some respects different from, and even opposite to, that of the public. The proposal of any new law or regulation of commerce which comes from this order ought always to be listened to with great precaution. It comes from an order of men who have generally an interest to deceive and even to oppress the public, and who have upon many occasions both deceived and oppressed it. Is this Adam Smith or Karl Marx? But Smith defended private property as an indispensable stimulus to enterprise, and he held that the number of available jobs and the wages paid will depend above all upon the accumulation and application of capital. Nevertheless, he advocated high wages as profitable to employer and employees alike, and urged the abolition of slavery on the ground that the work done by free men comes cheaper in the end than that performed by slaves. When we consider Smith himself in his appearance, habits, and character, we wonder that a man so removed from the processes of agriculture, industry, and trade should have written about these esoteric complexities with such realism, insight, and audacity. He was as absent-minded as Newton and cared little for convention. Usually mannerly and mild, he was capable of meeting Samuel Johnson's rudeness with a four-word retort that questioned the great Cham's legitimacy. After publishing The Wealth of Nations, he spent two years in London, where he enjoyed the acquaintance of Gibbon, Reynolds, and Burke. In 1778, he, Apostle of Free Trade, was appointed Commissioner of Customs from Scotland. Thereafter, he lived in Edinburgh with his mother, remaining a bachelor to the end. She died in 1784. He followed her in 1790, aged 67. His achievement lay not so much in the originality of his thought as in the mastery and coordination of data, the wealth of illustrative material, the illuminating application of theory to current conditions, a simple, clear, and persuasive style, and a broad viewpoint that raised economics from a dismal science to the level of philosophy. His book was epical because it summarized and explained, of course it did not produce, the facts and forces that were changing feudalism and mercantilism into capitalism and free enterprise. When Pitt II reduced the duty on tea from 119 to 12 and a half percent and tried in general to bring about freer trade, he acknowledged his indebtedness to the wealth of nations. Lord Rosebery tells how, at a dinner attended by Pitt, the whole company rose when Smith entered, and Pitt said, We will stand till you are seated, for we are all your scholars. Sir James Murray Pulteney predicted that Smith's work would persuade the present generation and govern the next. 5. Robert Burns My ancient but ignoble blood, said Scotland's greatest poet, has crept through scoundrels since the flood. This book is continued on Cassette 5, Side 1. Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant, Part 3, Continued, Cassette 5, Side 1. My ancient but ignoble blood, said Scotland's greatest poet, has crept through scoundrels since the flood. We shall go no further back than William Burns, no scoundrel but a hard-working, irascible tenant-farmer. In 1757 he married Agnes Brown, who presented him Robert in 1759. 
Six years later, William took lease of a 70-acre farm at Mount Oliphant. There, the multiplying family lived sparingly in an isolated house. Robert received tutoring at home and attended a parish school, but from the age of thirteen he worked on the farm. When he was fourteen, a bonny, sweet, sonsy, or jolly, lass initiated me into a certain delicious passion, which, in spite of acid disappointment, gin-horse, prudence, and bookworm philosophy, I hold to be the finest of human joys. At fifteen he met a second angel, and spent feverish nights thinking of her. His brother recalled that Robert's attachment to women became very strong, and he was constantly the victim of the fair enslaver. In 1777, in a spell of reckless courage, William Burns leased the Lockley Farm, 130 acres, in Tarbolton, for which he contracted to pay a hundred and thirty pounds a year. Now Robert, eighteen, the eldest of seven children, became the chief worker, for William, broken by unrewarding toil, was prematurely old. Father and son drew apart as the one narrowed into Puritanism and the other eased into a broader code. Despite parental prohibition, Robert attended a dancing school. From that instance of rebellion, the poet recalled, he took a kind of dislike to me which I believe was one cause of that dissipation which marked my future years. At the age of twenty-four, Robert joined a Freemason lodge. In 1783, the farm was attached for default of rent. Robert and his brother Gilbert pooled their poverty to lease a farm of 118 acres for 90 pounds a year. There, for four years, they labored, allowing themselves seven pounds each year for personal expenses. And there they supported their parents, sisters, and brothers. The father died in 1784 of tuberculosis. In the long winter evenings, Robert read many books, including Robertson's Histories, Hume's Philosophy, and Paradise Lost. Give me a spirit like my favorite hero, Milton Satan. Resenting the Kirk's censorship of morals, he found no difficulty in discarding its theology and keeping only a vague faith in God and immortality. He laughed at Orthodox Orthodox who believe in John Knox, and he suspected that the Dominies between Sundays were secretly as sinful as himself. In the Holy Fair, about a religious revival meeting, he described a succession of preachers flaying sin and brandishing hell while harlots outside waited confidently for the congregation's patronage. Burns's dislike for clergymen gained fervor when one of them sent an agent to rebuke and fine him for sleeping unwed with Betty Payton. It became anger when his kindly landlord, Gavin Hamilton, was censured by the Kirk Session of Mauchlin in 1785 for repeated absence from church services. Now the poet wrote his sharpest satire, Holy Willie's Prayer, which ridiculed the Pharisaic virtue of William Fisher, an elder of the Mocklin Kirk. Burns pictured him addressing God. I bless and praise thy matchless might when thousands thou hast left in night, that I am here afore thy sight for gifts and grace, a burning and a shining light to all this place. O Lord, yestreen thou kens wi' Meg, Thy pardon I sincerely beg. Oh, make never be a living plague to my dishonor, and I'll ne'er lift a lawless leg again upon her. Besides, I further mon avow, with Lizzie's last three times I trow. But, Lord, that Friday I was fool, or drunk, when I can near her, or else thou kens thy servant true would never steer her. Lord, mind gone Hamilton's deserts, he drinks and swears and plays at carts, Yet has say money taken arts with great and small, for God's ain't priest the people's hearts he steals awa. Lord, in thy day of vengeance try him, Lord, visit them who did employ him, and pass not in thy mercy by them, nor hear their prayer, but for thy people's sake destroy them and dinna spare. But Lord, remember me and mine with mercies temporal and divine, that I for grace and gear may shine, excelled by name. And ah, the glory shall be thine. Amen, amen. Burns did not dare publish this poem. It reached print three years after his death. Meanwhile, he was giving the Kirk plenty of reason for reproof. He called himself a fornicator by profession. Every second maid stirred him. Charming Chloe, tripping o'er the pearly lawn. Jean Armour, 
Island Mary Campbell, Peggy Chalmers, Clorinda, Jenny Cruikshank, Jenny of Dowry, coming through the rye, Bonnie Wee Deborah Davis, Agnes Fleming, Jeannie Jaffrey, Peggy Kennedy of Bonnie Doon, Jesse Lures, Jean Lorimer, Chloris, Mary Morrison, Anna Park, Anna and Polly Stewart, Peggy Thompson, and there were more. Only their bright and laughing eyes and soft hands and bosoms of driven snow reconciled him to the toils and griefs of life. He excused his sexual meandering on the ground that all things in nature change, and why should man be an exception? But he warned women never to trust the promises of a male. We know of five children begotten by him in wedlock and nine others outside it. I have a genius for paternity, he said, and he surmised that only emasculation could cure him. As for the reproaches of ministers and the laws of Scotland, the Kirk and State may join and tell to do sick things I mona. The Kirk and State may gate to hell, and I'll gate to my Anna. When Betty Peyton bore him a child on May 22, 1785, Burns offered to marry her. Her parents rejected the offer. He turned to Jean Armour and gave her a written promise of marriage. Soon she was pregnant. On June 25, 1786, he appeared before the Kirk session and admitted his responsibility. He had, he said, considered himself married to Jean and would stand by his pledge. But her father refused to let her marry a seventeen-year-old farmer already burdened with an illegitimate child. On July 9th, in his pew at church, Burns humbly received public reproof. On August 3rd, Jean bore twins. On August 6th, he and Jean accepted rebuke before the congregation and were absolved from the scandal. The father swore out a warrant for Burns's arrest. The poet went into hiding and planned to take ship to Jamaica. The warrant was not executed, and Robert returned to his farm. In that same summer, he promised to marry Mary Campbell and take her to America. She died before they could act on the plan. Burns celebrated her in Highland Mary and to Mary in Heaven. In that prolific year, 1786, he published at Kilmarnock by subscription his first volume of verse. He omitted poems likely to offend the Kirk or the morals of the folk. He delighted his readers with his Scottish dialect and his descriptions of familiar scenery. He pleased the peasants by raising the details of their life into intelligible verse. Probably no other poet ever expressed such fellow feeling for animals sharing the burden of the farmer's day, or the silly sheep bewildered in the driving snow, or the mouse dislodged from his nest by the advancing plough. But, mousy, thou art no thy lane in proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glay. Almost as proverbial are the lines that end the poem to a louse on seeing one on a lady's bonnet at church. Oh, what some power the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us. To make sure that his little book would be welcomed, Burns capped it with The Cotter's Saturday Night. The farmer resting after a week of heavy toil, his wife and children gathered about him, each with the tale of the day, the oldest daughter timidly introducing the shy quarter, the happy sharing in the simple fare, the Bible reading by the father, the united prayer. To this pleasant picture, Burns added a patriotic apostrophe to Scotia, my dear, my native soil. Of the 612 copies printed, all but three were sold in four weeks, netting Burns twenty pounds. He thought of using the proceeds to pay for passage to America. Instead, he devoted them to a sojourn in Edinburgh. Arriving there on a borrowed horse in November 1786, he shared a room and bed with another rural youth. Some noisy harlots occupied the floor above them. The favorable reception of his book by Edinburgh reviewers opened doors to him. For a season he was an idol of polite society. Sir Walter Scott described him. I was a lad of fifteen in 1786-87 to 87 when Burns came first to Edinburgh. I saw him one day at the late venerable Professor Ferguson, where there were several gentlemen of literary reputation. His person was strong and robust, his wanness rustic, not clownish, a sort of dignified plainness and simplicity, his countenance massive, the eye large and of a dark cast, which glowed when he spoke. Among the men who were the most learned of their time and country, he expressed himself with perfect firmness, but without the least forwardness. Burns was encouraged to issue an enlarged edition of his poems. 
To give the new volume added substance, he proposed to include one of his major productions, The Jolly Beggars, which he had not ventured to print in the Kilmarnock volume. It described an assemblage of tramps, paupers, criminals, poets, fiddlers, harlots, and crippled derelict soldiers in Nancy Gibson's alehouse at Mockland. Burns put into their mouths the most candid and unrepentant autobiographies and ended the medley with a drunken chorus. A fig for those by law protected, liberty's a glorious feast. Courts for cowards were erected, churches built to please the priest. Hugh Blair, scholar and preacher, expressed alarm at the thought of publishing such a snub to the virtues. Burns yielded and later forgot that he had written the poem. A friend preserved it, and it saw the light in 1799. The Edinburgh editor sold some 3,000 copies, netting Burns 450 pounds. He bought a mare and rode out on May 5, 1787, into the Highlands, then across the Tweed to sample England. On June 9th he visited his relatives at Mosgiel and called on Jean Armour. She received him warmly and conceived again. Back in Edinburgh he met Mrs. Agnes Mallows. At seventeen she had married a Glasgow surgeon. At twenty-one in 1780 she left him, taking her children with her, and settled down to frugal decency in the capital. She invited Burns to her home. He fell in love with her without delay. Apparently she did not give herself to him, for he continued to love her. They exchanged letters and poems. His signed Sylvander, hers Clorinda. In 1791 she decided to go and rejoin her husband in Jamaica. Burns sent her as his farewell some tender lines. A fond kiss, and then we sever. A farewell, and then forever. Had we never loved say kindly, had we never loved say blindly, never met nor never parted, we had ne'er been broken-hearted. She found her husband living with a negro waitress. She returned to Edinburgh. His passion for her being unfulfilled, Burns sought companionship and revelry with a local club, the Croc Allen Fencibles, men pledged to the defense of their city. Their wine and women were the lares et penates, and bawdy reigned. For them, Burns collected old Scott songs and added some of his own. Several of these found anonymous and esoteric publication in 1800 as The Merry Muses of Caledonia. Burns's membership in this club, his open scorn of class distinctions, and his frank expression of radical views in religion and politics rapidly ended his welcome in Edinburgh society. He tried to secure a post as a tax collector. Repeatedly put off, he resigned himself to another venture in farming. In February 1788 he rented the Ellisland farm, five miles from Dumfries, twelve from Carlisle's Craigenputtock. The owner, who candidly described the soil as in the most miserable state of exhaustion, advanced the poet three hundred pounds to build a farmhouse and fence the field. Burns was to pay fifty pounds annually for three years, then seventy pounds. Meanwhile, Jean Armour gave birth to twins on March 3, 1788, who soon died. Sometime before April 28, Burns married her. With her one surviving child of the four she had borne him, she came to serve him faithfully as wife and housekeeper at Ellisland. She gave him another child, whom Burns called my chef d'oeuvre in that species of manufacture, as I look upon Tam O'Shanter to be my standard performance in the political line. In 1790 he became intimate with Anna Park, waitress in a Dumfries tavern. In March 1791 she bore him a child, which Jean took and brought up with her own. Life was hard at Ellisland. Nevertheless, he continued to write great poetry. There he added two famous stanzas to an old drinking song, Old Lang Syne. Burns worked until he too, like his father, broke down. He was glad to be appointed on July 14, 1788, an exciseman, and so to travel about the country gauging casks, examining victuallers, chandlers, and tanners, and reporting to the excise board in Edinburgh. Despite frequent bouts with John Barleycorn, he seems to have satisfied the board. In November 1791 he sold his farm at a profit and moved with Jean and the three children to a house in Dumfries. He offended the respectable folk of the town by frequenting the taverns and coming home drunk on many occasions to patient Jean. He continued to be a great poet. In those five years at Dumfries he composed Ye Banks and Braes a Bonny Doon, 
Scots were hay with Wallace bled, and oh, my love's like a red, red rose. Finding no mental mate in his wife, he corresponded with, sometimes visited, Mrs. Frances Dunlop, who had in her veins some residue of Wallace's blood. She strove to tame Burns's morals and vocabulary, not always to the benefit of his verse. He appreciated better the five-pound notes she sent him now and then. He endangered his commission as exciseman by his radical views. He told George III, in fifteen excellent stanzas, to get rid of his corrupt ministers, and advised the Prince of Wales to end his dissipations and his rattling dice with Charlie Fox, if he wished to inherit the throne. In a letter to the Edinburgh Current, he applauded America's Declaration of Independence, and in 1789 he was an enthusiastic votary of the French Revolution. In 1795 he sent out a blast against rank distinctions. Is there for honest poverty that hangs his head and all that? The coward slave, we pass him by. We dare be poor for all that. For all that and all that, our toils obscure and all that. The rank is but the guinea's stamp, the man's the gowd for all that. The honest man, though e'er say poor, is king o' men for all that. You see yon Berkey, ca' the Lord, what struts and stares and all that. Though hundreds worship at his word, he's but a coof for all that. Then let us pray that come it may, as come it will for all that, that sense and worth o'er all the earth shall bear the gree and all that. For all that and all that, it's coming yet for all that. That man to man, the world o'er shall brithers be for all that. Complaints were made to the excise board that such a radical was no fit man to check chandlers and gauge casks, but the commissioners forgave him for his love and praise of Scotland. The ninety pounds a year his post brought him hardly sufficed to keep him in Oats and Dale. He continued to roam sexually, and in 1793 Mrs. Maria Riddle, who confessed his irresistible power of attraction, bore him a child. His repeated intoxication at last weakened his mind and his pride. Like Mozart in the same decade, he sent begging letters to his friends. Stories went around that he had syphilis and had been found one bitter morning in January 1796, lying drunken in the snow. These reports have been criticized as unconfirmed heresy, and Scottish doctors describe Burns's final illness as rheumatic fever impairing the heart. Three days before his death he wrote to his father-in-law, Do for heaven's sake send Mrs. Armour here immediately. My wife is hourly expecting to be put to bed. Good God, what a situation for her to be in, poor girl, without a friend. Then he took to his bed, and on June 21, 1796, he died. While he was being buried, his wife gave birth to a son. Friends raised a fund to care for her, and she, strong of frame and heart, lived till 1834. 6. James Boswell The discovery of Boswell's journals was among the most exciting events in the literary history of our time. He had bequeathed his papers to his heirs, who judged them too scandalous for publication. One bundle, containing the London Journal, was found at Fettercairn House near Aberdeen in 1930. A larger treasure was ferreted out from the chests and closets of Malahide Castle near Dublin in 1925 to 1940. Most of the papers were bought by Colonel Ralph Isham and were acquired from him by Yale University. Professor Frederick A. Pottle edited them for the McGraw-Hill Book Company, which has sole publishing rights. We are grateful for permission received from editor and publisher to quote some passages from the journals. Professor Pottle's James Boswell, The Earlier Years, appeared after this section was written. 1. The Cub He had royal blood in him. His father, Alexander Boswell, laird of Auchinleck in Ayrshire and judge of the Scottish Court of Session, was descended from the Earl of Arran, a great-grandson of James II of Scotland. His mother was descended from the third Earl of Lennox, who was grandfather of Lord Darnley, who was father of James VI. James Boswell was born in Edinburgh, October 29, 1740. As the eldest of three sons, he was heir to the modest estate of Auchinleck, which he pronounced Affleck. 
But since his father lived till 1782, James had to be discontent with such income as the laird allowed him. Brother John suffered in 1762 the first of several attacks of insanity. Boswell himself was oppressed with spells of hypochondria, for which his cures were the amnesia of alcohol and the warmth of female forms. His mother taught him the Presbyterian Calvinist creed, which had a warmth of its own. I shall never forget, he later wrote, the dismal hours of apprehension that I have endured in my youth from narrow notions of religion, while my mind was lacerated with infernal horror. Throughout his life he oscillated between faith and doubt, piety and venery, and never achieved more than momentary integration or content. After some tutoring at home, he was sent to the University of Edinburgh, then to Glasgow, where he attended the lectures of Adam Smith and studied law. At Glasgow he met actors and actresses, some of them Catholic. It seemed to him that their religion was more compatible than Calvinism with a jolly life. He liked especially the doctrine of purgatory, which allowed a sinner to be saved after a few eons of burning. Suddenly James rode off to London in March 1760 and joined the Roman Church. His alarmed father sent a plea to the Earl of Eglinton, an Ayrshire neighbor living in London, to take James in hand. The Earl pointed out to the youth that as a Catholic he could never practice law or enter Parliament or inherit Auchinleck. James returned to Scotland and the Kirk and lived under the paternal roof and eye, but as the judge was busy, his son managed to catch a tartar, the first of his many bouts with venereal disease. Fearing that this reckless youth on inheriting Auchinleck would squander the estate in revelry, the father persuaded him, in return for an annuity of a hundred pounds, to sign a document giving the future management of the property to trustees named by Boswell Sr. On October 29, 1761, James came of age, and his annuity was doubled. In the following March, he impregnated Peggy Doig. In July, he passed his bar examination. On November 1, 1762, leaving ten pounds to Peggy, he set out for London. Her child was born a few days later. Boswell never saw it. In London, he took a comfortable room in Downing Street. By November 25th, he was really unhappy for want of women, but he remembered his infection, and the surgeon's fees in this city are very high. So he steeled himself to continence till I got some safe girl or was liked by some woman of fashion. His impression was that London provided every variety of courtesan, from the splendid madam at fifty guineas a night down to the civil nymph who will resign her engaging person to your honor for a pint of wine and a shilling. He developed a connection with a handsome actress, Louisa, whose long resistance seemed to attest hygiene. Finally he persuaded her and achieved quintuple ecstasy. She declared I was a prodigy. Eight days later he discovered that he had gonorrhea. By February 27th he felt cured. On March 25th he picked up a streetwalker and engaged her in armor with a prophylactic sheath. On March 27th I heard service at St. Dunstan's Church. On March 31st I strolled into the park and took the first whore I met. During the next four months Boswell's London Journal records similar bouts. On Westminster Bridge, in Shakespeare's Head Tavern, in the park, in a tavern on the Strand, in the Temple Law Courts, in the girl's home. This, of course, is only one side of the picture of a man, and to group these scattered episodes in one paragraph gives a false impression of Boswell's life and character. The other side of him was his enthusiastic love of great men. His first catch in this pursuit was Garrick, who sipped Boswell's compliments and took to him readily. But James aimed at the top. In Edinburgh he had heard Thomas Sheridan describe the erudition and meaty conversation of Samuel Johnson. It would be a kind of glory to meet this pinnacle of London's literary life. Chance helped him. On May 16, 1763, Boswell was drinking tea in Thomas Davis's bookshop in Russell Street when a man of most dreadful appearance entered. Boswell recognized him from a portrait of Johnson by Reynolds. He begged Davis not to reveal that he came from Scotland. Davis roguishly revealed it at once. Johnson did not lose the opportunity to remark that Scotland was a good country to come from. Boswell winced. 
Johnson complained that Garrick had refused him a free ticket for Miss Williams to a current play. Boswell ventured to say, Sir, I cannot think that Mr. Garrick would grudge such a trifle to you. Johnson bore down on him. Sir, I have known David Garrick longer than you have done, and I know no right you have to talk to me on the subject. This hardly promised a lifelong friendship. Boswell was stunned and mortified, but after some more conversation, I was satisfied that though there was a roughness in his manner, there was no ill nature in his disposition. Eight days later, encouraged by Davis and fortified by his pachydermatous audacity, Boswell presented himself at Johnson's rooms in the inner temple, and was received with kindness, if not with charm. On June 25th, Bear and Cub supped together at the Mitre Tavern in Fleet Street. I was quite proud to think on whom I was with. On July 22nd, Mr. Johnson and I had a room at the Turk's Head Coffee House. After this, Boswell wrote in his journal, I shall just mark Mr. Johnson's memorabilia as they rise up in my memory. So the great biography began. When, at his father's urging, Boswell left for the Netherlands on August 6, 1763, to study law, master and man jived so well that Johnson, aged fifty-three, accompanied Boswell, aged twenty-two, to Harwich to see him off. 2. Boswell Abroad He settled in Utrecht, studied law, learned Dutch and French, and, he tells us, read all of Voltaire's Essay sur les Meurs. He suffered at the outset a severe attack of melancholy, upbraided himself as a worthless philanderer, and thought of suicide. He blamed his recent dissipation on his loss of religious faith. I was once an infidel. I acted accordingly. I am now a Christian gentleman. He drew up an inviolable plan of self-reform. He would prepare himself for the duties of a Scottish laird. He would be steady to the Church of England and cleave to the Christian moral code. Never talk of yourself, but reverence thyself. Upon the whole, you will be an excellent character. He regained his interest in life when he was accepted in the homes of the well-to-do Dutch. Now he dressed in scarlet and gold, white silk stockings, handsome pumps, Barcelona handkerchief and elegant toothpick case. He fell in love with Isabella van Toyle, known to her admirers as Belle de Zoylen, and also as Zélide. We have already paid our respects to her as one of many brilliant women in the Holland of those years, but she avoided marriage, and Boswell convinced himself that he had rejected her. He tried Madame Helvink, a pretty widow, but found her delicious and impregnable. Finally, I determined to take a trip to Amsterdam and have a girl. Arrived there, he went to a bawdy house. I was hurt to find myself in the sinks of gross debauchery. The next day I went to a chapel and heard a good sermon. I then strolled through mean brothels in dirty lanes. He regained the dignity of human nature on receiving from a friend a letter of introduction to Voltaire. Having carried out his promise to his father that he would study faithfully at Utrecht, he received paternal permission and funds for the usual grand tour that crowned a young English gentleman's education. He bade farewell to Zélide, sure she had tears of love in her eyes, and on June 18, 1764, he crossed the border into Germany. For almost two years thereafter, he and Bell corresponded, exchanging compliments and barbs. From Berlin, July 9th, he wrote, As you and I, Zélide, are perfectly easy with each other, I must tell you that I am vain enough as to imagine that you really was in love with me. I am too generous not to undeceive you. I would not be married to you to be a king. My wife must be a character directly opposite to my dear Zélide, except in affection, in honesty, and in good humor. She did not answer. He wrote again on October 1st, assuring her that she loved him. She did not answer. He wrote again on December 25th. Mademoiselle, I am proud, and I shall be proud always. You ought to be flattered by my attachment. I know not if I ought to have been equally flattered by yours. A man who has a heart and mind like mine is rare. A woman with many talents is not so rare. Perhaps you are able to give me an explanation of your conduct toward me. Her reply deserves a place in the history of woman. I received your letter with joy and read it with gratitude. All those expressions of friendship and all those promises of eternal regard and of constantly tender recollection which you have collected, 
from her past words to him, are acknowledged and renewed by my heart at this moment. You went on repeating that I was in love with you. You would have me admit this. You were determined to hear me say it and say it again. I find this a very strange whim in a man who does not love me and thinks it incumbent upon him from motives of delicacy to tell me so in the most express and vigorous terms. I was shocked and saddened to find in a friend whom I had conceived of as a young and sensible man the puerile vanity of a fatuous fool. My dear Boswell, I will not answer for it that never at any moment may my talk, my tone, or my look have kindled with you. If it happened, forget it. But never lose the memory of so many talks when the pair of us were equally light-hearted. I well content in the flattery of your attachment, and you as happy to count me your friend as if there were something rare about a woman with many talents. Keep the memory, I say, and be sure that my tenderness, my esteem, I would even say my respect, are yours always. This letter chastened Boswell transiently. He kept his peace for a year. Then on June 16, 1766, he wrote from Paris to Zélide's father, asking for her hand. Would it not be a pity, if so fortunate an alliance were unrealized? The father answered that Zélide was considering another offer. A year later, Boswell sent her a direct proposal. She replied, I read your belated endearments with pleasure, with a smile. Well, so you once loved me. And she refused his offer. While this epistolary game was going on, Boswell had sampled many countries and women. In Berlin he saw Frederick on the parade ground, but no nearer. He took to his bed a pregnant chocolate vendor. She seemed a safe port. In Leipzig he met Gellert and Gottsched. At Dresden he visited the Grand Gallery of Pictures, which I was told is the noblest in Europe. He passed down through Frankfurt, Mainz, Karlsruhe, and Strasbourg into Switzerland. We have already accompanied him on his visits to Rousseau and Voltaire. In those exalted days the aura of genius and the fever of fame subdued the lust of youth. On January 1st, 1765, he left Geneva to cross the Alps. He spent nine exhilarating months in Italy, saw every major city, and sampled feminine wares at every stop. In Rome he sought out Winkelmann, kissed the Pope's slippered foot, brayed in St. Peter's, and caught his favorite disease again. He ascended Vesuvius with John Wilkes. In Venice he shared the same courtesan with Lord Mount Stuart, son of the Earl of Butte, and renewed his infection. In a month at Siena he courted Portia Sansedoni, the mistress of his friend Mount Stuart. He urged her not to let any sentiment of fidelity interfere with generosity, for... My lord is so formed that he is incapable of fidelity himself and does not expect it of you. His better side showed in his next exploit. From Livorno he took ship to Corsica on October 11, 1765. Paoli had liberated the island from Genoa in 1757 and was now in the eighth year of his rule of the new state. Boswell reached him at Solacaro and presented a letter of introduction from Rousseau. He was at first suspected as a spy, but I took the liberty to show him a memorial I had drawn up on the advantages to Great Britain from an alliance with Corsica. Thereafter he dined regularly with the general. He took many notes that served him later in writing his account of Corsica in 1768. He left the island on November 20th and traveled along the Riviera to Marseille. There a tall and decent pimp secured for him an honest, safe, and disinterested girl. From Aix-en-Provence, he began to send to the London Chronicle news paragraphs to be released in successive issues, from January 7, 1766, informing the British public that James Boswell was approaching England with first-hand data on Corsica. Arriving in Paris on January 12th, he received word from his father that his mother had died. He undertook to escort Rousseau's Thérèse Lavasseur to London. If we may believe him, she gave herself to him en route. He dallied in London for three weeks, saw Johnson on several occasions, and finally presented himself to his father in Edinburgh on March 7, 1766. His three years and four months of independence and travel had done something to mature him. It had not weakened his lust nor tempered his vanity, 
but it had broadened his knowledge and perspective, and had given him a new poise and self-confidence. He was now Corsican Boswell, a man who had dined with Paoli, and who was writing a book that might stir England to go to the Liberator's aid and make the island a British stronghold in a strategic sea. 3. Boswell at Home On July 29, 1766, he was admitted to the Scottish Bar, and for the next twenty years his life was centred in Edinburgh, with many forays into London and one to Dublin. Helped, perhaps, by his father's position as a judge, but also by his readiness in debate, he came into great employment and made sixty-five guineas in his first winter before the courts. An exuberant generosity mingled with his self-esteem, he defended the lowliest criminals, spent his florid eloquence on obviously guilty persons, lost most of his cases, and dissolved his fees in drink. After those sunny months in Italy he felt to his bones the cold of Scotland, for which there seemed no cure but alcohol. He continued his sexual wandering. He took a Mrs. Dodds as his mistress, but to supplement her services he lay all night with a common girl, and presently discovered that some infection had reached me. Three months later, in a vertigo of intoxication, he tells us that he went to a bawdy house and passed a whole night in the arms of a whore. She was a fine, strong, spirited girl, a whore worthy of Boswell, if Boswell must have a whore. Another infection. Obviously, marriage was the only device that could save him from physical and moral degeneration. He courted Catherine Blair. She rejected him. He fell in love with Mary Ann Boyd, an Irish lass with a Grecian form and a rich father. He followed her to Dublin in March 1769, lost his passion on the way, got drunk, went to an Irish prostitute, contracted venereal disease again. In February 1768, he sent to the press an account of Corsica, the journal of a tour to that island, and memoirs of Pascal Paoli. Its plea for British aid to Paoli caught the imagination of England and prepared public opinion to approve the action of the British government in sending secret arms and supplies to the Corsicans. The book sold 10,000 copies in England, it was translated into four languages, and gave Boswell more fame on the continent than Johnson enjoyed. On September 7, 1769, the author appeared at the Shakespeare Festival in Stratford in the garb of a Corsican chief, with Corsican Boswell inscribed on his hat. But as this was for a masquerade ball, it did not quite deserve the ridicule it received. His cousin Margaret Montgomery had accompanied him to Ireland and had borne humbly with his Irish courtship and revelry. She was two years older than he, and her one thousand pounds made her no equal match, as Boswell Sr. urged, for the heir of Auchinleck. But when he contemplated her patient devotion to him, it dawned upon him that she was a good woman and would make a good wife. Moreover, his reputation for lechery and drinking had narrowed his choice. The judge himself was contemplating marriage, which would put a stepmother between father and son, and might eat into the estate. Boswell begged his father not to marry. The father persisted. They quarreled. Boswell thought of going to America. On July 20th, 1769, he wrote to Peggy Montgomery, asking would she marry him and consent to go with him to America and live on his one hundred pounds a year and the interest on her one thousand pounds. He warned her that he was subject to periods of melancholy. Her reply of July 22nd deserves remembrance. I have thought fully as you desired— and I accept your terms. J.B., with a hundred pounds a year, is every bit as valuable to me as if possessed of the estate of Auchinleck. Free of ambition, I prefer real happiness to the splendid appearance of it. Be assured, my dear Jamie, you have a friend that would sacrifice everything for you, who never had a wish for wealth till now to bestow it on the man of her heart. On November 19th, the father married. On November 25th, the son the younger couple set up a separate household, and in 1771 they rented a flat from David Hume. James strove for sobriety, worked hard as an advocate, and rejoiced in the children his wife bore him. Apparently she discouraged his marital approaches during the later months of her repeated pregnancies. On October 27, 1772, he went to a prostitute after having too much wine. He excused himself by arguing that concubinage was permitted by Scripture. He resumed his drinking and added gambling. 
His journal noted on October 5, 1774, drank to intoxication. November 3rd, many of us drank from dinner till ten at night. November 4th, much intoxicated, fell with a good deal of violence. November 8th, drunk again. November 9th, I was very ill and could not get up till about two. December 24th, I was very drunk, stayed above an hour with two whores at their lodging in a narrow, dirty stair in the bow. I found my way home about twelve. I had fallen. His wife forgave him and cared for him in his illnesses. His drinking had many causes, his many failures at the bar, his difficulties with his father, his shame of his infidelities, his awareness that he had not realized the dreams of his vanity, and his distaste for life in Scotland. Almost yearly he ran off to London, partly to plead cases there, partly to savor the conversation of Johnson, Reynolds, Garrick, and Burke. In 1773 he was admitted to the club. In the fall of that year he proudly walked the streets of Edinburgh with Dr. Johnson at his side as a prelude to their tour of the Hebrides. At first on these London trips he remained faithful to his wife and wrote to her fondly, but by 1775 he had resumed his patronage of promiscuity. He was especially busy toward the end of March, 1776. When I got into the street, the whoring rage came upon me. I thought I would devote a night to it. His devotion continued for several nights. I thought of my valuable spouse with the highest regard and warmest affection, but had a confessed notion that my corporeal connection with whores did not interfere with my love for her. Another venereal infection sobered him transiently. These exploits and his subservience to Johnson earned him scornful comments from men like Horace Walpole and, posthumously, a lethal lashing by Macaulay, but they did not leave him friendless. My character as a man of parts and extensive acquaintance makes people fond of my attention. Most Londoners agreed with Boswell that no woman had a right to a whole man. If men like Johnson and Reynolds liked him, and many London homes were open to him, he must have had many amiable traits. Those men of discernment knew that he passed from woman to woman and from idea to idea, like a hasty traveller, scratching many surfaces but never reaching to the heart of the matter, never feeling the bruised soul behind the sacrificial flesh. And he knew it, too. "'I have really a little mind with all my pride,' he said. "'My brilliant qualities are like embroidery upon gauze. "'There is an imperfection a superficialness in all my notions. I understand nothing clearly, nothing to the bottom. I pick up fragments, but never have in my memory a mass of any size. It was those fragments and that memory that redeemed him. He made amends for his defects by worshipping in others the excellence that he could not achieve for himself, by attending upon them humbly, by remembering their words and deeds, and at last, with no minor artistry, placing them in an order and a light that made an unrivaled picture of a man and an age. And may we never be disrobed, in body and mind, in secret lust and indefatigable vanity, as thoroughly as this man, half lackey and half genius, revealed himself for posterity. Chapter 32 The Literary Scene 1756 to 1789 1. The Press in the background were newspapers, magazines, publishers, circulating libraries, theatres, all multiplying recklessly, bringing to an ever wider public the conflicts of parties and talents. Several journals were now born, the Literary Magazine and the Critical Review in 1756, the Public Ledger in 1760. Johnson's Rambler began in 1750. The Gentleman's Magazine, which fed Johnson in his struggling years, had begun in 1731 and was to survive till 1922. The London newspapers doubled their number and total circulation in this period. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 Continued Cassette 5, Side 2 The London newspapers doubled their number and total circulation in this period. The Monitor began in 1755, 
the North Britain in 1761, the Morning Chronicle in 1769, the Morning Herald in 1780, the Daily Universal Register in 1785, becoming the Times in 1788. The public advertiser struck gold in the letters of Junius. Its circulation rose from 47,500 to 84,000. Most of the other dailies subsisted on narrow clientels, so the circulation of the Times, in 1795, was only 4,800. They were more modest in size than in speech, usually four pages, one of which was given to advertisements. Johnson, in 1759, thought that newspaper advertising had reached its limit. Advertisements are now so numerous that they are very negligently perused, and it is therefore necessary to gain attention by magnificence of promise and by eloquence sometimes sublime and sometimes pathetic. The vendor of the beautifying fluid sells a lotion that repels pimples, washes away freckles, smooths the skin, and plumps the flesh. The trade of advertising is now so near perfection that it is not easy to propose any improvement. But as every art ought to be exercised in due subordination to the public good, I cannot but propose it as a moral question to these masters of the public ear whether they do not sometimes play too wantonly with our passions. Printers, booksellers, and publishers were still largely confused in one profession. Robert Dodsley had published Pope and Chesterfield, and now printed Walpole and Goldsmith. Thomas Davis had a popular bookshop, where he allowed leisurely browsing, and Johnson and others came there to sample the books and ogle the pretty wife. William Strawn won fame by publishing Johnson's Dictionary, Smith's Wealth of Nations, and Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, the latter two in the Annus Mirabilis, 1776. Oxford established the Clarendon Press in 1781. Booksellers paid well for good books, but could get hacks to prepare articles and compilations for a pittance. Says a bookseller in Henry Brooks' The Fool of Quality, from 1766, I can get one of these gentlemen, on whose education more money has been spent than would maintain a decent family to the end of the world. I can get one of them to labor like a hackney horse from morning to night at less wage than I could hire a porter or shoe-boy for three hours. Authors multiplied to saturation of the market, fought desperately for their starveling share, and satirized one another with poisoned ink. Women added to the competition, Mrs. Anna Barbold, Sarah Fielding, Mrs. Amelia Opie, Mrs. Elizabeth Inchbold, Mrs. Elizabeth Montague, Fanny Burney, Hannah Moore. A country parson entered the game and walked away with the prize. 2. Lawrence Stern He was not made for a parson. He was the son of a soldier, and was dragged from post to post for ten years. Then and afterward he picked up enough military lore to make Uncle Toby talk like an old general about sieges and forts. His mother he later described as the daughter of a poor sutter, peddler, who followed the camp in Flanders. However, his great-grandfather had been Archbishop of York, and the Stern family managed to get Lawrence to Cambridge on a scholarship. He took his degree there in 1737, but a lung hemorrhage in 1736 foretold a lifelong struggle with tuberculosis. Ordained an Anglican priest in 1738, he was given a modest vicarage at Sutton in the Forest near York. In 1741 he married Elizabeth Lumley and took her to live with him in his tattered rectory. She entrusted to him her forty pounds a year. He invested some of it in land, and it grew. Otherwise they were miserable. Both were consumptives, and both were made of nerves. Mrs. Stern soon concluded that the largest house in England could not contain them both on account of their turmoils and disputes. Her cousin, blue-stocking Elizabeth Montague, described her as a fretful porcupine, with whom one could avoid a quarrel only by keeping at a distance. Two children came, one died, the other, Lydia, became conspicuously attached to her mother. Unhappiness increased when Stern's mother and sister, who had been living in poverty in Ireland, came to York and appealed to him to settle eight pounds a year upon them out of his wife's income. The idea aroused no enthusiasm. Stern gave his mother some money and begged her to go back to Ireland. 
she remained in York. When she was arrested for vagrancy, Stern refused to bail her out. After eighteen years of arduous marriage, the vicar felt that any really Christian soul would allow him a little adultery. He fell in love with Catherine Formentel and swore, I love you to distraction and will love you to eternity. His wife accused him of infidelity. He denied it. She came so close to insanity that he put her and Lydia in care of a lunatic doctor and continued the liaison. Amid the tumult, he wrote one of the most famous books in English literature. His friends, having read some of the manuscript, begged him to eliminate gross allusions which could be matter of just offense, especially when coming from a clergyman. Sorrowfully, he deleted some 150 pages. The remainder he sent to the press anonymously. It was published in January 1760 as The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman. Enough scandal and whimsical humor remained in the two volumes to make them the literary event of the London year. Far off in Ferney, the Fuhrer echoed. A very unaccountable book, Voltaire reported, and an original one. They run mad about it in England. Hume called it the best book that has been writ by any Englishman these thirty years, bad as it is. At York, where Stern's authorship was an open secret and many local figures were recognized in the leading characters, two hundred copies were sold in two days. It is hard to describe the book, for it has no form or subject, no head or tail. The title is a trick, for the gentleman who tells the story and whose life and opinions were to be presented does not get born until page 209 of volume 4 of the original nine-volume edition. The substance of the tale is what happened or was said while he was being conceived and while he was growing leisurely in the womb. The first page is the best. I wish either my father or my mother, or indeed both of them, as they were in duty both equally bound to it, had minded what they were about when they begot me, had they duly considered how much depended upon what they were doing, that not only the production of a rational being was concerned in it, but that possibly the happy formation and temperature of his body, perhaps his genius and the very cast of his mind, might take their turn from the humors and dispositions which were then uppermost. Had they duly weighed and considered all this, and proceeded accordingly, I am verily persuaded I should have made a quite different figure in the world. "'Pray, my dear,' quoth my mother, "'have you not forgot to wind up the clock?' "'Good God!' cried my father. "'Did ever woman since the creation of the world "'interrupt a man with such a silly question?' "'From that contretemps onward the book consists of digressions. "'Stern had no tale to tell, "'much less that tale of love which is the burden of most fiction. "'He wished to amuse himself and the reader "'with whimsical discourse on everything, but in no order. "'He galloped around the big and little problems of life "'like a frisky horse in a field.' After writing sixty-four chapters, he bethought himself that he had given his book no preface. He inserted one at that point. This allowed him to make fun of his critics. He called his method the most religious, for I begin with writing the first sentence and trusting to Almighty God for the second, and to free association for the rest. Rabelais had done something of the sort. Cervantes had allowed Rosinante to lead him from episode to episode. Robert Burton had roamed the world before anatomizing melancholy. But Stern raised in consequence to a method, and freed all novelists from the need to have a subject or a plot. The leisure classes of Britain were delighted to see how much ado could be made about nothing, and how a book could be written in Anglo-Saxon English in the age of Johnson. Lusty Britons welcomed the jolly novelty of a clergyman talking about sex and flatulence, and the slit in Uncle Toby's pants— in March 1760, Stern went down to London to sip his success. He was happy to find the two volumes sold out. He took 630 pounds for them and two to come. Even the sermons of Mr. Yorick, published four months after Tristram, found ready sale when it was known that Yorick was Stern. Invitations came to the author from Chesterfield, Reynolds, Rockingham, even Bishop Warburton, who surprised him with fifty guineas, perhaps to escape adorning some satiric page in future volumes. Stern bought a carriage and team and drove in merry triumph back to York, where he preached in the Great Minster. He was presented to a richer parsonage at Coxwold, fifteen miles from York. He took his wife and daughter to live with him there, and there, with inconsequential facility, he wrote volumes three and four of Tristram. 
In December of that year, 1760, he went to London to see these volumes through the press. They were adversely reviewed, but the edition was sold out in four months. Now Tristram reached birth by forceps, which deformed his nose, whereupon the author sailed forth on a long discourse on the philosophy of noses, in the style of the most learned pundits. The shape of a child's nose, said one authority, was determined by the softness or hardness of the nursing breast. By sinking into it, as into so much butter, the nose was comforted, nourished, plumped up, refreshed, refossilated. After half a year in London, Stern returned to his wife, who told him she had been happier without him. He withdrew into his manuscript and wrote volumes five and six. In these, Tristram was almost forgotten, and Uncle Toby and Corporal Trim, with their war memories and toy forts, occupied the stage. In November 1761, the parson went off again to London, and on the last day of the year saw five and six published. They were well received. He flirted with Mrs. Elizabeth Vesey, one of the blue stockings, vowed he would give the last rag of his priesthood for a touch of her divine hand, had a lung hemorrhage, and fled to the south of France. He stopped long enough in Paris to attend some dinners at Dolbach's Synagogue of Atheists, where Diderot took a lasting fancy to him. Hearing that his wife was ill and that Lydia was developing asthma, Stern invited them to join him in France. All three settled down near Toulouse in July 1761. In March 1764 he left his wife and daughter with their consent and returned to Paris, London, and Coxwold. He wrote volumes 7 and 8 of Tristram, received advance payment for them, and sent part of the proceeds to Mrs. Stern. The new volumes appeared in January 1765 to waning acclaim. The shandy Toby vein was running thin. In October, Stern began a tour of eight months in France and Italy. On his way north, he joined his family in Burgundy. They asked to remain in France. He paid their expenses and returned to Coxwold in July 1766. Between hemorrhages, he wrote Volume 9. He went to London to see it born in January 1767 and enjoyed the furor caused by his skirting the brink of sex in describing Uncle Toby's wooing of Mrs. Wadman. Scandalized readers wrote to newspapers and the Archbishop of York, demanding that this shameless parson be unfrocked and evicted. The prelate refused. Stern, meanwhile, collected subscriptions, totaling £1,050, for a promised sentimental journey. He sent more money to his wife and made love to Elizabeth Draper. She was the wife of an East India Company official, then stationed in India. She had married him at fourteen when he was thirty-four. Stern sent her his books and proposed to follow them with his hand and his heart. For a while they saw each other daily and exchanged tender missives. The ten letters to Eliza voiced the last sad passion of a man dying of tuberculosis. "'Tis true I am ninety-five in constitution and you but twenty-five, but what I want in youth I will make up in wit and good humour. Not Swift so loved his Stella, Scarron his Maintenant, or Waller his Sacharissa, as I will love and sing thee, my wife-elect. For my wife cannot live long. Ten minutes after dispatching this letter he had a severe hemorrhage, and he bled till four in the morning. In April 1767, Mrs. Draper, summoned by her husband, sailed for India. From April 13th to August 4th, Stern kept a journal to Eliza, a diary of the miserable feelings of a person separated from a lady for whose society he languished. I will take thee on any terms, Eliza. I shall be so just, so kind to thee, I will deserve not to be miserable hereafter. In the journal, under April 21st, parted with twelve ounces of blood. A doctor told him he had syphilis. He protested it was impossible, for I have had no commerce whatever with the sex, not even with my wife these fifteen years. We will not reason about it, said the physician, but you must undergo a course of mercury. Other doctors confirmed the diagnosis. One assured him that taints of the blood lay dormant twenty years. He yielded, protesting his virtue. By June he had recovered and returned to Coxwold. While writing A Sentimental Journey, he suffered more hemorrhages and realized that he had not long to live. He went to London, saw the little book published in February 1768, and for the last time enjoyed the undiminished affection of his friends. As Tristram had recalled Rabelais, so the new volume reflected the rising influence of Richardson and Rousseau. 
But Stern's virtue was less irrefragable than Richardson's, and his tears less hot and sincere than Rousseau's. Perhaps it was this book and Henry Mackenzie's The Man of Feeling, from 1771, that made sentiment and sentimental fashionable words in England. Byron thought that Stern preferred whining over a dead ass to relieving a living mother. While Stern was enjoying his final triumph in London, he caught a cold, which grew into pleurisy. He wrote to a Mrs. James a pitiful letter asking her to care for Lydia if Mrs. Stern should die. Death came to him on March 18, 1768, in an inn on Old Bond Street, with no friends near. He was fifty-two years old. He had a bit of the mountebank in him, and made himself a motley to the view. But we can understand his sensitivity to women, and the strain that an unhappy marriage placed upon a man capable of such subtle perceptions and delicate artistry. He suffered much, gave much, and wrote one of the most peculiar books in all the history of literature. 3. Fanny Burney A woman briefly rivaled his success in fiction. She was born in 1752 to Charles Burney, the future historian of music. She was brought up on notes rather than on letters. Till she was eight she could not read. No one dreamed that she would be a writer. Her mother died when Francis was nine. As almost all the musicians who performed in London came to her father's home and attracted to it a good portion of the elite, Fanny acquired education by listening to words and music. She matured slowly, was shy and plain, and took forty years to find a husband. When her famous novel was published in January 1778, she was twenty-five, and was so fearful lest it displease her father that she concealed her authorship. Evelina, or a young lady's entrance into the world, made a stir. Anonymity aroused curiosity. Rumor said a girl of seventeen had written it. Johnson, who had been praised in its preface, praised it, and recommended it to Dr. Burney. Mrs. Thrale complained that it was too short. When Mrs. Thrale learned the secret, it spread over London. Fanny became a lioness of society. Everybody read her book, and my kind and most devoted father was so happy in my happiness. Her art lay in describing, with lingering memory and lively imagination, how the world of London society appeared to an orphaned girl of seventeen who had been brought up by a rural parson not at all like Lawrence Stern. Doubtless Fanny, too, had thrilled to Garrick's acting, and had felt, as Evelina wrote to her guardian, such ease, such vivacity in his manner, such grace in his motions, such fire and meaning in his eyes, and when he danced, oh, how I envied Clorinda! I almost wished to have jumped on the stage and joined them. London, wearying of its vice, felt cleansed by the fresh wind blowing from these youthful pages. That one's famous novel is dead, but the diary that Fanny kept is still a living part of English literature and history, for it offers a near view of celebrities from Johnson and George III to Herschel and Napoleon. Queen Charlotte made Miss Burney her keeper of the robes in 1786, and for the next five years Fanny dressed and undressed Her Majesty. The constrained and narrow life nearly stifled the authoress. At last her friends rescued her, and in 1793, youth quite gone, she married a ruined émigré, General D'Arblay. She supported him by her writings and her income. For ten years she lived with him in France and obscurity, isolated by the intensity of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. In 1814 she was allowed to return to England and received the last blessing of her father, who died at the age of eighty-eight. She herself lived to that age, into quite a different world, which did not realize that the famous Jane Austen, who died in 1817, had taken her inspiration from the forgotten novels of a forgotten lady who was still alive in 1840. 4. Horace Walpole this world, he said, is a comedy to those who think, a tragedy to those who feel. So he learned to smile at the world, even to humor his gout. He chronicled his time, but washed his hands of it. He was son of a prime minister, but had no pleasure in politics. He loved women, from Fanny Burney to the grandest duchesses, but would have none of them for a wife, nor, so far as we know, for a mistress. He studied philosophy, but thought the philosophers the bane and bore of the century. 
one author he admired without reserve for her fine manners and unaffected art, Madame de Sévigné, her alone he sought to emulate, and if his letters did not catch her gay charm and grace, they became, far more than hers, a living daily history of an age. Though he called them annals of bedlam, he wrote them with care, hoping that some of them would give him a nook in man's remembrance. For even a philosopher who is reconciled to decay finds it hard to accept oblivion. Horatio, so he was baptized in 1717, was the youngest of five children presented to Sir Robert Walpole, the doughty premier who sacrificed his reputation by preferring peace to war, but hardly heard it by preferring adultery to monogamy. Perhaps to avenge his first wife, gossipers for a time ascribed Horace's paternity to Carr, Lord Harvey, brother to the effeminate John, Lord Harvey of Ickworth who accused Sir Robert of attempting to seduce Lady Harvey. These matters are too intricate for present adjudication. We can only say that Horace was brought up with no imputation by his relatives of any undue origin. He was treated with busy indifference by the Prime Minister, and, he tells us, was indulged with extreme fondness by his mother. He was a very handsome boy and was dressed like a prince, but he was frail and diffident and as sensitive as a girl. When his mother died in 1737, many feared that the twenty-year-old youth would die of grief. Sir Robert comforted him with governmental sinecures that paid for his son's fine clothing, elegant living, and costly collection of art. Horace kept to the end of his life a latent hostility to his father, but always defended his politics. At ten he was sent to Eton, where he learned Latin and French and formed a friendship with the poet Gray. At seventeen he entered King's College, Cambridge. There he learned Italian and imbibed deism from Conyers Middleton. At twenty-two, without taking a degree, he set out with Gray on a tour of Italy and France. After some wandering, they settled for fifteen months in a Florentine villa as guests of the British Chargé d'Affaires, Sir Horace Mann. Walpole and Mann never met again, but they corresponded during the next forty-five years— from 1741 to 1785. At Reggio Emilia, Gray and Walpole quarreled, for Horace had paid all the bills, and the poet could not forgive the superior attentions received by the son of the man who was ruling England. In retrospect, Horace took the blame. I was too young, too fond of my own diversions, too much intoxicated by indulgence, vanity, and the insolence of my situation— not to have been inattentive and insensible to the feelings of one I thought below me, of one, I blush to say it, that I knew was obliged to me. They parted. Walpole nearly died of remorse or quinsy. He arranged for Gray's passage home. They were reconciled in 1745, and most of Gray's poems were printed by Walpole's press at Strawberry Hill. Meanwhile, at Venice, Walpole posed for a lovely pastel portrait by Rosalba Carriera. Before reaching England on September 12, 1741, Walpole had been elected to Parliament. There he made a modest and futile speech against the opposition that was bringing to an end his father's long and prosperous ministry. He was regularly re-elected till 1767, when he voluntarily withdrew from active politics. Generally, he supported the liberal Whig program. He resisted extension of the royal power, recommended a compromise with Wilkes, and denounced slavery in 1750, nine years before Wilberforce was born. He opposed the political emancipation of English Catholics on the ground that papists and liberty are contradictions. He rejected the American case against the Stamp Act, but he defended the claim of the American colonies to freedom and prophesied that the next zenith of civilization would be in America. Who but Machiavel, he wrote in 1786, can pretend that we have a shadow of title to a foot of land in India? He hated war, and when the Montgolfier brothers made their first balloon ascension in 1783, he predicted with horror the extension of war to the skies. I hope, he wrote, these new mechanic meteors will prove only playthings for the learned or the idle, and not be converted into engines of destruction to the human race, as is so often the case of refinements or discoveries in science." Finding himself too often on the losing side, he decided to spend most of his time in the country. In 1747 he rented five acres and a small house near Twickenham. 
Two years later, he bought the property and transformed the building in neo-Gothic style, as we have seen. Into this medievalized castle he gathered a variety of objects distinguished by art or history. Soon his home was a museum that required a catalogue. In one room he installed a printing press where he published in elegant formats thirty-four books, including his own. Chiefly from Strawberry Hill he sent out the 3,601 letters that survive. He had a hundred friends, quarreled with nearly all of them, made up, and was as kind as his delicate irritability would allow. Every day he set out bread and milk for the squirrels who courted him. He guarded his sinecures and angled for more, but when his cousin Henry Conway was dismissed from office, Walpole proposed to share his income with him. He had a thousand faults, which Macaulay meticulously accumulated in a brilliant and ungenerous essay. Walpole was vain, fussy, secretive, capricious, proud of his ancestry, and disgusted with his relatives. His humor tended to satire with sharp teeth. He carried to his grave and into his histories his scorn of all who had shared in deposing his father. He was often wildly biased, as in his descriptions of Lady Pumfret or Lady Mary Wortley Montague. His fragile frame inclined him to be something of a dilettante. If Diderot, in saint beuves illuminating phrase, was the most German of all Frenchmen, Walpole was the most French of all Englishmen. He was fearlessly candid about his uncommon tastes and views. He thought Virgil a bore, and a fortiori, Richardson and Stern. He called Dante a Methodist in Bedlam. He affected to disdain all authors, and insisted, like Congreve, that he wrote as a gentleman for his own amusement, not as a literary laborer dependent upon the merchandising of his words. So he wrote to Hume, You know in England we read their works, but seldom or never take any notice of authors. We think them sufficiently paid if their books sell, and of course leave them to their colleges and obscurity, by which means we are not troubled by their vanity and impertinence. I, who am an author, must own this conduct very sensible, for in truth we are a most useless tribe. But as he admitted he too was an author, vain and voluminous, bored in his castle, he explored the past as if wishing to sink the roots of his mind into the richest scenes. He drew up a catalogue of the royal and noble authors of England in 1758. Their nobility would excuse their authorship, and first-rate men like Bacon and Clarendon could qualify. He had three hundred copies printed and gave most of them away. Dodsley risked an addition of two thousand copies. They sold readily and brought Walpole such fame as must have made him hang his head in shame. He compounded his indignity with five volumes of Anecdotes of Painting in England. 1762-71, to 71, an engaging compilation which won Gibbon's praise. As if in recreation from such laborious scholarship, Walpole composed a medieval romance, The Castle of Otranto, in 1764, which became the mother of a thousand stories of supernatural wonders and terrors. He combined mystery with history in historic doubts on the life and reign of King Richard III, he contended, like others after him, that Richard had been maligned by tradition and Shakespeare. Hume and Gibbon called his arguments unconvincing. Walpole repeated them till his death. Turning to events of which he had first-hand knowledge, he composed memoirs of the reigns of George II and George III. They are illuminating but partisan. Imprisoned in his prejudices, he took a dark view of his time. Treacherous ministers, mock patriots, complacent parliaments, fallible princes— I see my country going to ruin, and no man with brains enough to save it. This was written in 1768, when Chatham had just created the British Empire. Fourteen years later, when the King and Lord North seemed to have ruined it, Walpole concluded, We are totally degenerated in every respect, which I suppose is the case of all falling states. A generation later, the little island defeated Napoleon. All mankind seemed to Walpole a menagerie of pygmy, short-lived, comical animals. He found no comfort in religion. He supported the established church, for it upheld the government that paid his sinecures, but he frankly termed himself an infidel. I begin to think that folly is matter and cannot be destroyed. Destroy its form, it takes another. For a while he thought he could find stimulation in France, in September 1765. All doors were opened to him. 
Madame du Defont welcomed him as a replacement for d'Alembert. She was sixty-eight, Walpole was forty-eight, but the interval disappeared as their kindred souls met in an affectionate exchange of despair. She was pleased to find that Walpole agreed with most of what Voltaire said, but would have gone to the stake to prevent him from saying it, for he trembled to think what would happen to Europe's governments if Christianity collapsed. He deprecated Voltaire, but he ridiculed Rousseau. It was on this trip to Paris that he wrote the letter, supposedly from Frederick the Great, inviting Rousseau to come to Berlin and enjoy more persecutions. The copies have spread like wildfire, and behold me a la mode. He succeeded Hume as the lion of the salons. He learned to love the gay and merciless excitement of Paris, but he was consoled to find the French ten times more contemptible than we English are. After reaching home on April 22, 1766, he began his long correspondence with Madame du Deffon. We shall see later how he fretted lest her affection make him ridiculous, yet it was probably to see her again that he revisited Paris in 1767, 1769, 1771, and 1775. Her love made him forget his age, but the death of Gray, on July 30, 1771, reminded him of his own mortality. He surprised himself by surviving till 1797. He had no financial worries. He had in 1784 an income of 8,000 pounds, or about $200,000 a year. And in 1791 he succeeded to the title of Lord Orford. But his gout, which had begun when he was twenty-five, continued to be his tribulation till the end. Sometimes, we are told, accumulations of chalk broke out from his fingers. He grew parched and stiff in his final years, and occasionally he had to be carried by his servants from room to room. But he kept on working and writing, and when visitors came they marveled at the bright interest in his eyes, the alertness of his courtesy, the gaiety of his speech, the alacrity and clarity of his mind. Almost every day distinguished people came to see his famous home and buried collection, Anna Moore in 1786, Queen Charlotte in 1795. Yet it was not at Strawberry Hill, but at his townhouse in Berkeley Square that he passed away, March 2, 1797, in his eightieth year. As if regretting that his memoirs and letters contained so many lines with a sting, he ordered his manuscripts to be locked in a chest, not to be opened till the first Earl of Waldegrave that shall attain the age of thirty-five years shall demand it. So the memoirs came to be published only in or after 1822, when all who might have taken offence would be dead. Some of the letters were published in 1778, more in 1818, 1820, 1840, 1857. All over the English reading world there are men and women who have read every word of those letters and who treasure them as among the most delightful legacies of the illuminating century. 5. Edward Gibbon Good historians, Walpole wrote to one of them, Robertson, are the most scarce of all writers, and no wonder. A good style is not very common. Thorough information is still more rare. And if these meet, what a chance that impartiality should be added to them. Gibbon did not quite meet the last test, but neither did Tacitus, who alone can stand with him among the supreme historians. 1. Preparation Gibbon wrote or began six autobiographies, which his literary executor, the first Earl of Sheffield, sewed into remarkably well-knit but unduly purified memoirs in 1796, sometimes known as his autobiography. Also, Gibbon kept a journal, begun in 1761 and continued under diverse titles, till January 28, 1763. These prime sources for his development have been judged reasonably accurate, except for his pedigree. He spent eight pages detailing a distinguished ancestry. Cruel genealogists have taken it from him. His grandfather, Edward Gibbon I, was among those directors of the South Sea Company who were arrested for malfeasance after that bubble exploded in 1721. Of his estate, which he reckoned at one hundred six thousand five hundred forty three pounds, all was confiscated except ten thousand pounds. On this, the historian tells us he erected the edifice of a new fortune not much inferior to the first. He did not approve the marriage of his son, Edward the Second, 
Hence his will left the major part of his wealth to his daughters, Catherine and Hester. Catherine's daughter married Edward Elliot, who later bought a seat in Parliament for Edward Gibbon III. Hester became a rich devotee of William Law, and long vexed her nephew by her dilatory dying. Edward II was tutored by Law, passed through Winchester School and Cambridge, married Judith Porton, and had seven children, of whom only Edward III survived childhood. He was born at Putney in Surrey, May 8, 1737. His mother died in 1747 of her seventh pregnancy. The father moved to a rural estate at Puritan, in Hampshire, fifty-eight miles from London, leaving the boy to be cared for by an aunt in the grandfather's house in Putney. There the future scholar made much use of the well-stored library. His frequent illnesses interrupted his progress at Winchester School, but he occupied his convalescent days with eager reading, mostly of history, especially of the Near East. Mohammed and his Saracens soon fixed my attention. I was led from one book to another till I had ranged round the circle of Oriental history. Before I was sixteen I had exhausted all that could be learned in English of the Arabs and Persians, the Tartars and Turks. Hence those fascinating chapters on Mohammed and the early caliphs and the capture of Constantinople. When aged fifteen he was sent to Magdalen College, Oxford, I arrived with a stock of erudition that might have puzzled a doctor, and a degree of ignorance of which a schoolboy would have been ashamed. He was too sickly to engage in sports, too shy to mingle at ease with other students. He would have been an apt pupil to a competent teacher, but eager to learn he found no professor eager to teach. Most of the faculty allowed their scholars to attend the lectures or not, and to spend half their time in the temptations of idleness. They indulged his improprieties of conduct, ill-chosen company, late hours, and inconsiderate expense, even excursions to Bath or London. However, he was too young and bashful to enjoy, like a manly Oxonian in town, the taverns and bagnos of Covent Garden. The faculty members were all clergymen who taught and took for granted the thirty-nine articles of the Anglican Church. Gibbon was combative and questioned his teachers. It seemed to him that the Bible and history justified the Catholic Church in its claim to a divine origin. A Catholic acquaintance procured him some unsettling books, chiefly Bossuet's Exposition of the Catholic Doctrine and the History of the Protestant Variations. These achieved my conversion, and I surely fell by a noble hand. With youthful precipitation he confessed to a Catholic priest and was received into the Church of Rome on June 8, 1753. He notified his father and was not surprised to be summoned home, for Oxford accepted no Catholic students, and according to Blackston, for a Protestant to be converted to Roman Catholicism was high treason. The scandalized parent hastily banished the youth to Lausanne and arranged to have him stay with the Calvinist pastor, there Edward lived at first in a mood of sullen obstinacy. But Monsieur Pavillard, though not indulgent, was kind, and the boy slowly warmed to him. Moreover, the pastor was a good classical scholar. Gibbon learned to read and write French as readily as English, and acquired an easy familiarity with Latin. Soon he was received into cultured families, whose manners and conversation were a better education than Oxford had given him. As his French improved, he felt the breezes of French rationalism blowing into Lausanne. When only twenty, in 1757, he attended with delight the plays presented by Voltaire in nearby Montvillon. I sometimes supped with the actors. He met Voltaire, he began to read Voltaire, he read Voltaire's recently published Essay sur l'histoire générale, Essay sur les mœurs. He pored over Montesquieu's Esprit des lois from 1748, and the Considération sur les causes de la grandeur des Romains et de leur décadence, from 1734, became the starting point of the decline and fall. In any case, the influence of the French philosophers, added to his reading of Hume and the English deists, undermined Gibbon's Christianity as well as his Catholicism, and M. Pavillard's victory for the Reformation was cancelled by Gibbon's secret acceptance of the Enlightenment. It must have been exhilarating to meet in the same year, 1757, both Voltaire and Suzanne Curchot. She was twenty, blonde, beautiful, gay, and lived with her Protestant parents at Crassy, 
four miles from Lausanne. She was the leading spirit in the Société du Printemps, a group of fifteen or twenty young women who met at one another's homes, sang, danced, acted comedies, and flirted judiciously with young men. Gibbon assures us that their virgin chastity was never sullied by the breath of scandal or suspicion. Let him tell the story. In her short visits to some relations at Lausanne, the wit, the beauty, and erudition of Mademoiselle Curchot were the theme of universal applause. The report of such a prodigy awakened my curiosity. I saw and loved. I found her learned without pedantry, lively in conversation, pure in sentiment, and elegant in manners. Her fortune was humble, but her family was respectable. She permitted me to make her two or three visits at her father's house. I passed some happy days there, and her parents honorably encouraged the connection. I indulged my dream of felicity. Apparently they were formally engaged in November 1757, but Suzanne's consent was conditional on Gibbon's promise to live in Switzerland. Meanwhile his father, confident that his son was now a good Protestant, bade him return home and hear the plans that had been made for him. Gibbon was not eager to go back, for the father had taken a second wife, but he obeyed and reached London on May 5, 1758. I soon discovered that my father would not hear of this strange alliance, and that without his consent I was myself destitute and helpless. After a painful struggle I yielded to my fate. I sighed as a lover, I obeyed as a son. He conveyed this sigh to Suzanne by a letter of August 24th. His father settled upon him an annuity of three hundred pounds. His stepmother earned his gratitude by bearing no children, and soon he developed an affection for her. He spent a large part of his income on books, and gradually formed a numerous and select library, the foundation of my works, and the best comfort of my life. He had begun at Lausanne, he finished at Buriton, where he spent his summers, an Essay sur l'étude de la littérature, which was published in London in 1761 and in Geneva in 1762. Written in French, and dealing chiefly with French literature and philosophy, it made no stir in England, but was received on the continent as a remarkable performance for a youth of twenty-two. It had some significant ideas on the writing of history. The history of empires is that of the misery of man. The history of knowledge is that of his greatness and happiness. A host of considerations makes the last order of study precious in the eyes of the philosopher. Hence, if philosophers are not always historians, it is at least desirable that historians should be philosophers. In his memoirs, Gibbon added, From earliest youth I aspired to the character of an historian. He cast about for a subject that would lend itself to philosophy and literature as well as to history. In the eighteenth century history made no pretense to be a science, rather it longed to be an art. Gibbon felt that it was as a philosopher and an artist that he wished to write history to deal with large subjects in a large perspective, and to give to the chaos of materials philosophical significance and artistic form. Suddenly he was called from scholarship to action. During the Seven Years' War, England had been repeatedly in danger of invasion from France. To prepare against such an emergency, the English gentry formed a militia for defense against invasion or rebellion. Only propertied persons could serve as officers. Gibbon, Sr. and Jr. were commissioned as major and captain in June 1759. Edward III joined his company in June 1760 and stayed with it on and off till December 1762, moving from camp to camp. He was ill-suited to military life and tired of companions who had neither the knowledge of scholars nor the manners of gentlemen. Amid his military career he found his scrotum expanding with fluid. I was obliged today... September 6th, 1762, to consult Mr. Andrews, a surgeon, in relation to a complaint I had neglected for some time. It was a swelling in my left testicle which threatens being a serious affair. He was bled and physicked, with only temporary relief. This hydrocele was to torment him until it caused his death. On January 25th, 1763, he set out upon a continental tour. This book is continued on Cassette 6, Side 1. And Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant Part 3 Continued Cassette 6, Side 1 
On January 25th, 1763, he set out upon a continental tour. He stopped some time in Paris, where he met d'Alembert, Diderot, Renal, and other luminaries of the Enlightenment. Four days in a week I had a place at the hospitable tables of Mesdames Geoffrin and Bocage, of the celebrated Helvetius, and of the Baron d'Olbach. Fourteen weeks insensibly stole away, but had I been rich and independent, I should have prolonged and perhaps have fixed my residence at Paris. In May 1763 he reached Lausanne, where he remained almost a year. He saw Mademoiselle Couchot, but finding her well courted, he made no attempt to renew his friendship with her. In the second stay in Switzerland, he confesses, the habits of the militia and the example of my countrymen betrayed me into some riotous intemperance, and before my departure I had deservedly forfeited the public opinion which had been acquired by my better days. He lost substantial sums in gambling, but he continued his studies in preparation for Italy, poring over ancient medals, coins, itineraries, and maps. In April 1764 he crossed the Alps. He spent three months in Florence, then went on to Rome. In the daily labor of eighteen weeks, a Scotch expatriate guided him among the remains of classical antiquity. It was at Rome on the 15th of October, 1764, as I sat musing amidst the ruins of the capital, while the barefooted friars were singing vespers in the temple of Jupiter, that the idea of writing the decline and fall of the city first started to my mind. But my original plan was circumscribed to the decay of the city, rather than of the empire. He came to think of that fateful disintegration as the greatest, perhaps, and most awful scene in the history of mankind. After visiting Naples, Padua, Venice, Vicenza, and Verona, he returned through Turin and Lyon and Paris, another happy fortnight, to London on June 25, 1765. Spending most of his time now at Buriton, he let himself be diverted into beginning, in French, a history of Switzerland. Hume, having seen the manuscript in London, wrote to Gibbon on October 24, 1767, begging him to use English, and predicting that English would soon surpass the French language in spread and influence. Moreover, he warned Gibbon that his use of the French tongue had led him into a style more poetical and figurative and more highly colored than our language seems to admit of in historical productions. Gibbon later admitted, My ancient habits encouraged me to write in French for the continent of Europe, but I was conscious myself that my style— above prose and below poetry, degenerated into a verbose and turgid declamation. The death of his father on November 10, 1770, left him an ample fortune. In October 1772, he took up permanent residence in London. No sooner was I settled in my house and library than I undertook the composition of the first volume of my history. He allowed himself many distractions, evenings at White's, attendance at Johnson's Club, trips to Brighton, Bath, Paris. In 1774 he was elected to Parliament from a pocket borough controlled by a relative. He kept silence amid the debates in the House of Commons. "'I am still mute,' he wrote on February 25, 1775. "'It is more tremendous than I imagined. The great speakers fill me with despair, the bad ones with terror.' But the eight sessions that I sat in Parliament were a school of civil prudence, the first and most essential virtue of an historian. Surrounded by the controversy on America, he voted regularly for the policy of the government. He addressed to the French nation a mémoire justificatif in 1779, presenting England's case against her revolting colonies and he received as a reward a seat on the Board of Trade and Plantations, bringing him seven hundred fifty pounds a year. Fox accused him of profiting by the same kind of political corruption which he indicated as one cause of the decline of Rome. The wits said George III had bought Gibbon, lest the author record the decline and fall of the British Empire. 2. The Book after 1772, Gibbon's absorbing concern was his history, and he found it difficult to think seriously about anything else. Many experiments were made before I could hit the middle tone between a dull chronicle and a rhetorical declamation. 
Three times did I compose the first chapter, and twice the second and third, before I was tolerably satisfied with their effect. He was resolved to make his history a work of literature. In 1775, Gibbon offered the manuscript of the first sixteen chapters to a publisher, who refused it as necessitating a prohibitive price. Two other booksellers, Thomas Caldwell and William Strawn, pooled their risks in printing. On February 17, 1776, Volume One of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Though it was priced at a guinea, about twenty-six dollars, the thousand copies were sold by March 26th. A second edition of fifteen hundred copies, issued on June third, was exhausted in three days. My book was on every table, and almost on every toilette. The literary world, usually rent with factional jealousies, united in praising it. William Robertson sent generous compliments. Hume, in this year of his death, wrote to the author a letter which, said Gibbon, overpaid the labor of ten years. Horace Walpole, on the day after publication, announced to William Mason, Lo, there has just appeared a truly classic work. The book began logically and bravely with three scholarly chapters detailing the geographical extent, the military organization, the social structure, and the legal constitution of the Roman Empire at the death of Marcus Aurelius in A.D. 180. The preceding eighty-four years, Gibbon felt, had seen the empire at its peak of official competence and public content. If a man were called upon to fix the period in the history of the world during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, he would, without hesitation, name that which elapsed from the death of Domitian, ninety-six, to the accession of Commodus, one eighty. The vast extent of the Roman Empire was governed by absolute power, under the guidance of virtue and wisdom. The armies were restrained by the firm but gentle hand of four successive emperors, whose characters and authority commanded involuntary respect. The forms of the civil administration were carefully preserved by Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the Antonines, who delighted at the image of liberty, and were pleased with considering themselves as the accountable ministers of the laws. The labors of these monarchs were overpaid by the honest pride of virtue and by the exquisite delight of beholding the general happiness of which they were the authors. But Gibbon recognized the instability of a happiness which must depend on the character of a single man. The fatal moment was perhaps approaching when some licentious youth or some jealous tyrant would abuse that absolute power. The good emperors had been chosen by adoptive monarchy, each ruler transmitting his authority to a chosen and trained member of his entourage. Marcus Aurelius allowed the imperial power to pass down to his worthless son Commodus. From that accession, Gibbon dated the decline. Gibbon thought that the rise of Christianity had contributed to that decline. Here he abandoned the lead of Montesquieu, who had said nothing like this in his greatness and decadence of the Romans, Gibbon rather followed Voltaire. His attitude was thoroughly intellectual. He had no sympathy for mystic rapture or hopeful faith. He expressed his view in a passage that has a Voltairean flavor. The various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false, and by the magistrate as equally useful, and thus toleration produced religious concord. Gibbon usually avoided any direct expression of hostility to Christianity. There were still laws on the statute books of England making such expression a serious crime. For example, if any person educated in the Christian religion shall by writing deny the Christian religion to be true, he shall for the second offense suffer three years' imprisonment without bail. To avoid such inconvenience, Gibbon developed subtle suggestion and transparent irony as elements in his style. He carefully pointed out that he would discuss not the primary and supernatural sources of Christianity, but only the secondary and natural factors in its origin and growth. Among these secondary factors he listed the pure and austere morals of the Christians in their first century, but he added as another cause the inflexible, and if we may use the expression, the intolerant zeal of the Christians. And while he praised the union and discipline of the Christian republic, 
He noted that it gradually formed an independent and increasing state in the heart of the Roman Empire. In general, he reduced the early progress of Christianity from a miracle to a natural process. He removed the phenomenon from theology to history. How had Christianity made for the decline of Rome? First, by sapping the faith of the people in the official religion, and thereby undermining the state which that religion supported and sanctified. This, of course, was precisely the argument of the theologians against the philosoph. The Roman government distrusted the Christians as forming a secret society hostile to military service and diverting men from useful employments to concentration on heavenly salvation. The monks, in Gibbon's judgment, were idlers who found it easier to beg and pray than to work. Other sects could be tolerated because they were tolerant and did not imperil the unity of the nation. The Christians were the only new sect that denounced all others as vicious and damned and openly predicted the fall of Babylon, that is, Rome. Gibbon attributed much of this fanaticism to the Judaic origin of Christianity, and he followed Tacitus in denouncing the Jews at various points in his narrative. He proposed to interpret Nero's persecution of the Christians as really a persecution of the Jews. This theory has no supporter today. With more success, he followed Voltaire in reducing the number of Christians martyred by the Roman government. He reckoned them to be two thousand at most, and agreed with Voltaire that the Christians, in the course of their intestine dissensions, since Constantine, have inflicted far greater severities on each other than they have experienced from the zeal of infidels, and the Church of Rome defended by violence the empire she had acquired by fraud. These concluding chapters, 15 and 16, of Volume 1, aroused many replies accusing Gibbon of inaccuracy, unfairness, or insincerity. Ignoring his critics for the time being, he treated himself to an extended vacation in Paris from May to November 1777. Suzanne Courchot, become the wife of the banker and finance minister Jacques Necker, invited him to their home. She was now too comfortable to resent his having sighed as a lover, obeyed as a son, and M. Necker, so far from being jealous, often left the former lovers alone and went to business or bed. Could they insult me more cruelly? Gibbon complained. What an impertinent security! Suzanne's daughter, Germaine, the future Madame de Stal, found him such good company that she, aged eleven, tried her budding arts on him and offered to marry him so as to keep him in the family. At the Neckers he met the Emperor Joseph II. At Versailles he was presented to Louis XVI, who was said to have shared in translating Volume I into French. He was fated in the salons, particularly by the Marquise du Deffon, who found him gentle and polite, superior to nearly all the persons among whom I live, but pronounced his style declamatory, oratorical, and in the tone of our professed wits. He rejected an invitation from Benjamin Franklin with a card saying that, though he respected the American envoy as a man and a philosopher, he could not reconcile it with his duty to his king to have any conversation with a revolted subject. Franklin replied that he had such high regard for the historian that if ever Gibbon should consider the decline and fall of the British Empire as a subject, Franklin would be happy to furnish him with some relevant materials. Back in London, Gibbon prepared a reply to his critics. A vindication of some passages in the fifteenth and sixteenth chapters of the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. This in 1779. He dealt briefly and courteously with his theological opponents, but he rose to some temper in handling Henry Davis, a youth of twenty-one who had, in 284 pages, accused Gibbon of inaccuracies. The historian admitted some mistakes, but denied willful misrepresentations, gross errors, and servile plagiarisms. The vindication was generally received as a successful rebuttal. Gibbon made no further reply to criticism except casually in the memoirs, but he found place for some conciliatory compliments to Christianity in his later volumes. His writing was accelerated by the loss of his seat in Parliament on September 1, 1780. Volumes 2 and 3 of the history were published on March 1, 1781. They were quietly received. 
The barbarian invasions were an old story, and the long and expert discussions of the heresies that had excited the Christian church in the fourth and fifth centuries were of no interest to a generation of worldly skeptics. Gibbon had sent an advance copy of Volume Two to Horace Walpole. He visited Walpole in Berkeley Square, and was chagrined to be told that there is so much of the Arians and Eunomians and Semi-Pelagians that though you have written the story as well as it could be written, I fear few will have patience to read it. From that hour to this, Walpole wrote, I have never seen him, though he used to call once or twice a week. Gibbon later agreed with Walpole. Volume two recovered life when Constantine came to the front. Gibbon interpreted the famous conversion as an act of statesmanship. The emperor had perceived that the operation of the wisest laws is imperfect and precarious. They seldom inspire virtue, they cannot always restrain vice. Amid the chaos of morals, economy, and government in the disrupted empire, a prudent magistrate might observe with pleasure the progress of a religion which diffused among the people a pure, benevolent, and universal system of ethics, adapted to every duty and every condition of life, recommended as the will and reason of the supreme deity, and enforced by the sanction of eternal rewards or punishments. That is, Constantine recognized that the aid of a supernatural religion was a precious aid to morality, social order, and government. Then Gibbon penned 150 eloquent and impartial pages on Julian the Apostate. He ended Chapter 38 and Volume 3 with a footnote praising George III's pure and generous love of science and of mankind. In June 1781, by the aid of Lord North, Gibbon was re-elected to Parliament, where he resumed his support of the ministry. The fall of Lord North in 1782 brought an end to the Board of Trade and to Gibbon's post therein. I was stripped of a convenient salary of seven hundred and fifty pounds a year. When North took a place in the coalition ministry in 1783, Gibbon applied for another sinecure. He received none. Without additional income I could not long or prudently maintain the style of expense to which I was accustomed. He calculated that he could afford that style in Lausanne, where his pounds sterling had twice the purchasing power they had in London. He resigned his seat in Parliament, sold all his impersonal effects except his library, and on September 15, 1783, he left London, its smoke and wealth and noise, for Lausanne. There he shared a comfortable mansion with his old friend, Georges de Verdun. Instead of looking on a paved court twelve feet square, I command a boundless prospect of vale, mountain, and water. His two thousand books reached him after some delay, and he proceeded with volume four. He had originally planned to end the decline and fall with the conquest of Rome in 476, but after publishing Volume 3 he began to wish for the daily task, the active pursuit which gave a value to every book and an object to every inquiry. He decided to interpret Roman Empire to mean the Eastern as well as the Western Empire, and to continue his narrative to the destruction of Byzantine rule through the conquest of Constantinople by the Turks in 1453. So he added a thousand years to his scope and undertook hundreds of new subjects requiring arduous research. Volume 4 included masterly chapters on Justinian and Belisarius, a chapter on Roman law which won high praise from jurists, and a dreary chapter on the further wars within Christian theology. I wish, wrote Walpole, Mr. Gibbon had never heard of Monophysites, Nestorians, or any such fools. In Volume 5, Gibbon turned with evident relief to the rise of Mohammed and the Arab conquest of the Eastern Roman Empire, and he lavished upon the Prophet and the Martial Caliphs all the impartial understanding that had failed him in the case of Christianity. In Volume 6, the Crusades gave him another stirring theme, and the capture of Constantinople by Mohammed II provided the climax and crown of his work. In the final chapter, he summarized his labors in a famous sentence. I have described the triumph of barbarism and religion. Like his unacknowledged teacher, Voltaire, he saw nothing in the Middle Ages but crudity and superstition. He pictured the ruinous state of Rome in 1430 and quoted Poggio's lament, this spectacle of the world, how it has fallen, how changed, how defaced. The destruction or dilapidation of classic monuments and art 
the Forum Romanum overgrown with weeds and possessed by cattle and swine. And Gibbon concluded sadly, It was among the ruins of the capital that I first conceived the idea of a work which has amused and exercised nearly twenty years of my life, and which, however inadequate to my own wishes, I finally delivered to the curiosity and candor of the public. And in his memoirs he recalled that hour of ambivalent deliverance. It was on the night of the 27th of June, 1787, between the hours of eleven and twelve, that I wrote the last lines of the last page in a summer-house in my garden. After laying down my pen, I took several turns in a covered walk of acacias, which commands a prospect of the country, the lake, and the mountains. I will not dissemble the emotions of joy on the recovery of my freedom, and perhaps the establishment of my fame. But my pride was soon humbled, and a sober melancholy was spread over my mind by the idea that I had taken an everlasting leave of an old and agreeable companion, and that whatever might be the future fate of my history, the life of the historian must be short and precarious. 3. The Man Gibbon at sixteen was described by M. Pavillard as a thin little figure with a large head. Hating exercise and loving food, he soon developed a rotundity of body and face, a portly belly sustained by spindly legs. Add red hair curled at the side and tied at the back, gentle cherubic features, a button nose, puffy cheeks, multiple chin, and above all a broad high forehead promising enterprises of great pith and moment, majesty and scope. He rivaled Johnson in appetite and Walpole in gout. His scrotum swelled painfully year by year to proportions which his tight breeches set off to disconcerting prominence. Despite his handicaps, he was vain of his appearance and his dress, and prefaced Volume Two with his portrait by Reynolds. He carried a snuff-box at his waist, and tapped it when nervous or wishing to be heard. He was self-centered, like any man with an absorbing purpose, but he truthfully claimed, I am endowed with a cheerful temperament, a moderate sensibility, but no sentiment, and a natural disposition to repose. In 1775 he was elected to the club. He attended frequently, but rarely spoke, disliking Johnson's idea of conversation. Johnson commented too audibly on Gibbon's ugliness. Gibbon called the great bear an oracle, an unforgiving enemy, a bigoted though vigorous mind, greedy of every pretext to hate and persecute those who dissent from his creed. Boswell, feeling no mercy for an infidel, described the historian as an ugly, affected, disgusting fellow, who poisons our literary club for me. Nevertheless, Gibbon must have had many friends, for in London he dined out almost every night. He came from Lausanne to London in August 1787 to supervise the publication of volumes 4 through 6. They appeared on his 51st birthday, May 8, 1788, and brought him 4,000 pounds, one of the highest fees paid to an author in the 18th century. The conclusion of my work was generally read and variously judged, yet upon the whole the history of the decline and fall seems to have struck root both at home and abroad, and may perhaps a hundred years hence still continue to be abused. Already Adam Smith ranked him at the head of the whole literary tribe at present existing in Europe. On June 13, 1788, during the trial of Hastings in Westminster Hall, Gibbon in the gallery had the pleasure of hearing Sheridan, in one of his most dramatic addresses, refer to the luminous pages of Gibbon. According to an unlikely story, Sheridan later claimed to have said voluminous, but that adjective could hardly be applied to pages, and luminous was surely the fitting word. In July 1788, Gibbon returned to Lausanne. A year later, De Verdun died, leaving his home to Gibbon for the duration of the historian's life. There, with several servants and an income of twelve hundred pounds a year, Gibbon lived at ease, drank much wine, and added to his gout and girth. From February 9th to July 1st, 1790, I was not able to move from my house or chair. To this period belongs the legend that he knelt at the feet of Madame de Cruzaz with a declaration of love, that she bade him rise and that he could not, being too heavy. The sole source of the story is Madame de Genlis, whom Sainte-Beuve described as 
a woman with a malicious tongue, and her own daughter rejected the tale as due to a confusion of persons. The French Revolution interfered with Gibbon's tranquility. Revolutionary sentiments were voiced in the Swiss cantons, and word came of similar agitation in England. He had good reason to fear the collapse of the French monarchy, having invested thirteen hundred pounds in a French government loan. In 1788, in an unlucky prophecy, he had written of the French monarchy that it stood founded, as it might, on the rock of time, force, and opinion, supported by the triple aristocracy of the Church, the nobility, and the parliaments. He rejoiced when Burke issued Reflections on the Revolution in France in 1790. He wrote to Lord Sheffield advising against any reform in the British political structure. If you admit the smallest and most specious change in our parliamentary system, you are lost. Now he deplored the success of the philosophe in combating religion. I have sometimes thought of writing a dialogue of the dead in which Lucian, Erasmus, and Voltaire should mutually acknowledge the danger of exposing an old superstition to the contempt of the blind and fanatical multitude. He urged some Portuguese leaders not to abandon the Inquisition during this crisis that threatened all thrones. Partly to escape the French revolutionary army that was nearing Lausanne, partly to seek English surgery, and proximately to comfort Lord Sheffield on the death of his wife, Gibbon left Lausanne on May 9, 1793, and hurried to England. There he found Sheffield so busy with politics as to have rapidly recovered from his grief. The patient was cured, Gibbon wrote, before the arrival of the doctor. The historian himself now submitted to the physicians, for his hydrocele had grown almost as big as a small child. I crawl about with some labor and much indecency. One operation drained four quarts of transparent watery liquid from the affected testicle. But the fluid collected again, and the second tapping drew three quarts. Gibbon was temporarily relieved and resumed dining out. Once more the hydrocele formed, now it became septic. On January 13th, 1794, a third tapping was made. Gibbon seemed to be recovering rapidly. The doctor allowed him meat. Gibbon ate some chicken and drank three glasses of wine. He was seized with severe gastric pains, which, like Voltaire, he sought to ease with opium. On January 16th he died, aged 56. 4. THE HISTORIAN Gibbon was not inspiring in his visible person, character, or career. His greatness was poured into his book, into the grandeur and courage of its conception, the patience and artistry of its composition, the luminous majesty of the whole. Yes, Sheridan's word was right. Gibbon's style is as luminous as irony would allow, and it shed light wherever it turned, except where prejudice darkened his view. His diction was molded by his Latin and French studies. He found simple Anglo-Saxon words unsuitable to the dignity of his manner, and often he wrote like an orator. Livy sharpened with the satire of Tacitus, Burke brightened with the wit of Pascal. He balanced clauses with the skill and delight of a juggler, but played the game so often that sometimes it neared monotony. If his style seems pompous, it fitted the reach and splendor of his theme— the thousand-year crumbling of the greatest empire the world had ever seen. The venial sins of his style are lost in the masculine march of the narrative, the vigor of the episodes, the revealing portraits and descriptions, the magisterial summations that cover a century in a paragraph, and merry philosophy to history. Having undertaken so extensive a subject, Gibbon felt justified in narrowing its limits. Wars and the administration of public affairs, he said, are the principal subjects of history. He excluded the history of art, science, and literature, so he had nothing to say about Gothic cathedrals or Moslem mosques, about Arabic science or philosophy. He crowned Petrarch but passed Dante by. He paid almost no attention to the condition of the lower classes, the rise of industry in medieval Constantinople and Florence. He lost interest in Byzantine history after the death of Heraclius in 641. He failed, in the judgment of Bury, to bring out the momentous fact that till the twelfth century the Eastern Roman Empire was the bulwark of Europe against the East, nor did he appreciate its importance in preserving the heritage of Greek civilization. 
Within his set limits, Gibbon achieved greatness by connecting effects with natural causes and by reducing the immensity of his materials to intelligible order and a guiding perspective of the whole. His scholarship was immense and detailed. His footnotes are a treasury of learning lightened with wit. He studied the most recondite aspects of classical antiquity, including roads, coins, weights, measures, laws. He made mistakes which specialists have corrected, but the same Berry who pointed out his errors added, if we take into account the vast range of his work, his accuracy is amazing. He could not, like professional historians confining themselves to a small area of subject, place, and time, burrow into unprinted original sources. To get his work done, he restricted himself to printed material and frankly relied in part on secondary authorities like Ockley's History of the Saracens or Tillemont's Histoire des Empereurs and Histoire Ecclesiastique. And some of the authorities he relied upon are now rejected as untrustworthy. He declared his sources in honest detail and thanked them. So when he passed beyond the time that Tillemont treated, he said in a footnote, Here I must take leave forever of that incomparable guide. What conclusions did Gibbon reach from his study of history? Sometimes he followed the philosophe in accepting the reality of progress. We may acquiesce in the pleasing conclusion that every age in the world has increased and still increases the real wealth, the happiness, the knowledge, and perhaps the virtue of the human race. But in less amiable moments, and perhaps because he had taken war and politics and theology as the substance of history— he judged history to be, indeed, little more than the register of the crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. He saw no design in history. Events are the outcome of unguided causes. They are the parallelogram of forces of different origin and composite result. In all this kaleidoscope of events, human nature seems to remain unchanged. Cruelty, suffering, and injustice have always afflicted mankind, and always will, for they are written in the nature of man. Man has much more to fear from the passions of his fellow creatures than from the convulsions of the elements. Child of the Enlightenment, Gibbon longed to be a philosopher, or at least to write history on philosophe. An enlightened age requires from the historian some tincture of philosophy and criticism. He loved to interrupt his narrative with philosophical comments, but he did not profess to reduce history to laws or to formulate a philosophy of history. On some basic questions, however, he took a stand. He confined the influence of climate to the early stages of civilization. He rejected race as a determining factor, and he acknowledged, within limits, the influence of exceptional men. In human life, the most important scenes will depend upon the character of a single actor. An acrimonious humor falling upon a single fiber of one man may prevent or suspend the misery of nations. When the Quraysh could have assassinated Mohammed, the lance of an Arab might have changed the history of the world. If Charles Martel had not defeated the Moors at Tours in 732, the Moslems might have overrun all Europe. The interpretation of the Koran would now be taught in the schools of Oxford, and her pupils might demonstrate to a circumcised people the sanctity and truth of the revelation of Mohammed. From such calamities was Christendom delivered by the genius and fortune of one man. However, for maximum influence on his time, the exceptional individual must stand upon some wide support. The effects of personal valor are so inconsiderable, except in poetry or romance, that victory must depend upon the degree of skill with which the passions of the multitude are combined and guided for the service of a single man. All in all, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire may be ranked as the supreme book of the eighteenth century— with Montesquieu's L'Esprit des Lois as its closest competitor. It was not the most influential. It could not compare in effect upon history with Rousseau's Social Contract or Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations or Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. But as a work of literary art, it was unsurpassed in its time or kind. When we ask how Gibbon came to produce such a masterpiece, we perceive that it was the accidental combination of ambition with money, leisure, and ability— and we wonder how soon such a combination can be expected to recur. Never, said another historian of Rome, Bartold Niebuhr, Gibbon's work will never be excelled. 6. Chatterton and Cooper 
Who would now suppose that in 1760 the most popular of living English poets was Charles Churchill? Son of a clergyman and himself ordained an Anglican priest, he took to the pleasures of London, dismissed his wife, rolled up debts, and wrote a once famous poem, The Rashiad, in 1761, which enabled him to pay his debts, to settle an allowance on his wife, and to set up in glaringly unclerical attire as a man about town. His poem took its name from Quintus Roscius, who had dominated the Roman theatre in Caesar's day. It satirized the leading actors of London and made Garrick wince. One victim ran about the town like a stricken deer. Churchill joined Wilkes in the ribald rites of Medmenham Abbey, helping him write the North Britain, and went to France to share Wilkes's exile. But he died at Bologna in 1764 of a drunken debauch and with Epicurean indifference. Another clergyman, Thomas Percy, lived up to his cloth, became Bishop of Dromore in Ireland, and made a mark on European literature by rescuing from the hands of a housemaid who was about to burn it an old manuscript that provided one source for his relics of ancient poetry in 1765. These ballads from medieval Britain appealed to old memories and encouraged the romantic spirit, so long subdued by rationalism and the classic temper, to express itself in poetry, fiction, and art. Wordsworth dated from these relics the rise of the Romantic movement in English literature. Macpherson's Ossian, Chatterton's Poems, Walpole's Castle of Otranto and Strawberry Hill, Beckford's Vatek and Fonthill Abbey, were varied voices joining in the cry for feeling, mystery, and romance. For a time the Middle Ages captured the modern soul. Thomas Chatterton began his attempt to medievalize himself by brooding over old parchments which his uncle had found in a Bristol church. Born in that city in 1752, soon after his father's death, the sensitive and imaginative boy grew up in a world of his own historic fancies. He studied a dictionary of Anglo-Saxon words and composed, in what he thought was 15th century language, poems which he pretended to have found in St. Mary Radcliffe Church which he ascribed to Thomas Rowley, an imaginary 15th-century monk. In 1769, aged 17, he sent some of these Rowley poems to Horace Walpole, who had himself published Otranto as a medieval original five years before. Walpole praised the poems and invited more. Chatterton sent more and asked for help in finding a publisher and some remunerative employment in London. Walpole submitted the verses to Thomas Gray and William Mason, both of whom pronounced them forgeries. Walpole wrote to Chatterton that these scholars were by no means satisfied with the authenticity of his supposed manuscripts, and he advised him to put poetry aside until he could support himself. Then Walpole went off to Paris, forgetting to return the poems. Chatterton wrote three times for them. Three months passed before they came. The poet went to London in April 1770 and took an attic room in Brook Street, Holborn. He contributed pro Wilkes articles and some of the Rowley poems to various periodicals, but was so poorly paid, eightpence per poem, that he could not sustain himself on the proceeds. He tried and failed to secure a post as surgeon's assistant on an African trader. On August 27th, he composed a bitter valedictory to the world. Farewell, Bristolia's dingy piles of brick, lovers of mammon, worshippers of trick. Ye spurned the boy who gave you antique lays, and paid for learning with your empty praise. Farewell, ye guzzling aldermanic fools, by nature fitted for corruption's tools. Farewell, my mother, cease my anguished soul, nor let distraction's billows o'er me roll. Have mercy, heaven, when here I cease to live, and this last act of wretchedness forgive. Then he killed himself by drinking arsenic. He was seventeen years and nine months old. He was buried in a pauper's grave. His poems now filled two volumes. Had he called them imitations instead of originals, he might have been recognized as a genuine poet, for some of the Rowley pieces are as good as most originals of the same genre. When he wrote in his own name, he could indict satiric verses almost rivaling Pope's, as in The Methodist, or, bitterest of all, Seventeen lines lashing Walpole as a heartless sycophant. When his surviving manuscripts were published in 1777, the editor charged Walpole as partly responsible for the poet's death. 
Walpole defended himself on the ground that he had felt no obligation to help a persistent impostor. Some warm-hearted souls like Goldsmith insisted that the poems were genuine. Johnson laughed at his friend, but said, This is the most extraordinary young man that has encountered my knowledge. It is wonderful how the whelp has written such things. Shelley briefly commemorated the boy in Adonis, and Keats inscribed Endymion to his memory. Chatterton escaped from the rugged realities of Bristol and London via medieval legends and arsenic. William Cooper fled from the London that Johnson loved into rural simplicity, religious faith, and periodic insanity. His grandfather was acquitted of murder and became a judge. His father was an Anglican clergyman. His mother belonged to the same family that had produced John Donne. She died when he was six, leaving him melancholy memories of fond solicitude. Fifty-three years later, when a cousin sent him an old picture of her, he recalled in a tender poem the efforts she often made to calm the fears that darkened his childhood nights. From those indulgent hands he passed in his seventh year to a boarding school, where he became the timid fag of a bully who spared him no humiliating task. He suffered from inflammation of the eyes, and for years he had to be under an oculist's care. In 1741, age ten, he was sent off to Westminster School in London. At seventeen, he began three years' service as clerk in a solicitor's office in Holborn. He was ripe now for romance. As his cousin, Theodora Cooper, lived nearby, she became the idol of his daydreams. At twenty-one, he took quarters in the Middle Temple, and at twenty-three, he was admitted to the bar. Disliking law and timid before courts, he fell into a mood of hypochondria, which was deepened when Theodora's father forbade her any further association with her cousin. Cooper never saw her again, never forgot her, and never married. In 1763, faced with the necessity to appear before the House of Lords, he broke down, became deranged, and tried to kill himself. Friends sent him to an asylum at St. Albans. After eighteen months he was released and took to an almost solitary life at Huntingdon, near Cambridge. Now, he said, he desired no other communion than with God and Jesus Christ. He accepted the Calvinist creed literally and thought much of salvation and damnation. By some happy chance he fell in with a local family whose religion brought peace and kindness rather than fear. The Reverend Morley Unwin, his wife Mary, his son William, and his daughter Susanna. Cooper compared the father with Parson Adams in Fielding's Joseph Andrews. He saw a second mother in Mrs. Unwin, who was seven years his senior. She and the daughter treated him as son and brother and gave him delicate feminine attentions that almost made him love life again. They invited him to live with them, he did in 1765, and found healing in their simple life. This bliss was suddenly ended when the father was killed by a fall from a horse. The widow and her daughter, taking Cooper with them, moved to Olney in Buckinghamshire to be near the famous evangelical preacher John Newton. He persuaded Cooper to join him in visiting the sick and writing hymns. One of these only hymns contained famous lines. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. But Newton's hellfire sermons, which had thrown more than one of his parishioners off their balance, intensified rather than allayed the poet's theological fears. God, said Cooper, is always formidable to me, but when I see him disarmed of his sting by having sheathed it in the body of Christ Jesus. He proposed to Mrs. Unwin, but a second attack of insanity in 1773 prevented the marriage. He recovered after three years of loving care. In 1779, Newton left Olney, and Cooper's piety took a milder turn. Other women helped Mary Unwin to keep the poet in contact with earthly things. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.